So people all over the world are joining us by live stream. We don't know how many people that is because when there's one live stream, that could be 20 people on the end of that camera or more. For those of you who are here for the first time, I'd like to let you know also that we do have the Perpetual Life Library. It's the two, uh, out here at the Outer Sanctuary, the two places there where you can check out a book, write on the card that you've taken it, put your name and information on the box, borrow it for a month or two, and come back and get another one. We've got lots of interesting reading there, and you're welcome to do that. My name is Neil Vandry. I will be your officiator here today. However, it is my extreme pleasure to bring to the stage at this time the man who's made this whole thing happen. And I'd like to tell you a quick little history bit about how this all came to be. I believe it was Linda Chamberlain, the founder of Alcor, that called Rudy. They said, Rudy, we'd like to come to your town and, and have a little talk. Could you get together a couple of people? And he said, well, I'm, I don't think that's a good idea. I think we should do it in South Florida. Let's include Neil in this. And I said, thanks, Rudy. Thanks for including me. And then after that, Rudy said, but you know, we should get more than just Linda. I said, yeah, let's get Joe Kowalski from, from the uh, CI. Where are you, Joe? We have your seat right up front. For all of you speakers, if you'd like to sit in front, we've got seats reserved for you speakers to be in the front row, even though you like to escape in the middle of the day. You can do that down the side aisle there, Joe. And uh, feel free to, to populate the front rows. It's hard to get the front pews filled in a church sometimes, <laughs> and this is how we do it. We make the speaker sit there, right? But he said, you know, we should do better than just Joe and Linda. We can do better than that. Well, let's get Max, and let's get Dennis. And then we said, well, we can't forget Jim Young. We've got to have Jim here. And then it just kind of snowballed. I think we have a dozen people speaking today, Rudy. Fourteen. Fourteen is more than a dozen. It's a baker's dozen <laughs> even, and that. Let's bring to the stage now the MC of the day, the Mr. Rudy Hoffman. <laughs> I'm just glad that he plugged. It's going to be outstanding. I don't know if I even need a mic. Need a mic because the people online can't hear you. Oh, okay. So guys, we do need a mic. Hello. Good morning, everybody, and good morning, uh, people online. Hello, in Timbuktu and wherever you are. Uh, I'm Rudy Hoffman. I am so excited about being here, and I hope you are excited about being here as well. This is going to be a very special, uh, very intense, uh, very hopefully very professional day. We have worked ridiculously hard to try to make this schedule as crisp and professional and fast moving as possible. Uh, let me little tell you a little about what's going to happen here. <clears throat> Uh, uh, as of we, our mission here, we're going to highlight the achievements of the amazing leaders in cryonics. We're going to share their aspirations, celebrate their great leadership in this field, and share information about this emerging science. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, they were, let me talk, talk about the format here. Uh, because we, the schedule is marvelously tight and packed, we're going to ask you to write your questions down on the cards that are on the pews. There's also pins that are shareable, and they're into the pews. We should have cards. So we want to get you to have your questions answered, but we want you to have your questions answered in the best of all possible formats, which is not during the short 18 to 20 minutes we're giving our wonderful presenters. Uh, the um, let next. Uh, we want to honor, take a minute to honor the slides. The bios of our, of our speakers, this is important, guys. Each one of these people that will be addressing you today could have books written about them. Their accomplishments are amazing. These are legendary figures. In the world of transhumanism, which I think I come from, and I'm proud to say many people in this room come from, we don't honor made up gods and goddesses. Instead, we honor folks that basically are real here and humanistically doing magical, wonderful things to make the human condition better. And there is a lot of them that we have right here. We want to honor their time. In order to honor their time, we've given them 20 minutes. And however, the question and answer sessions, if you'll write your questions, they will answer them at the end. Uh, so accommodating that tight schedule, uh, we also ask you to sil silence your cell phones, and uh, let's talk about the mission here. Now you're gonna, this will be annoying. You're gonna be annoyed? We're gonna ask you, I'm, we're gonna ask you to read this together with me twice. 
I want you to know traditional religions, my wife is already back there wa ra raving her head. Yes, first of all, first of all, let me take a minute to honor two very important people in my life. Anything that I do right up here is a function of these people requiring that I over prepare and not wing anything. My beautiful and brilliant wife, Dawn Hoffman, standing in the green. My ridiculously talented <laughs> sister, Trudy, taking pictures. So, would you join me? I want you to know, traditional religions do responsive reading and reading those. So would you join me in reading this together, not once but twice? The symposium is designed to provide an opportunity for leaders in the Quranics field to share their visions and knowledge with clients and with members of the public to build relationships and to enhance the credibility of Quranics. One more time. The symposium is designed to provide an opportunity for leaders in the Quranics field to share their visions and knowledge with clients and with members of the public to build relationships and to enhance the credibility of Quranics. Anybody unclear about that mission? It's really clear what we're doing here. Uh, so again, we ask the bios to not, the, the speakers to not take their shortened bios personally uh, because we're all big girl boys and girls here. We also have, next slide, the timing, go back to the timing, the slide, the time, we actually have timers. Will, will our official timers stand up, please? Do I? Hey, our official timers, Houston Westfall and Sybil DeClark, and they are the official timekeepers and gatekeepers they've got. As a matter of fact, they, they're giving me the time. All right. Better than the they, and once And their job is to be the official bad guys, so I don't need to be. I've officially got two minutes, and, if, and speakers and presenters, if you can't even get done, please don't fill in. We'd love to be able to get ahead. So we've got a lot to cover, and we're going to start with somebody that's very, very precious to the Quranics community, very meaningful to me personally. We are starting with one of our leaders in Quranics, literally the founder, co-founder of Alcor is going to be speaking to us. Linda Chamberlain is one of the co-founders of Alcor served as its first CEO. She and her husband Fred Chamberlain III started Alcor in 1972 and Fred together with his father and Linda's mother are all currently cryopreserved at Alcor. This is not theoretical stuff to folks like you and I and Linda Chamberlain. Um, Linda has two published works on the subject of cryonics. Uh, Life Quest compiled in the 70s contains short stories written by Linda, Fred and others in the cryonics Mind Cloning and Other Transhuman Adventures. In the 1990s, Linda wrote a Quranics novel called Star Pebble, available on Amazon.com. Linda founded Alcor in 1972. We're going to give her a big round of applause as we welcome Linda Chamberlain. I'm going to go through uh, several of my slides very quickly because Rudy has already covered them. Yeah. <laughs> um, cryonics, for those of you who aren't already familiar, is about using ultra-cold temperatures to slow down and stop the dying process uh, so that people can remain viable with the prospect of being returned to life and health uh, maybe 50 to 100 years from now. That's about where we put uh, it based on current medical technology and the rate of growth in the medical community. Um, Alcor uses cryopreservation technologies that um, were developed for medical applications by leading cryobiology researchers. We're not a mortuary practice, but we're more like an extension of critical care medicine. Fred and I started Alcor in 1972. Um, Fred was a NASA engineer. I was a college kid and uh, an office worker. We didn't see ourselves as being the heads of Alcor forever. We wanted it to be run by um, doctors, PhDs, MDs, MBAs. And so today I'm like the proud grandmother of uh, the fact that We've pretty much accomplished that. We've got three MDs that work very closely with us to work on almost every single case that we do. We have 16 PhDs, 
um, including our current CEO, Dr. Max Moore, and uh, we, many of them are on the different boards and things that we have. I won't go into that too much further. We moved to Arizona in 1994 to get away from uh, the earthquakes in California, where we started. And so at this point, uh, it's my pleasure to take you on a virtual tour of Alcor. Alcor is a 501c3 nonprofit scientific educational corporation. The primary reason for that is because we don't, we don't want um, our mission or our procedures or anything that we do determined by shareholders based on what makes more money for them. It's all about the people, our patients. And um, so when I take people on a tour, I tell them you're going to see a lot of pictures of our patients on the wall. And that's because we want to uh, be reminded every single day why we're here and why we're doing what we're doing. The best interest of our members and our patients is the only thing that's important to us. Uh, I have three very important um, family members, uh, as Rudy mentioned, that are in stasis at Alcor. Uh, and for most of us there, it's a very personal thing. We have friends, we have family members um, that we are taking care of. So what is it exactly that we do? Um, I think Matthew's here. Um, he's in this slide. He worked with Alcor at an earlier time. The first part of what we do is standby and stabilization. Alcor can come to our members if our members can't come to us. The best case, of course, is if a, a member knows that they have a uh, disease that uh, is lethal, it's going to take them out. Come to Alcor, uh, come to Scottsdale, go into hospice in Scottsdale. We have a hospice organization that works with us. They know what we need. Uh, we will get our team set up in the hospice room so that we can be there the moment our uh, member is pronounced and can start our procedures. If the member can't come to Scottsdale, then we can pack up our Pelican cases and we can go to them in the field. So what exactly do we do once our member is pronounced? Well, clinical death is a very important point Legally, we can't start doing anything until our member is pronounced clinically and legally deceased. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're dead, not at a cellular level, certainly not even at the organ level. If that were true, we wouldn't be able to have heart transplants and liver transplants. Death used to be seen as an event, an on-off switch, like light. Uh, you were either living or you were dead. Um, medicine now understands that death is a process. It takes hours. And so it's those precious hours that we are using to slow that process down and finally get you to liquid nitrogen, where we basically stop death from happening. Because at minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit, the atoms aren't moving, or they're moving so slow that there are no enzyme actions. No enzyme actions, no further deterioration. So a person can basically stay at that temperature in stasis for thousands of years if necessary. So what do we do first? Stabilization, uh, slowing down that dying process. We start with hypothermia, cooling uh, our patient. Everybody's read stories of someone who fell through the ice into a very cold pond. Uh, they were pulled out hours later and um, were you know, perfectly fine, healthy, went on to live their life. So hypothermia is probably the single most important thing that we can do in slowing down the dying process. Then we give medications to enhance that, to stabilize the cells. Um, and uh, once we've done that, uh, we have the patient in an ice bath, and we have a thumper on their chest, we um, intubate them so that their lungs are working again, 
at that point, they're stabilized and they can be moved into Alcor's uh, operating room. If we're in the field, then um, a washout is done at that point so that the blood is replaced with an organ transplant solution. And we do that for exactly the same reason that the transplant teams do it. They're buying 10 to 15 extra hours in a stable living condition for those organs to be able to get those organs to the recipient. We're buying an extra 10 or 15 hours um, so that we can get that uh, person uh, transported back, probably by airplane, transported back to our OR. Um, oops, I moved things too fast. I didn't realize it was clicking. Um, so um, at that point, the person is stabilized, and now we can um, do the next step. So if, if the stabilization was done in the field, the washout was done with the organ transplant solution, once we get them back to our operating room, then uh, we will do our cryoprotection. The cryoprotectant that we use um, will vitrify our patient instead of crystallize them. So we don't use the term anymore being frozen. We talk about being vitrified or being cryopreserved. Now it's usually, especially with whole body patients, it's usually not possible to give them 100% vitrification because most people over the age of 40 already have atherosclerotic plaques and other things that prevent us from getting our solutions to every single cell in their body. But we do our, our best to, to make that happen. So um, we just recently um, purchased a CT scanner. And so our patients, when they, after we've done the cryoprotection, we do a CT scan of their brain and then after they are at liquid nitrogen temperature, we do another CT scan of their brain. This helps us to uh, know how good a job we've been able to do, and it will also help um, revival physicians in the future to know what the condition of, of that person was. So, <coughs> At this point, our patient goes into the doers, giant thermos bottles filled with the liquid nitrogen. We don't have to have electricity um, to cool down. Liquid nitrogen is just at minus 320 <coughs> degrees Fahrenheit all by itself. And it's in the uh, giant doers that we provide the long-term care for our patients. And um, it's important to mention that revival is also funded with Alcor. So uh, when you look at the prices that I show you in just a minute, remember that long-term care is provided and revival from the patient care trust, um, which is worth about $17 million today. So that our, we feel that our patients um, are well cared for. One seven million. No, $17 million in the patient care trust. It is growing all the time. Um, it is invested very conservatively. We don't want to lose it, but it's invested very conservatively. And half of every person's funding goes into the patient care trust to pay for those services. And I think Alcor is the only organization that does that. So then there's a uh, permanent patient record for every one of our patients. I won't belabor that. Um, revival committee, that's a very long discussion. I'm not going to uh, go in that, into that, but I would like to mention that uh, Alcor members have available to them two different revival trusts that they can take advantage of um, so that they can have uh, finances available to them when uh, they are revived, if and when that becomes possible. All right, there's always that disclaimer. Um, so how much does it cost? Well, whole body is 200,000. 
Um, and 100,000 of that goes into the patient care trust. It's 210,000 if you live abroad. Neuro is 80,000 and uh, 90 if you live abroad. And again, more than 50% goes into the long-term care and revival of the patients. Advantages of neurocryo uh, preservation. Cost, of course, is one for some people. Uh, that's important. With a smaller mass, we can control the variables better and therefore um, get better cryoprotection. Uh, the physical condition, I mentioned that anybody who's over the age of 40 won't be able to have the best uh, cryoprotection if their whole body. And we do have a field neuro capability. We can take our pelican cases into the field if our patient can't get to us. We only have about an 18 hour window from the time of cardiac arrest until uh, we can do a uh, good perfusion procedure. So if we're going into the field, if our member is a whole body patient and we can't get to them in 18 to 24 hours, it's probably just going to be a straight freeze because the vasculature won't be usable. It will be leaky. We won't be able to do the perfusion. But our neuro patients, um, we can take our equipment to them. So there are some major advantages for being a neuro patient. Hey, that was an outstanding, outstanding initial presentation. I think we're starting off brilliantly. And we'll be pleased about this next one. We got Joseph Kowalski. One of the intriguing things about this cryonics community is it's actually a pretty small community throughout the entire globe. I am proud to say that I know and consider personal friends most of the people who are leader, leaders in the cryonics field, which is cool, including this next guy, Joe Kowalski, began his involvement with cryonics and the cryonics institute over 40 years ago. This is some seriously committed long-term people. When he was just 13 years old, he had been a volunteer director for the Cryonics Institute for 25 years, spoken on cryonics topics in media and business, uh, and heads the CryoPrize, a volunteer project to make organ transplants safer, less costly, more available. A lawyer by training, uh, his day job, he worked at Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. for the FTC, created a nonprofit law clinic, clinic, which he ran for nearly a decade. For the last 20 years, he's been involved as a financial consultant with his own financial consulting firm. Please welcome Joe Kowalski. Thank you. Senator Mitch McConnell was introduced at the APAC conference. Is that too loud? At the APAC conference in 1987, and he uh, had a wonderful introduction like that, and he told a story about William Howard Taft, former president, former uh, chief justice, and uh, apparently he was being introduced by Senator Chauncey Depew of New York, and it was a very long introduction. Now, you may know Senator, uh, William Howard Taft was rather large, rotund, and the introduction went on and on, and it was all about how he was pregnant with courage, and the president was pregnant with integrity, and on and on. Well, when uh, President Taft finally got up to speak, he said, I want to thank Senator De Depew for that beautiful introduction, and I want to tell you that when I do come to term, should I have a boy, I will name him Courage. Should I have a girl, I will name her Integrity. But if, as I suspect, it is merely gas, I will then name it Senator Chauncey Depew. So, thank you. The cloud. When you're talking about computers, the cloud is not a cloud. You are saving your information on someone else's computer. What could possibly go wrong with that? Uh, that has nothing to do with cryonics, but it's dangerous, and I like to mention it at every talk that I give. Thank you, Rudy, Dawn, Trudy, everybody, for uh, the hard work you put into making this happen. Uh, thank you, Neil, and uh, Doug, and Josh, and everyone at Perpetual Life for all of your ongoing hard work. Uh, thank you to Bill for the, your great resolve, support of this event. Uh, thank you, Tanya, wherever you are. Thank you to uh, Dennis and everyone at the Cryonics Institute. Uh, thank you to York and everyone at the Immortalist Society uh, and the Cryo Prize, uh, Linda, Jim, everyone else involved in all the other cryonics organizations. Uh, thank you and thank you all for being here at this event. Oh, it works. Thank you to the late Leonard Nimoy for his support of the Cryo Prize. And thank you to Robert Ettinger, father of cryonics, friend and mentor, who kept plugging away. 
even though he was often derided and laughed at. So please do all you can and encourage others to work at this. So, um, so this will uh, actually come to full fruition. So many people have great ideas. Few do the hard work to put it into practice. Edison said it, 1% inspiration, 99 perspiration. Generally other people that he hired, but okay. This conference is so important. There are different people and different groups in cryonics with different ideas and very strong opinions. Why is that? Well, most people like to be followers, and you can see that in fashion. Uh, and I was at a multi-level marketing meeting once. My friend took me over there, and we're sitting in this room with a bunch of people, and the speaker gets up, and he takes his microphone, and he says, right now, in rooms just like this, all over the country, there are people talking about this very same thing. And the people screamed and cheered, and everybody was excited. And I was just sitting there going, so what? But people like to be followers. They like to be part of a group. The cryonics world is young. And um, so we have more leaders right now than we have followers so far. And sometimes we argue. Sometimes we're competitive. Sometimes we're contentious. Sometimes we have serious disagreements, even within our own organizations. There are times that I argue with Dennis, and I think to myself, how can he be so wrong? And then a few months later, I realized that he was right on target, and I was the one that was wrong. Uh, and I thank God that he stuck to his guns. Well, let's not talk Second Amendment here. Stuck to his convictions. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, I know that there are times when he feels the same way in reverse. So... Um, the thing is, we're family, and not just those of us named Kowalski. We're all family, and we must remember that. Uh, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill, for those of you old enough to remember them, used to argue vociferously during the day, and then they'd go out together for a beer at night. Uh, you know, they believed, they had strong differences in method, but they knew that they had a common goal, and that was what was important. Did I skip anything? Not yet. Has anyone here ever seen a bird? Anyone? Oh, good. good. Anyone here ever see a bird fly? Impressive. Impressive. Well, this guy, Lord Kelvin, uh, scientist, physicist, president of the Royal Society, mathematician, uh, he's, one of the things he's famous for is saying that heavier-than-air flying machines are impossible. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, he wasn't stupid. He knew that birds could fly, and according to many, he simply thought that he, excuse me, he doubted the human capacity to copy from nature. From airplanes to dialysis machines, by the way, the guy who invented the dialysis machine, he was kicked out of the medical establishment, he died a pauper. Uh, so from airplanes to dialysis machines to Solar power to Velcro. We have an amazing capacity and have been very successful at copying from nature. One of the cool things about cryonics, yes, I said it, one of the cool things about cryonics is that all we're trying to do is to mimic nature. The wood frog can freeze over the winter. Its heart, its lungs, its brain stop. And the really amazing thing is, in the spring, they all start again, in the right order and with the right timing. Nematodes have been frozen, and they've been shown to retain their memory after they've been revived. I can tell you how later. It's interesting. Tardigrades, water bears. Normally, they freeze over winter, but Japanese scientists recently revived some that were frozen for 30 years and they were fully functional, fully functional. One even went on to make a baby tardigrade. Maybe, maybe it was two, I'm not sure. And humans, humans are more hardy than we thought. It was common knowledge that if there's no oxygen to the brain for three minutes or more, there's going to be brain damage. Tell that to this man who was frozen for 12 hours and had no brain damage. He's living and well in Pennsylvania. 
uh, Dennis has told me that paramedics and doctors say you're not dead until you're warm and dead. It's an interesting saying. It's a good one. And it's now being used for surgery. As humans, it's natural that we like to think we know a lot. We know it all. What we should be thinking is, we're smart, and we can discover what we don't know. The Royal Astronomical Society of France declared that no matter can come and hit the Earth from outer space just before a large and Earth-hitting meteor shower. And we all knew in the early part of the last century that you can't run a mile in under four minutes. Not possible for a human being, except that it is. Impossible is just a big word thrown around by small men who find it easier to live in the world they've been given than to explore the power they have to change it. Impossible is not a fact. It's an opinion. Think about that. Mark Cuban said, it doesn't matter how many times you fail, you only have to be right once, and then everyone can tell you that you are an overnight success. And Anne Lamott said, Lighthouses don't go running all over an island looking for boats to save. They just stand there shining. And that's what we have to do. We have to stand there and shine, and the boats will see us. Different topic. Many cryonicists are atheists or agnostics and think that Judeo-Christian religions are anti-cryonics. If that was true, I believe it was because the people who said things that were anti-cryonics were not following, perhaps did not know, the tenets of their own Judeo-Christian faith. Thankfully, that's been changing. It's pretty clear in the Bible, and this is from something called 10-Minute Apologetics, it's pretty clear in the Bible that the plan for Adam and Eve was to live forever on earth, and most religions believe this if you really press them on it. I grew up in an Orthodox Jewish home, so I know more about that than other religions. So I'll just tell you, at Jewish funerals, at the, they end with a prayer for the time when death will be no more. It's not about heaven. When death will be no more. Three times a day, Jews pray not to go to heaven, but for a physical resurrection on earth. And Psalms 115.16 says the heavens belong to God, but the earth was given to humanity. I grew up hearing religious talks about the end of days when there will be no illness and no death. The world would change right here on earth. At the time, it was said that those things would happen for us. Recently, I heard an Orthodox rabbi speak, and he said, and this is really new, he said, our scientific achievements in medicine, etc., indicate that we are getting to that magical time. See the difference? Not that this will be done for us, but we have been given the tools by God to make this happen, to bring this about. We have to take the action. And it's a drastic change in religious cultural norms. It's about us doing things. You know, there's a story about the Israelites at the Red Sea that the Red Sea didn't just split and the Israelites went through, if you believe it. I'm not forcing you to believe anything. The story goes that it didn't split until a bunch of people jumped in and were up to their necks in the water. You have to take the action. You can't just expect things to happen. I said I wouldn't talk much about other religions because I don't know much, but I can tell you this. For years we've had a Catholic high school send its science class to the Cryonics Institute for instruction in cryonics. Half-day instruction in cryonics. Catholic high school! Who here thinks that someday we may be able to do a kidney transplant? Or a heart transplant, maybe? It's common practice. But this is the stuff that Mary Shelley wrote about in Frankenstein. Someday, oh, excuse me. And like heart transplants or other medical techniques, which almost all religious beliefs not only allow but demand, I see this also as the future of cryonics. Someday I see cryonics like a paperclip, contact lenses, drinking a glass of water, something that's really important but is ubiquitous, and we won't need to have conferences about it because it'll just be there. It's just something you do. 
That time is not here yet. And I'm all in favor of cryonics and research. Very much so. I've been a volunteer, as Rudy said, for a long time. The problem is, pushing people into cryonics has been like trying to force a square peg into a round hole. Um, culture has changed a bit. People no longer think it's crazy. But most people still think, yeah, it's just not for me. It's just not for me. So what do we do? Anybody? I have an idea. A better method is to find something that people want, something that society says is important, and that still will further cryonics and life extension. Bill Falloon did this with supplements. It's a very important area. The government's somewhat ambivalent towards it. But a large segment of society, including myself, thinks it's important. And Bill works with these people to help them feel better and be healthier. Health and wellness. That's what these people are interested in, health and wellness. But, by the way, he tells them, we're called the Life Extension Foundation. To put a bigger idea in people's heads. Not forcing it down their throats, so to speak. It's brilliant. Getting them used to it little by little. In that spirit, I founded the Organ Cryopreservation Prize to support research into vitrifying organs for transplant purposes. Everyone I speak with, everyone, either knows someone who needs a transplant or has had a transplant, or knows someone who knows somebody who has. Everyone. Hi. I just donated $10 toward the Cryo Prize to help make organ transplants safer, less costly, and more available to those in need. My name is Sharita. Join me. Click on the link below to read more about the prize and to donate $10. And be sure to share this video with your friends and family. Thank you, Sharita. Organ transplants Good have been done successfully for only a handful of decades, yet we practically take them for granted. But they are difficult expensive and time sensitive. And though they've only been done successfully for a relatively short period of time, in many ways the process is the same as it was when most people had rotary dial telephones. If a kidney is not transplanted within 36 hours, it dies. If a liver is not transplanted within 12 to 16 hours, it dies. Typically lungs need to be transplanted in under 8 hours and a heart within 6 that's a very short window of time. If a heart becomes available in Los Angeles at midnight and the recipient is asleep in Nevada, imagine those six hours. The difficulty of quickly assembling the necessary team of experts, transportation costs, preparing the patient. The people involved in this process are amazing and they do miraculous work. But if that window could be expanded, there would be more time to prepare the team and the patient Transportation costs would be reduced dramatically. Safety could be enhanced, and more lives would be saved. One way to extend this time is to develop a reliable way to temporarily freeze an organ, as we now do with sperm, eggs, and embryos. And when ready, to revive the organ and implant it into the patient. The Organ Cryopreservation Prize, the Cryo Prize, was established to help make this happen. Initially planned to be $50,000, the prize will be given to the first person or group that successfully freezes and restores one of several mammalian organs to full function. Details are on the website below. The prize is administered by a federally recognized 501c3 nonprofit organization. Donations are tax deductible to the extent allowed by law. You can mail in a check, you can donate online. The bigger the prize, the more likely that this procedure will soon become a reality. With your help, the prize could grow far beyond our initial goal of $50,000. So share, share this, this with, this a, with friend. a friend and, and join us. Join us. Donate $10. For the cost of two large specialty cups of coffee, you can be you a, part, can of be a part of this adventure and possibly, possibly change, change the world. The world. This is something that people already like. This is something we need to get out there to people. This is something that people say, yes, 
That's a great idea. My friend said to me recently, you know, you've been talking to me about cryonics for 30 years, and eh, I don't know. But this, this organ thing, that's really important. That's great. And it seems to me that this is a necessary stepping stone to cryonics. We're looking for corporate and other pledges, not sponsors. The pledges will not have to pay a dime unless someone is successful in finding a way to do this and proving that it's repeatable and long-term. In the Star Trek episode, Mirror, Mirror, any Star Trek fans? Good. Captain Kirk, original series? Captain Kirk encourages the Spock in the barbaric alternate universe to try to change things. And Spock says, one man cannot summon the future. To which Kirk responds, but one man can change the present. I ask each of you to be that one person. And I ask you, I beg you, spread this around. Spread it around. Support the cryoprise. Let's push it to the limit to make organ vitrification a reality. If we do that, cryonics will succeed. Thank you very much. Wow. Very well done. <laughs> that was just spectacular. Right, great. Well, let's say I have here a hundred dollar check. It's not enough. It's not, I wish it was more, but it's a start for the crowd prize. Thank you. Thank you, Rudy. This, is this was not planned, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Thank you very much. I would like for us to be really evolved nice. about our breaks. Is that too much to ask? We are all evolved humans, apes, whatever. And so here's what we're going to ask you to do. It is, would you t please take a look at your watch? Uh, we will not have timers on your breaks, but we do have spread throughout here a lot of these green sheets. These green sheets are kind of rigid. And so what we have here, we are ready to do our official break. We got a real life 20 minute break. We have, uh, I think, things to uh, eat on this, eat and drink on this break. Is that correct, Neil? And so, it, but if you can actually be back having done your little wee thing uh, and in your seats for a fabulous presentation by one of our outstanding presenters, Max Moore. So we're going to ask you to be back. We're going to take a break now and ask you to be back here in your seats, ready to roll at 1110. Is that a deal? Outstanding. Thank you. Wow. Guess what? You guys are good. You guys are. Give yourselves a hand. Bravo. You're actually out in your seats on time. Nobody does that. Nobody does that at these kind of meetings, but they are going to be at this meeting because you know what? We're a little smarter, a little more evolved, a little, excuse me, more intelligent than some. At least we're trying to be. I, I'm so excited. We've got many people trickling in that I have not seen for a long, long time. Well, welcome, Lilith. Lilith, we're thrilled. Uh, and we also have good news. I guess got texted from a number of my clients who are watching online. We've got people literally watching this thing all over the planet. Uh, bravo. Hey. So we're all over the internet. Um, so thanks for being on time. And let me introduce, so we can stay on time, our next incredible presenter and speaker. We have an internationally recognized advocate of the effective and ethical use of technology for life extension and cryopreservation. Dr. Max Moore brings experience in running nonprofit orgs and many years of analyzing and writing about business orgs. Long commitment to Alcor's mission Joined Alcor in 1986 as its 67th member, co-founder of the Extropy Institute, been CEO of Alcor since 2012. Behold the applause. I got to tell you something personal. About 20 years ago, maybe 2025, right before, I, I've been signed up with Alcor for 25 years, and I was sitting on my couch, and I was getting a magazine called Entropy or Extropy Magazine, and I thought, oh my goodness, my life is completely useless. Somebody's already articulated everything I ever wanted to write and done it in a more cogent, crisp prose than I ever hoped to do. It was Max Moore's writing. So I'm honored to be proud, proud to introduce Max Moore.
Even, even if he is a better writer than I am. <laughs> Good job, Bo. Thank you, Rudy. Very nice. Uh, hello, everybody. Good morning. It's nice and cool up here, isn't it, compared to downstairs? So I'm, gonna, I'm not really sure how many people here are familiar with Cryonex very deeply or with Alcor in particular. So I'm going to do a bit of Alcor stuff first, and then I'm going to go a bit more generally. So actually, Rudy, it's 2011, not 2012 I started. So yeah, it's been eight and a half years. So there's a lot of stuff going on at Alcor right now. Um, I'm not going to cover the same ground that Linda did. But a quick overview of where we stand right now. We have 1,262 full members. And by that, I mean people with full financial and contractual arrangements to be cryopreserved. Um, and we are getting more and more people applying all the time. We actually had 93 people in the applicant queue in June. So we're actually getting almost more people than we can handle in signing up right now. And we're doing, I'll talk a little bit later about what we're doing to sort of automate that process and speed it up to get more people uh, in the pipeline. So as you can see, growth has been doing okay. We had a kind of a little bit of a slowdown during the recession and when we raised dues and then I got the board to lower dues a bit and then growth has been gradually accelerating again. So I think this is kind of interesting if you haven't seen these numbers before. What kind of people are, are these members? and what arrangements do they have. You can see that Alcor members are split almost 50-50 between whole body and neuro members. Uh, I think actually among the patients there's more neuros than whole body members, but among the living members it's about equal. Our youngest is one year old, 60 children under the age of 18, our oldest member currently 90, average age 48. Uh, you can see there's quite a few more males than females. And that hasn't really changed very much in recent years, um, although we're sending up more and more families. So hopefully that ratio will balance out a little bit. We have 170 patients um, and actually 83 pets. We've been doing a lot of pets recently, a lot of cats and dogs, including last December my own dog, uh, who is just an amazing dog. I actually hated dogs before we got one. I didn't want to get a dog, but I was made to do so and then fell in love with him. <laughs> And he's such a wonderful dog. He's kind of like the Buddha of dogs. He would go, in fact, you may have met him if you were at the Alcor conference in 2015. You may remember Oscar. He went up to every person at every table, said, hi, hi. That's the kind of dog he was. So he's now cryopreserved, and we have another one. Um, let's see. Membership. So yeah, so you can see that in 2013, it was not so good. This is uh, basically when I came on board as president and CEO, that was immediately after two years in a row in which the board raised membership dues. So that's kind of the situation I faced and the economy going down at the same time. So basically growth stopped, but then we managed to get it restarted. And 2018 is actually the best year we've had uh, in many years. And in absolute numbers of members, it's the largest gain so far. We'll see how we do this year. Uh, I need to talk a little bit about this. I want to emphasize this because it's kind of important. The Patient Care Trust Fund, uh, I think is, is unique in that uh, when people pay for their cryopreservation, we put a chunk of money aside that's put into the patient care trust or the ACT as it's now called. This is actually a separate organization legally. It's now a type two supporting organization. Its sole purpose of which is to keep the patients preserved and when it becomes possible, hopefully, to revive them and rehabilitate them. That money is guarded by a board of trustees that's distinct from the alcohol board. Um, I think two-thirds of them have to have relatives and loved ones who are cryopreserved, so they have a very direct stake in managing that money wisely, not just a, you know, a fiduciary duty, but a personal stake in it. There's also a strict rule that you can never spend more than 2% in any year of the investments, and actually right now we're below that. The reason for that is, if you, like Rui will probably be familiar with this, and financial planners will tell you, uh, if you're going to have money for retirement, you don't want to plan on taking out more than a very small amount per year, and exactly the amount will vary depending on the advisor, but some will say 5%, some will say 4%, but really if you look at the mathematics of it, if you take out 3% a year, you have over several decades, and it's a long time, but that's what we have to deal with, there's a fairly large chance you'll run out of money completely. Imagine you're invested in the Japanese stock market, and you have to pay expenses, and for 20 years you get nothing. So going from 2% to 3% actually makes an amazingly big difference in the chances of running out of money. So we have a very conservative uh, limit on that draw. The idea is that not only should we have that money indefinitely, even 100 years from now, we should still have that money. It should, in fact, grow over time. And this is where the 
power of compound interest comes in, and because I really like to talk about the rule of 72, right? It comes in very handy here to figure out how much money you'll have in 100 years. If you make just 3% a year on average in real return, then after 100 years, how much do you have? Well, the rule of 72 makes that easy to figure out, right? Because you divide your, the, the uh, percentage 3% into 72, you get 24. That means even at that low return, you're going to double your money every 24 years. Well, there's about four of those in 100 years. So you get two, four, eight, 16 times the amount of real money, not, not uh, inflated money, but real money. So that means if we've done a good job, not only will we have plenty of money to keep people cryopreserved, preserved, we should have a lot to actually pay for revival and rehabilitation. And that's pretty important because we don't know what the future will be like. It could be that you know, this will be done for free. That's, that's a nice thought, but I don't think we should rely on that. Uh, some people may actually be quite, quite difficult to repair and revive compared to other people, maybe more expensive. Uh, also, we've got to think about rehabilitation, which is part of Alcor's mission statement. We don't want to just wake somebody up and say, yep, we did it, good luck, push them out the door. Uh, no, it's going to take some time to get used to the new world. Right? So we're going to have to do some rehabilitation. Very much like someone coming out of a long-term coma. Some people have been in comas for a couple of decades. You can't just you know, push them out into the street and you know, have them figure it out. So that is part of the mission. And I personally think that it's quite likely that what we will do for many people is probably bring them to awareness in some kind of virtual reality. Uh, it's probably safer to do it that way, rather than, you know, to use a rather silly example, letting them walk out in front of a flying car or something. Uh, in a virtual reality, you can make it safe. They can learn how the world works. They can learn you know, how, what, the, what the spot is. That they can find other people. Uh, so I think that's probably a likely way that the, that kind of rehabilitation will start. But we don't really know. People are always asking me, well, who's going to make the decision to bring people back? And the answer really is, I don't know. We don't know whether it will be alcohol making that decision, whether there'll be a government committee, whether there'll be a regulatory board, whether it'll be, you know, we don't know at this point because that's quite a way off. <coughs> so I have quite a few jobs um, at Alcor, and one of the ones I like to do really is outreach and education. I like to talk to people. Um, I go to quite a few places. I've been to uh, South Korea. This is kind of a fun one. I went to South Korea twice in one year. Uh, this is an audience of about 5,000 people, and they're all kind of young, eager people. Basically, I was invited to this thing because the South Koreans are concerned that the youth of today, I know it sounds like old, old codges here, the youth of today are not really innovators. They're kind of staring at their screens and playing games all the time, and who's going to create the future that we've built? I mean, they've made amazing progress in South Korea. They're worried about the youngsters. So they had a bunch of people come along basically to talk about innovative ideas and futuristic ideas uh, to get them excited about the future. So yeah, you can see there's a pretty good-sized audience there. Now, I'm going to probably go, well, how am I doing? Okay. Good. I'm going to go a little bit off my script a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've been doing at Alcor, but I want to go into some more general topics as well. So very briefly, what have we been doing in terms of technical improvements? Uh, I think Linda sort of explained the basic process, but we've been doing a lot of different things, and this is thanks to quite a few people, but I have to call out one person in particular here, which is Steve Graber, who is one of my staff who is an amazing innovator and technician. He can make pretty much anything. Uh, he likes to build 3D printers and then use those printers to make other stuff. Um, he really uh, just keeps coming up with new ideas all the time. I don't have to go and prod him to do stuff. He'll just keep coming up with ideas and say, can I do this? Can I do that? Okay. So one of the major things he's done recently is to create a new design for our dewars, our storage vessels. For those of you who are not familiar with the term dewar, it's D-E-W-A-R after uh, a Scottish fellow who invented these things. They're essentially very large, very expensive thermos flasks. And we had the Bigfoot dewars, which are called that because they have these big feet that stick out. So Steve designed a new model that was wider, but with the feet underneath, it takes up essentially the same floor space. And it also has a narrower top. So the boil off is about the same as a Bigfoot dewar, but instead of getting four whole body patients in there, we can get probably 11. So it really reduces the cost of the boil off. And obviously, if you're paying for liquid nitrogen over decades, that can really add up. Uh, it also saves on the, on the space used as well, which you have to pay for. Another little innovation that Steve came up with recently, um, b before we got the CT scanner, which Linda's already scooped me on that one. So yes, we have our own CT scanner now, thanks to a very 
generous donation. Um, we spend a third of a million dollars on a CT scanner and the training and all the stuff that goes with it. So we can scan patients before a procedure, during and after. And that's really valuable because by scanning people before you start surgery, you may find that there's some weird anatomical thing that you have to deal with. For instance, the carotid might bifurcate higher than normal, and you want to make sure you cannulate in the right place. You may also find, as we have with some patients, when you open up their chest, you find a disaster in there. You find that they have had multiple heart surgeries, they've got wires all over the place, and you're not going to better do the usual uh, cannulation of the heart. And they don't necessarily tell us this beforehand, so we find it out. Um, but afterwards, uh, you know, as already talked about that, we, we're actually going to go back through all our neuro patients. We can't really do this for uh, cryopreserved whole body patients. They won't fit into the scanner. But we're going to go back through all our neuro patients and CT scan them and analyze the results, see how well they were perfused. And then we're going to compare that with the, uh, the transport time, how, how much of a delay there was, whether they had an aneurysm, you know, whatever their health condition was. And we're going to have, have a, a lot of data built up, which may suggest... Um, you know, conditions under which you'll get a less than optimal cryopreservation, and then hopefully that'll lead to ways to improve that. So the CT scanner is pretty, pretty cool to have. Uh, we've also got, uh, this is not so new, but if you don't know about it, people often say, well, what happens if the power goes out? I mean, I get this all the time from you know, media people and others. And I say, well, if you talk about the patients, nothing. Nothing's going to happen because we don't use any power. You know, I mean, you, you know about the doers know that we just refill with liquid nitrogen periodically. There's no energy needed for that. However, it would matter if the power went out in the middle of surgery and perfusion. You know, imagine the surgeon's in there trying to cannulate the blood vessel and it suddenly goes dark and the perfusion machinery stops. That wouldn't be so good. So some years ago, we put in a 14,000 watt generator, a diesel fuel generator that will run for about 30 hours. It'll power the operating room uh, and our server, actually. It won't give us any air conditioning, so we'll be sweating away in the front office, but that's not really critical. Um, so that was a, a pretty good investment. Uh, other things, well, there's so many different things. We have a custom-made operating table, again, Steve's design. Uh, the old one looked to me like one of those kind of 19th century dentist chairs that you might torture someone in to give me information. It just looked horrible and kind of big brassy. This is a nice new modern one. It's actually designed so you can, you can move it up and down nicely, you can tilt it, and it has... Well, there's different names for this. I like to call it the popsicle tray, but that's not very dignified. So it's usually the patient former. Basically, it's got a, an inside shell that will make sure the patient is you know, cryopreserved. I'll say frozen, you know, it's not really frozen. They're frozen so that not having their arms sticking out and make it hard to put them into the containment vessel. So basically, it shapes them into the, into the right shape so the human popsicles will fit into the uh, aluminum pods. Uh, it also has the advantage of the... <laughs> Not the official name. It also has the advantage that you can actually lift that section out. Well, actually, what we do, first of all, we, once the operation is finished, we cover the table with uh, some film and start pumping liquid nitrogen vapor through to begin the cooling. Then we can actually pull that insert out from the operating table, move it into the patient care bay for the continued cool down. That makes it a heck of a lot easier than the way we used to do it. Uh, we've also got... Um, well, it used to be that we had a little monitor which was displaying you know, flow rates and pressures and that kind of thing. And now we have this... Gigantic monitor, which you can see anywhere in the operating room, which makes it a lot easier, especially for the person who's scribing and, and to monitor what's going on. Uh, one thing we put in a couple of years ago, rather than doing uh, measurements of the concentration of the cryoprotectant, which is very important to do, because if you're not familiar with that, you don't want to put in cryoprotectant, uh, medical-grade antifreeze, if you like, at full concentration while the patient's still warm because it would be quite toxic. So you have to introduce it at a low concentration and gradually ramp that up. And you have to measure that. So what we used to do was we had a, a you know, manual refractometer. Someone would take a sample. They'd have to go and put it in the machine, get a reading, and do that every 15 minutes. It was a pretty tedious job. I did that job, and most of us have done that at one time or another. Now we have these very nice inline refractometers. So the cryoprotectant just flows through it, and you get a continuous reading. So it's not every 15 minutes. You know at all times what the concentration is. Uh, a whole lot of things have been automated. Um, we have automated pressure control. Uh, it used to be that someone had to watch the pressure all the time because if you've got a sudden spike in pressure, that could be a very bad thing. It could blow out a blood vessel. But now we have that automated so that if the pressure goes above a certain level, the pump will automatically shut off. That makes a lot more sense, by the way, than uh, just made me think of this. Someone uh, 
Let's talk about Star Trek. Uh, Joe was talking about Star Trek, and I'm a big fan of the original series. Uh, but the, the second episode, I think it was the second episode released, has this really ridiculous thing in there. It's a great episode. It's called Where No Man Has Gone Before, which became their tagline, and I highly recommend it. Uh, but there's this ridiculous bit near the beginning where the ship is doing its usual thing, where they're, you know, they're doing this with the camera, and they're being shaken by an energy cloud, and Kirk calls out, gravitation on automatic. And I'm thinking, do you mean before that there was a guy holding down a button to keep the gravity going? That was weird, so... Anyway, just made me think of that. Something else we're working on right now is uh, liquid ventilation. There's been actually several groups who've worked on liquid ventilation for some time. We're working on our own model. We're trying to advance that. The basic idea of this is the initial cooling is really important. You know, when the warmer you are, the faster things are falling apart. So we want to cool people as fast as possible. So the goal here is to use uh, chilled I won't better say this word now, perfluorocarbon, I think that's right, uh, just like in James Cameron's movie, The Abyss, I don't know if you've seen that, they, that's basically what they do, instead of breathing air, they use this uh, fluid that oxygenates the cells. Um, and by chilling it and putting it through the lungs, the lung has a huge surface area, because all these little vessels in there that if you spread it out would be like several football fields, so it produces very rapid cooling. So you know, we've got several groups working on that. Uh, we're also trying to boost our information technology infrastructure. We actually moved from old-fashioned Microsoft database that was getting more and more unreliable, and we moved to Salesforce, which some of you might be familiar with as a kind of an online uh, information management system. Uh, we've also done a major, major project, which took a long time, basically taking all the paper files for records and members and scanning them, and uh, then saving those. So we still have the paper versions, but we also have on the server, we have a backup to the server, and we have it encrypted in the cloud. So it's pretty hard for us to lose that information now. One thing we'll be working on, in, probably before the end of this year, will be a major upgrade to the website. One thing I've been wanting to do for a long time, and we've just been finding the right people on the right platform, we want to have member portals. So just like, for instance, if you sign on to your bank account, you sign into your account, right? You can see how much you have. You can see if you have several accounts, you can see how much you owe. Uh, you can see if you have automatic payments. It would be good if, instead of members having to call in their payments or even having just a deduction on a credit card, if they could log on whenever they want and see exactly what their status. You know, do they owe any dues? Uh, do they want to pay extra? What's, you know, there's a lot of different things. Have you filled out this form? Have you filled out the uh, uh, medical power of attorney? Have you done this form? And so on. Uh, or, as, as, a, as we were discussing with uh, one of our members a little earlier, have you filled out a form that says, you will disinherit any family member who blocks your cryopreservation. So that's something we want to actually encourage people to do, because that does happen too often. So <clears throat> rather than talking more about that, I just want to talk a little bit for my last couple of minutes about something that's kind of really puzzling. Why aren't there more of us? Isn't it ridiculous that we have so few people a couple of thousand people out of all these millions in this country, what, 300 and something million, 320 million? It's insane. I always think, you know, if you take the perspective of the future, we look back on today for maybe 30 years from now, I think people are going to scratch their head and go, what was wrong with people? They took their loved ones and they put them in the ground to be eaten by worms and bacteria. Are they nuts? They could have cryopreserved them. What the hell is wrong with those people? And yet, that's not how people see it today. They say, you guys are weird. You freeze people. Yeah? Well, I'm not the crazy one here. So, but we have to persuade people of that. And I think one way to do that is how you frame cryonics, how you explain this idea. I think a lot of people still, hear, when they hear about cryonics in some form, they go to you know, the sort of... Frankenstein, raising the dead kind of thing. So they call it freezing dead people. You see this all the time in the press. That is exactly not the way that we want to frame it, right? Cryonics should be seen as an extension of emergency medicine because the person isn't dead. And I always like to explain that to people, and I'm sure some of you have heard this before, but let's imagine we were back in 1960, and one of you just suddenly keeled over. You stopped breathing, your heart stopped beating. Uh, oh, I can do another Star Trek reference. Uh, if it was, you know, what they did back then was just like McCoy was always doing on the original series. Oh, he's dead, Jim. And then what? Nothing. He didn't do a damn thing. I don't know why they didn't fire his incompetent ass earlier. He never did anything to revive people. But that's the way it was in 1960, right? But then they came up with defibrillation and CPR and all kinds of means of reviving people. 
So you think, well, we call them dead back then, but now we don't consider them to be dead. So by extension, I like to argue, what's dead today is not what's going to be dead tomorrow. So you're not really dead. So we're not freezing dead people. We're extending their lives. We're extending emergency medicine. I think it's really important to frame it that way. Uh, I think the other big problem we have is that not that people think it can't work, because when you talk to them for a while and explain it, they go, OK, I guess I can see how that could work, because we can already do this with various kinds of tissues and so on. They're afraid that it will work. And that scares them, because then they're going to have a future that I think is unknown and frightening. So I think it's important for us to, to argue, and unfortunately I don't have time to explain why we should be optimistic, uh, but we have to try and overcome all that negative science fiction that's out there and explain why the future will probably be a pretty good place. But we're never going to appeal to everybody. I suggest you focus on people with a sense of adventure, because you have to have a sense of adventure to take this great trip. And those of you who are doing that, congratulations. You're brave pioneers. You're saving your own lives and hopefully those of your loved ones and setting an example for everyone else. Thank you. Excuse me, thank you. These name badges have been donated along with these lovely pads and the interior of the name badges by Mark Lyox and his company. He's an outstanding print, has his own print shop. And what's the nature of your, real quick, what's the, he'll, he'll be presenting, he'll be able to tell you a little bit about his biz as well. We won't, we won't major, have major, but anyway, thank, thank you, Mark, for these wonderful jobs. Okay, yay, Mark. I love, I love these name tags because they're, they're big and you can see them across the room. So people you, you know you ought to know and you don't know them, you can remember who they are. Anyway, let's talk about Jim Yount. Jim Yount, it's spelled Y-O-U-N-T, but pronounced Yount, I believe. Jim Yount is the president of the American Cryonics Society. He has been once again active in Koranic since, guess what, 1972, which sounded like a pretty big year. Uh, well known in the Koranic circles, creative for, at work, he does enormous and great writing. You may have written, uh, read some of his work in Long Life magazine, and his emphasis is also on long-term planning. I love what Jim Yant brings to the table. He's also a great personal friend. By the time he gets his jacket on, we'll be ready to roll. Mr. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jim Yacht. Thank you, and thank you for having me. And it's a pleasure to be able to address you today. Uh, when I was first invited to address you, I tried to think of a topic that would be of interest to everyone. And uh, although we are in various cryonics organizations, one thing we're all interested in is money. Uh, money to be able to fund cryopreservation research and money to provide us with a new life fund and reanimation if that time comes. Now, if I can figure this out, we'll go on. Okay, let's see, the top button advances, is that correct? Okay. The American Cryonic Society is a 501c3 California nonprofit organization. The purpose, cryonics and cryobiological research. We've sponsored a cryopreservation program since 1972. Our first suspensions, cryopreservations, 1974. Uh, donations are certainly welcome, and uh, we also welcome your membership. Uh, another commercial, Long Life Magazine. Long Life Magazine is the longest running of all the cryonics organizations' uh, publications. And uh, the organization of the Immortalist Society is a 501c3 charity. And they also, as, as uh, Joe told you, are a sponsor of the Cryo Prize. Uh, $35 will get you a subscription. $40 if you live outside the United States, you get four issues per year and uh, there are some examples in the lobby and please pick one up and if they're not available there, we'll mail you one. Okay, so topic is how to be cold and rich and financially support cryonics evidence-based science. How to be cold and rich and support <laughs> Financially and financially support evidence-based science. Some of those slides, Jim. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So the little guy says, one, remove head, 
freeze head, and three, keep head cold. <laughs> Easy. Are there a number of things that a person needs to consider when they are setting up a trust or making other kind of arrangements to uh, take, try to take some of your money with you when you go? One of them is, um, will I be able to work for wages? And I think that is highly doubtful, but I've talked to many people that says, sure, I'll be able to work for wages, so I don't need a whole lot of money when I go to the future. Uh, what kind of, um, uh, will there be a kind of cryonics reservation, a place that's uh, not with the rest of society where they put all of us? I hope not. Other things, can you actually leave workable instructions to be able to diversify your investment uh, after you go into cold care to be activated at that time? I think the answer is yes, but it's not all that easy. Will money even have any value when you're reanimated? Uh, I think so, but I've certainly heard arguments against that. And uh, can you diversify the money by who controls management of the investment? by the type of investment, or who owns the assets. Personhood, what makes us a person? What is the self? And Robert Ettinger had a whole chapter that he devoted into prospective immortality, and if you haven't read that book or don't remember that chapter, go back and read it, because I think it's an eye-opener. Um, how long will you live? If you're gonna live a long time, you might need, not need as much money. If you're well, like me and probably gonna be going into reanimation uh, much sooner than maybe you better have some. Uh, relatives, how did your relative view cryonics? Should you pay for other people being cryopreserved? We had one of our members that set up a fund and he said that uh, this is for my brother. My brother's been a fence sitter, but he, should he choose to be cryopreserved, then I want this money to be available to him. Uh, one of the things, oh, scanning and archiving, uh, I think that's important. We have such a project of scanning going on right now at the American Cryonic Society for one of our members. Uh, setting up a web page might be a way so that you're not forgotten. People can always look at your web page and know about you and remember you. Uh, the last part, which I think is something not just people need to ask, but the people in the cryonic community need to uh, give some thought. Does a cryonic society have an obligation to provide for care and comfort of its reanimated patients. To be cold, you sign up for cryopreservation and you, uh, you provide funding through life insurance or other means. I've always liked this picture because I think we all feel that's like that sometimes when we've worked through the cryonics paperwork. But I think it's the choice. You're either buried by the paperwork or you're buried. To be a rich, cold guy, you have to first be a rich, warm guy, and then make arrangements to take some of your money with you. And you follow the frozen path. We can ask the people that have gone that way before, and we're also going to throw in some warm people that are on that path as well. Fictional characters will pay the part, except for one, and you'll see that one as we go through there. Down. Contrary to public opinion, I am not a cartoon character. My mother named me Jim, and you can call me uh, Felix because I always wanted to be a cartoon character. I have got a degree in insurance and risk management. I've been signed up since 72. Uh, for many years, I worked for Trans Time and uh, helped other people to make arrangements to be frozen and to set up trusts and so on. And it's interesting, they actually paid me to do that. And currently, I'm the president of the American Cryonic Society and working for free doing the same thing. Anyone could do it. Now, we're not going to consider the cryonicists who have gotten rich through inventions or starting companies, because I don't think that's necessarily something that can be repeated. But rather, these are the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, who have become cryomillionaires uh, just like the millionaire next door. There are basically, I've divided this, at least for our examples, there'll be three types of cryomillionaires stock market, real estate, and diversified, that includes gold, second deeds of trust, CDs, life insurance, and annuities, 
And of course, life insurance and annuities uh, would also apply to one and two as well. So, meet cryo millionaire number one. This is Mrs. Pegody, and uh, her secret is to hire a stock market, uh, somebody to manage her funds for her. Her story starts with a tragedy. She was widowed and had a daughter to raise by herself, but her husband had thoughtfully provided a life insurance policy to give her something, her and the daughter, something to start with. So, with that situation, and I'm sure Rudy has seen this in some examples, people often very quickly go through the funds that they've provided through their life, in, that they've received through life insurance, and they're just back where they started from, but not this lady. So here were her goals. She wanted to raise and educate her daughter, she wanted to live without hardship, and she wanted to have enough money that she would never run out, no matter how, how old she lived. And I think that's something that most of us would like. However, she hired a, um, an expert then, put her money with a guy that was an expert at, an, at making stock market investments, and she considered that her job was to live frugally so that more money could then go uh, for her uh, expert to manage. Now, although those were her plans, long life was not likely for our hero. Her goals then changed when there was a diagnosis of uh, that she wasn't going to live very long in early old age. Her goals changed to be cryopreserved and take her fortune with her to the future. Then she had about $3 million that she had built up by, that, by having somebody uh, invest her money that knew what they, was, they were doing and her living frugally. So she achieved her goal. She was cryopreserved. By that time, she had about $4 million in her trust, and she provided for continued funding of cryonics through a stipend of 5% per year from the principal that would go to uh, support research and other cryonics projects. Now, reviewing her strategies, hire an expert and live frugally. Now we meet our second cryo-millionaire, which is Buzzy the Crow. He's a guy that is very independent and he always manages his own money. He started very early, right out of college. And his strategy was to find beaten down stocks, put money into it, wait till the stocks recovered, and uh, then become rich. And he diversified his investment. Something very lucky happened to our crow, and that is he bought a house in Silicon Valley for $24,000, and it's now worth about $2 million. Now, you can't count on that, but Buzzy also then used leverage by borrowing against the equity in his home and buying more stock. He didn't do this in a huge, huge way, but he did it in a way that he could magnify his investment. So, here's where Buzzy sits right now. And he's a fellow my age. He probably has another 50, 60 years, no doubt, to live. Uh, $5 million in stock investments, $2,000 house. Some of his wealth will be shared with his wife. And he has a trust to be administered by Crow Cryonics family members. And uh, there are provisions in the trust to fund research. Reviewing his strategy, well-paying job, uh, sharing wealth with wife, self-directed stock purchases, aware of good fortune and ready to take advantage of them, lever his investments, and he, was, he is a term life insurance buyer. Summary of our stock market investing people. Uh, Ms. Pegatty, hire an expert. Buzzy the Crow, self-directed, frugality. And of these people we're looking at, almost all of them followed uh, the, the strategy of be very tight with the buck. Uh, let's see. Oh, so to get started in the stock market, uh, as an example, Acorn Investment has no minimum investment to start, and it will allow you to buy stocks on margin with two to three thousand dollars. And we have uh, experts here and a, a number of people uh, in that area, and they can tell you more about that, I'm sure. Okay, so we now go to flip the frog. Now, Flip is a nice guy, and being a nice guy, 
Uh, it's one of the reasons that led to his wealth. Uh, I had a chance to talk with Flip and ask him just how is it that you have become a rich guy uh, because there was nothing very obvious. He seemed very ordinary. And I found out that there wasn't any single strategy that he had used to build his wealth. Now, often people find, will find a formula and then they'll just stick to it, like buying houses, renting them out. But with Flip, he had done lots of different things to build up his wealth. So what was it that made this guy rich? I think this tells you. So Flip's a nice guy and Flip Ed is a nice gal. They don't always get along and they got a divorce. But they had a nice house, as you can plainly see. So what to do? So keep the house, rent it out, and divide the project, divide the, the profits, and then maybe later sell the house and divide the proceeds. How would that work out? Very well. So what they did, they agreed to keep the house and that one and rent it out, and uh, then sometime in the future it would be sold. And that one single fact, I think, led to the success of Flip and Flip Hat. It shows Flip's attitude toward life and wealth. And besides that, if you just take that one single fact, the, the keeping the house itself, that can make quite a difference between rental income, appreciation on the house, and if any of you have gone through a divorce, you know how this can be debilitating. Suddenly, uh, your credit's no good, uh, you have lots of expenses you weren't uh, in, intending, and lots of times this really sets people back on their, on their haunches. Now, here's an example of what may, what may well have been a house that uh, Flip and Flip had had. $100,000, 10% down. Uh, payment of $90,000 as a finance amount, 8% mortgage. Uh, in this day and age, it would be more like 5% mortgage and 20% uh, down. But just looking at that, the profit that would come each year from rent that they would divide and the build up of equity. If we look at it over a 20 year period, there would have been 191,000 in rent income come in and 186 in appreciation. So it really did pay to be a nice guy. Now we've looked at a nice guy with one house, but here's a cryonicist who owns many houses, and he is Tom Swift. He lives in the Silicon Valley, he's got a nice salary, he's got a cryo wife and cryo kids, and in his early 50s, he's a hands-on uh, active cryonicist. And my hat is really out to guys that do that. I think we need more guys like Tom. So he now owns six homes in Northern California. They were purchased outright with no mortgage. Now the, usually, the usual formula is to leverage to the max, to buy homes that, uh, with a little money down and use other people's money to pay for them. Uh, Tom said he didn't want to do that. He said that the homes that he bought had actually belonged to other people that had tried that and it didn't work out too well for him. So paid for them outright, his wife manages them. He used uh, self-directed IRAs for the purchase of two of his homes. Uh, this shows uh, an example of one home uh, after the closing costs of uh, 207, 297, almost 278 invested. Rental income of 31,000 a year, expenses of four, so he has about $27,000 right off the bat of income. And this shows projected values over one, five, and 10 years of one house. And here is what his present estate looks like, and remember he's still a young guy, and it may well be that he is one of, one of our super millionaires of the future if he keeps doing what he's doing. So right now he has about a million dollars over five years in rental income, the value of about three million dollars, his personal es residence is worth about a million, and he has cash and cash equivalents of 200 to give him uh, 5.2 million dollars, not including life insurance. Okay, let's look at his strategy. High paying job, uh, working with the wife so they had mutual goals, invest in single family homes managed by wife, one quarter of his estate will go to cryonics as a free and clear gift for the last of the couple to be deanimated. 
Now let's look at um, two cryomillionaires, husband and wife. Now this is the one that's a, a real person, though it doesn't look very real there. Professor Freud and Jill. Here's Jill. I love this, uh, and she's taken from a 1930s cartoon. And she says, I'm busy, Daisy, doing science. Professor taught for five additional years in order to be able to um, pass on what he wanted to to his, uh, his relatives and other commitments that he had made, but still do cryonics. Now, uh, this made a big difference with Jill because he made this very unselfish commitment. And I think it says if you want something, you need to, do, you need to give something. Jill was also signed up. She had uh, retirement funds through his, her teacher plan. She taught uh, high school. And she was cryopreserved before the professor. And uh, some of her income went on to the professor. And after Jill was cryopreserved, her uh, remaining assets was managed by a uh, professor. They were both cryopreserved, both contributed capital, and they had a last to die provision in their, uh, their trust, and the trust is now funding cryonics research. Okay, our final cryomillionaire is Scrooge. Very thrifty. He created a trust in 1985. He didn't, didn't like the stock market, and he bought and sold second deeds of trust as a method of wealth building. I think his insurance plan uh, is worth looking at. He had term insurance and company insurance up till February of 2003 when he retired early from IBM. And uh, at the time that he was cryopreserved, he had 352000 in insurance or single life premium uh, policies which had cost 143000 but most important was the fact that any time that he would have uh, deanimated during any of that period, he would have been covered by his insurance program. So here's what uh, his post-deanimation funds look like. 61000 went to CI, double what they usually re require. He's got 140000 with the Reanimation, reanimation Foundation. Uh, net insurance proceeds after paying all the costs of cryopreservation and uh, some research gold of 100,000 and 1.75 in real estate, so he is very well diversified. So frugal life, second deeds of trust, insurance and annuities to build, uh, to build wealth and create an immediate estate, and cr he created a cryonics trust to memorialize his wishes, diversified during wealth building and diversified after he was cryopreserved. And that's how our people did it. Here are our heroes out for, a, for a, a, a curtain call, or you can do it the other way. You can plant a money tree. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is my presentation. Thank you very much. I want to be one of those wealthy cartoon characters, not the unwealthy cartoon characters. Good news. We have hung tough, and you are going to be rewarded, I believe, with a lovely lunch. But we have, we have a very important mechanism that's going to happen here because we are going, could we have our SA people walk up here while I'm talking? Um, the, uh, let me go ahead and introduce these marvelous, astonishingly good looking gentlemen. Uh, we have Ryan Levesque with the Client Services Administrator and Client Services and Donor Recovery Manager with a Suspended Animation, here referred to as SA. Uh, for the last two and a half years, he, has a, he was a medical field corpsman for the United States Marines, a tour in Fallujah. Challenge, he uh, has a challenge the Nursing Board of California to obtain a nursing license, has worked in oncology for five years. Sayer Johnson has been the operations manager for SA for the last two years, been on field standby stabilization, and we are, these guys are going to, you're going to love this. We're, we're gonna, they're going to have a, they were supposed to have a PowerPoint, but it didn't give them enough time, so it's my bad. But instead, what we're going to actually see, their amazing device, while we're eating lunch, basically, in groups of 10, because you can get, I think, 10, including you guys, we need 12, 12 plus you guys. So groups of 10 of you will be going uh, while you're eating lunch downstairs to view their amazing technology. So this is Suspend Animation Team. Thank you.
Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Ryan Levesque. I'm the Client Services and Donor Recovery Manager for Suspended Animation. With me here today is Sarah Johansson. He's the Operations and Building Manager for SA as well. Uh, just to give you guys a little brief overview, I know we're kind of strapped for time, so I'll try to make this quick. Uh, so what, it does, what does SA really do? So SA is a 100% deployable, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, uh, deployable team. We actually deploy to the patient's bedside uh, any given time of day, night, doesn't matter. Uh, we have two facilities, one here in Florida in Boynton Beach, one here in Rancho Santa Margarita of California, two mobile operating units, three fully stocked air deployment cases uh, consisting of 14 pelicans, 14 pelican cases each, uh, and we basically have a contract with a company called Perfusion.com that provides us with surgeons and perfusionists at any given time. So SA is a logistics, recovery, stabilization, and transport team. So at any given time, we go to a patient's bedside and essentially do a, something called a standby. Uh, it's very important that we stipulate that we actually do not do any sort of intervention. We don't give medical advice. We don't talk to hospital staff on what they should be giving the patient. We want to stay clear of that. Uh, so we are a standby team until the patient has been pronounced. At that time, we intervene. We have the remains re legally released to us, and we begin a stabilization process. That entails transporting the patient into something called an ice bath, where we're actually doing external cooling on the patient. Uh, at, during this time, we're actually starting something called a CPS. We use an autopulse device. This is giving continuous chest compressions on the patient. We intubate, we use a ventilator to start the oxygen exchange within the body, and then we're also starting to push medications at the same time. The importance of a CPS device is so that, the, one, the blood that we're trying to keep from getting stagnant doesn't clot on us for perfusion, and the second is so that we can actually start the medication infusion throughout the body as well. So without the autopulse, we can't perform that, we'd have to do chest compressions, and that can be very, very exhausting. Uh, so during this time, we saw the uh, CPS ventilator, cooling, medications, and once we get through to a certain degree threshold, which is roughly about 25 degrees Celsius, we stop the autopulse, get the patient ready for surgery and prepped, and our surgeon perfusion starts to step in. This is the start of the rapid cooling process um, so that we can you know, essentially prevent the ischemic damage from, from taking hold. We want to prevent that as much as possible. Uh, and ischemia is basically the... Uh, cell death, essentially. It's the lack of blood exchange throughout the body, and without the blood exchange, we cannot perform, uh, there's no oxygen exchange, which basically causes the cell to die. So during this time, the surgeon steps in, uh, does the chest thoracic surgery, essentially, cannulates the vessels, and then the perfusion steps in. We do something called a washout procedure or an open circuit perfusion. This is basically uh, an infusion of something we call MHP2 solution. It's an organ preservation fluid that essentially pushes through the body and pushes all the blood. Once we get the, enough blood out of the body to, to prevent any sort of clotting, we super cool a second bag of MHP2 solution to roughly about zero degrees Celsius, infuse that into a patient called a closed circuit perfusion, where it's basically just going through a huge loop, super cooling and going right through the body as well. Uh, once we get down to a threshold of zero to 10 degrees Celsius, that's when we essentially stop so and get the patient ready for transport. Uh, we always have one personnel, either Sarah or myself, fly with the patient, whether it's private air transport, commercial airliner, or we're actually just driving if it's close distance uh, until we do official handoff with the Oregon uh, Chronics organization, whether it be Alcor, CI, CS, uh, ACS, Chronics, American Chronics Society, uh, where after the official handoff, they will essentially take over and begin the vitrification process. Uh, so one thing that I like to stipulate is there's, there's an issue of communication, I think. So we are, although we're on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, a lot of our cases are last minute cases. Uh, so communication between the members and the chronics organization or ourselves even uh, will go a long way. So that way we can do a, a better job of logistics, figure out you know, what's the best time to actually deploy to the patient's bedside. Uh, and get everything ready. So there's a thing called the UAGA Act, the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act. This is the basic umbrella that chronic organizations operate under. It's essentially the anatomical donation of members for research. But what we come to find out is the UAGA Act, although it's a federal-based guideline, each state has kind of catered it to their own specific needs. So although it's a uniform gift act, it's no longer uniform between states. 
So because of this issue, we're having issues sometimes. We, it's happened a couple of times, but we've made do of getting the, the remains released to us in a timely manner, and second, getting the correct uh, documentation, the permits, and everything issued to us in a timely manner as well. So uh, communication from our members it would be phenomenal and it'll go a long way. And I think I'm probably at that time zone right now, so I'm going to head up. But I do want to do a quick shout out to uh, BRLS, the Biomedical uh, Research and Longevity Society. Without them, we actually, uh, they sub subsidize us 100% of our funding. Uh, and without them, we would essentially not be, a, be able to hold a service for our members. So I do want to give a shout out to Bill Falloon. He's sitting here right here in the front row and Saul Kent as our uh, BRLS funders. And uh, I will leave it over to Rudy. I like that. Okay, the uh, logistics on lunch are as follows. Uh, well, first of all, our wonderful officiator, Neil, okay, we've got our question and answer person. If you have any Q&A cards, the, this lovely person will come pick them up. So if you've got any additional QA cards, raise your hand, please. Uh, we got a bunch of them in there. I don't know how we'll get to them. We'll figure it out. Uh, second of all, our wonderful officiator, Neil, and Bill Falloon are way too classy to, to uh, push you guys for any kind of offering. Guess what? I ain't. Uh, so I will officially do this. First of all, here's a, a, church, a, a check. It's not enough, but it's a check made out of Church Perpetual Life for 100 bucks for at least a part of my uh, contribution for lunch. Thank you. Uh, I ain't going to eat that much. Uh, but the, uh, uh, so anyway, there's, there's uh, baskets and, and containers around here that are available. They're rather nice and classy and subtle. They don't pass a, pass a thing around, which I think is nice. But anyway, please contribute if you can. That's the, that's the mission. Uh, Neil, will you please talk about logistics and how we're going to do lunch? Oh, okay, let's do that. Okay, Rudy, thank you for that plug. I appreciate that. And someone had asked, uh, when, you, when you put money in the basket for the food or the other basket, it's all for the general fund for the church. So thank you for that contribution, that most welcome contribution, Rudy. We have a delicious lunch prepared for you. And uh, someone was complaining about the fact that one of the items on the, on the table was not exactly the thing that a longevity enthusiast should eat. And my response is, don't eat it, <laughs> okay? <laughs> eat the stuff that is good for you then. That's fine, That's, but, uh, but we have a lot of things. And you may have seen or heard that we won't tell you what to think or what to do. We will give you ideas that can help you live long lives. We're here to inspire you. We're here to, to talk about what is best to do. I don't know the answer. Bill knows a lot more than me, but maybe he hasn't got the clue yet, the, the key yet, rather, the key to extreme longevity. I intend to be here in 500 years, and we're going to figure out how to do that, but we're all finding our own ways, and, and we're certainly open to hearing if you have an idea of how we can live to be 150, and of course we want to catch the longevity escape velocity, which is to live to be 500 and then 1,000. So at any rate, the log logistics for lunch, it's simple. Downstairs, our five-star chef, his name, by the way, is Chef, Chef Old. So Chef Chef, is got lunch ready for you. So we're ready to, I guess, reconvene downstairs while we're doing this. As you know, Sayer and Ryan, they're going to be doing the tours of the cryomobile that's out there. Be sure to get your chance to watch, to get, to get into that tour. And uh, let's go ahead and have a good lunch. Hey, I'm so proud of this group, I can't stand it. I want to think you guys should give yourselves a pat on the back and how about a, a round of applause. I, we told you we had a tight schedule, but we're adhering to it. The level of maturity and intelligence and vision in this room is inspiring and exciting. Our presentations have really hit it out of the park, in my opinion, and we're going to get better and better. So I'm really, really pleased about the way this event is going, and it's all because of you. However, I want to make sure that you know, I, I forget, did forget to do one thing, when, which was make sure that you got someone to introduce yourself to. Could you take about 30 seconds and just quickly stand up and introduce yourself to somebody around you with who maybe you don't know? Anybody you got around you? It's called Christina. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I saw it. Now, now that we've completely lost the room. All right, stop trying to be interesting. <laughs> we, 
We'll stipulate that you're all interesting and fascinating and we'll want to get together after the meeting. And we're waiting for a bit of calm. We're close. Man, be able to get the room back after that. That's impressive. We have, oh, by the way, here's a quick bit of technical tutorial. I love this. The reason that Mark Laux paid so darn much for these things is because they have a piece of technology in the back that lets you slide them up so you can get your, get your name badge way high so people can actually see it. Is that brilliant? And Mark Laux and Regina Monaco are going to come talk to us about some idea, an idea to make Koranix better. And they are going to talk now. Thanks. Hello. Just testing. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, this is my first time at the Church for Perpetual Life. My, and and, yeah, mine too. I'm yeah. here from Pennsylvania, so hello, everyone. Yeah, we're both here from two different places in Pennsylvania. So this is fantastic. I don't know how I can follow the talks that were this morning. Uh, the, all the previous speakers just blew me away, so I'm really getting a lot out of it. I'm really glad to be here and to meet all the people I'm meeting. And we want to contribute to the community by discussing something that we discussed. We both belong to the New York City Alcor group, and we, had, uh, we put together a subcommittee, and we came up with uh, ideas what to do between the time a person is uh, deanimating de and when SA appears. So that's a gap that can vary in length and it can be a, a very critical time where you wanna be cooling if you can. So we came up with a simple homemade head cooling device for cryonicists. So, excuse me. So I think you all learned this morning, we all discussed in, uh, very thoroughly that for cryonicists, nothing is more important during the process than cooling. So I won't belabor it. Preservation of neural information, which is very important to me personally, and neural patterns occurs via cooling. If you're, if you're deanimating and that process has started, heat is your enemy, and you're gonna wanna wick it out as fast as possible. I know that preceding speakers have made that clear. But you want it to start as soon as possible. Um, so we're gonna discuss a way to make your own cooling hood, right? Something happens at home and uh, you wanna start the process. There are a number of ways to do it. We're gonna discuss the design of a hood that we think is very simple um, for everybody to have access to. So I'm not gonna belabor this at all. Cryonics provides us a bridge between now and the future. Max Moore and a couple other people made that super clear. Um, so if you want access to future medical technology, then you're gonna have to use the current medical technology that we have now, that's cryonics. So cryonics connects us and gets us to the future where there's more medical knowledge, and I think that's just a really clear bridge. So in any case, if you're doing cooling, um, and I think, again, people are aware of this, you definitely have to alert the standby team and your cryonics institution first. So this device is not meant to be used uh, until that has occurred. And pronouncement is very important. It's a medical legal term. It doesn't mean you're actually dead. Death does not occur until, as Ralph Merkel has defined, you have information theoretic death. That's when the information in your brain is irretrievable. There's a long period of time when the information in your brain is still retrievable, and that's, that's what we're trying to get to. So cooling has a, you may say, well, what's the difference? Start it an hour later, you know it's okay. Cooling is cooling. It has a profound effect on preserving neural function. Neural function begins to degrade. Uh, some people, there's a little controversy on this. My personal opinion as a neuroscientist is that it begins to degrade within minutes of anoxia. It, whether with it's, it's within minutes or tens of minutes, it still begins pretty quick. Those cells are very sensitive and you're just gonna wanna, wanna cool, stop the cascade of events that are happening as soon as possible. So this is a really important chemical uh, fact. Reaction rates, which are metabolic rates, are reaction rates in chemistry, they have with every 10 degrees of cooling. What most people do not realize, and what's really uh, impressive to know, is that if you cool from approximately 100 degrees to approximately 30 degrees, you've slowed down reaction rates by three orders of magnitude, by a factor of 1,000. Okay, so that means that if you are cooling, you are slowing things down and giving yourself basically more time. So how do we cool? 
If you're at home, uh, someone should begin the cooling process with, there's a number of ways that, that cryonicists become aware of. The longer you're in the community, the more you'll become aware of these ways. So there's a portable ice bath, there's the sling with ice um, that, uh, that you can pack your head or body with bags of ice, and a bathtub with ice and water. So each of these ways has some drawbacks. And an ice bath, in fact, can be harder than expected. If you're prepared, if you have a team, if you are not you know, completely in shock that your loved one has gone down and everybody's on hand and you've got the ice, you can do an ice bath. But moving a person, getting them into an ice bath is hard. And it's something that you have to prepare while time is critical. So you've got a, an emergency, a critical situation on your hand, a cardiac arrest or something, and you have to now move the person, get the ice, coordinate the team, get people to come over. There's a delay in that. So it can just be more, more difficult than you, than you think. So, hello. Our method allows the same amount of cooling, but in, in a method that can be deployed very quickly, and you'll see that in a second. So we call it Real Cool. It's a real cool name. <laughs> so, you like that, thank you. So we devised a simple device, the pictures are coming. Um, it's a, you take a, pause. Pause. <laughs> We actually brought a prototype with us. This is not exactly what you're going to play with at home. Oh, I should have mentioned, this is a project. So after you guys see this, you're going to, you're, if you're interested, you're going to go by tubing, you're going to go by pumps, you're going to buy a cooler, and you're going to play with it. And there's some slides of us playing with it too. This is so simple. This is a $12, hello, where'd it go? It's a $12 cord. This is a, is a pump for a fountain. It moves water, it's submersible. So you put it in ice water, it's gonna pump ice water. It's gonna pump it, there's a port. All of these submersible pumps have a port. Here's the port here. The tubing <laughs> fell apart a little bit. A bit of a maze. Yeah, it's kind of cool. All right. Okay, there so the, the tubing, and you're gonna see it working in a second in a video. So this is tubing, way too short. If you wanna cool your whole head, we discovered you need uh, more than you think. We thought 20 feet would be enough, you're gonna wanna buy about 50. But anyway, you've, got, you've plugged that into the pump. It's gonna pump cold water. You're gonna wrap it around whatever you wanna cool. And you're gonna just pump cool water through it. You're just gonna pump ice water through it. It's clean, it's contained. You're not immersing a body into cool water. The cool water is coming to you, basically, through the tubing. And it can be recirculated, easily kept. You can keep the ice water going. You just keep adding ice to the cooler. And so it can go for hours with minimal or fuss. So that's the description I just gave. Okay, let's have pictures. So <laughs> I don't know if you can identify the guy on the lower right. That's not me. <laughs> I don't have lips yeah. that look like that unless they're constricted by a tasteless black tubing. So <laughs> it was not tasteless, it was really bad. Yeah, you probably don't want to taste well, it. Will be wearing. <laughs> yes. So um, this is not a final wrapping design, by the way. And I'll, we'll show you some pictures of, a, of more efficient methods to wrap. But it's to show, when we first had this idea, we didn't know it would work. We didn't know how much it would cool. So we each individually <laughs> did these tests. So that's Mark. That, uh, that man is my husband. And that's uh, Dr. Kat. She was supervising the, uh, <laughs> the trials. And I don't know if you can see, but the, this, this exact pump is, and uh, there's a little video clip coming, is in that cooler, and the cooler, you should get a much bigger cooler if you're doing this. But this exact pump, so it's lifting the water about three feet, which I didn't think this teeny little pump could do, which means if you get a better pump, which I would do if you're gonna rely on this, you're gonna, you're gonna, it's gonna have a lot of power, and it's gonna be able to move a lot of water. But anyway, it's going up and around the head, the cat's measuring it, she's got a clipboard, it's right out of the frame, and then the water is exhausting back into the cooler. <laughs> so our original idea was a larger <laughs> pump, and you found this thing for just a couple dollars, right? This pump is like eight or twelve dollars. There are pumps that move three hundred, you'll see it later, and I have links. This is all actionable. I think if anyone's interested, they should get the slide deck later. I have references. Every statement I made, like reaction rates uh, cool, uh, have every 10 degrees, there's papers to it. Um, but there's also links to Amazon where you can buy a pump and you can buy tubing. A hundred feet of tubing is $14. There's 
no reason that people who might even be a little bit interested in this might just play with it for less than a hundred bucks. Yeah. Use your summer cooler, use the ice from your freezer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah have it at home, ready to go. Yeah. It's yeah. easy. I mean, it's, it's not perfect, yeah. but it's a, a reasonable safeguard against just letting someone remain warm. Yes. You, you, that's the last thing you want to do. And one of the things I like about this is that if you're putting someone in an ice bath, for example, you're preparing at that moment. If you do this, you have this prepared ahead of time. When the person is in the process or beginning the animation, you just put, this is gonna be in a hood, which I'll show you later, you just put the hood on the person, the wrapping you did in time that you have when you're healthy and not going down. So it saves a lot of time at a very critical moment when you are really gonna be doing a million things. You're calling 911, you're running around getting ice, you're calling people on the team, you're calling the hospital, a lot of stuff's going on at once. This is one less thing that you have to do because this is prepared. You want to move on and we'll come back to this? Yeah. Because it probably won't be that difficult. For I, I think that's true. Separately. I guess yeah. you guys so, can look yeah, at this Yeah, we can later. come back to that. Yep. Here we have a simple proof of concept. We have a small pool pump that was just for this proof of concept. I would not use it in a real scenario. I'd use a larger and more powerful pump. But this is proving that the water can be lifted up a small distance. It goes through the tubing. Clearly, this is too short. Again, proof of concept. Yes, yeah, not completely it's going around wrapped. the head and exhausting back into the cooler. The water in the cooler can be changed as it warms. Uh, ice can be added and water can be drained out. So this will continually recirculate ice water for as long as you want and as long as you have ice. And it is circulating around the area to be cooled. Uh, and being continuously pumped by the pump. This is a very efficient and clean way of uh, effecting cooling. What I like about it that I didn't mention earlier is also it's clean. Sometimes if you're immersing a person who's deanimated into ice water, they can, they can get bodily fluids into the ice water and then you have to deal with that. This is not, that's not gonna happen. The water is contained and it's under control in the cooler. So that's another, another benefit I think of this. Okay, so I like this, you'll see why on the next slide. When we first discussed this, Mark produced this picture, which I think is fantastic. Um, you, actually, you can see it's a small bore tube, which it turns out, you, this is three quarter inch. You're gonna wanna start with something smaller. Um, I think it's much more efficient. So he has this cool wrapping and it goes around the head and the neck, which is this a lot of cooling that you could do here. And, uh, and he has this particular pattern and there's the igloo. You didn't draw the cat though. Yeah, no cat like in this cat. photo. And I, I really don't have any working knowledge of this space. I just had a, an, an idea and sketched it out. And there's some flaws with this idea that uh, Regina improved upon. Like oh, I originally you. thought we would fill the cooler with ice water and drain it out. But I realized that having the water in the cooler and circulating yeah. it through there and dispensing the return water into the cooler itself, picking yeah. up that new water yeah. and circulating it through the pump was better than a closed circuit. Minutes. Which is why you want to play with these things and you want to try them. Okay, now I'm rushing. So, and, and when you get a pattern you like, you're going to want to fix it so that the pattern is fixed so that then you pull the hood over with the tubing uh, when you need it. Um, but here's the important slide, which I love. After we did a lot of this preparation, I found this slide in the literature. There's a group of people, the Minnesota Advanced uh, Cooling Group did research they look at the, the winding pattern. We didn't see this, Mark didn't see this, right? It's the same pattern. So we don't have to do as many proof of concepts. We know this works. This is federally funded by millions of dollars, it turns out. That's a very thin cotton hood. They also do it in a mesh. They wind the tubing around it. And it's literally, it's thousands of dollars. And it's used in medical procedures for traumatic brain injury. Ah, oh, they're cooling the brain down to slow decay. We already know it works. Uh, they actually even can cool the whole body by cooling the blood that goes around the head. So, okay. Ah, I'm trying to rush. So this is not for people that have deanimated, but it's good, so they're not using ice water, but it's good to know that this works. So. This is what to order. If you're interested, you get the slide deck, you'll get all these details. It's not that many things. I'm not gonna go through all this math, but this basically shows that five pounds of ice is enough to cool, uh, now you have to get all the, pa the energy out of it, but uh, ideally, a 100 pound body by 10 degrees. 
So that means you can do a lot with ice water, especially if you're only cooling the head, which on average weighs about 10 pounds. So it's, it's definitely something that will reduce the temperature by at least 10 degrees. And if you remember from earlier, 10 degrees halves the reaction rate. So you've bought yourself twice as much time with just a 10 degree cooling. And if you get 20 or 30 degrees, now you're down to 12% of the original reaction rates. So if anyone cares to do the BTU calculations, you can talk to me later. Conclusions, nothing, nothing is more important than starting cool down as soon as possible. One of the most essential reasons is to preserve your neural information. That's, that's who you are, so that's the most important thing that you want. And last slide, thanks again to Thank all you. of you for listening to Rudy Hoffman and the Church of Thank Perpetual you. Life. Thanks. No, it was a re real cool, I think. That was, that was a real cool presentation. Uh, I, I've already bought my, my pump. I did not bring that. It goes, I've already, it's a bigger pump. So I'll be, I, I thought about bringing it to, to slop up a demo, but I thought you guys would, uh, that is very nice. And would, I love the PowerPoint. Outstanding. To, and now we have. We are truly a cryotics symposium international. We have folks from Russia and we have folks from China. And here they are, and they're going to be introducing a film. This is, would you pronounce your name, please, correctly? Uh, my name? Yes. Uh, Jeremy Yan from Crown Asia. Jeremy Yan, well, I can yeah. do that. What about the Luan, Luan part? Yeah, that's the Chinese name. <laughs> okay, we'll go with Jer Jeremy. Yeah, yeah. Please, Jeremy. So, so uh, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, I'm talking about the international cooperation and the development of chronics in Asia. Uh, this film is uh, talking about the first uh, local uh, crop preservation in China. So the film has uh, some English subtitles. Uh, I hope everybody can see it. If you cannot see it, uh, it's uh, in Chinese. Uh, about 15 minutes, then I have a, a brief introduction after that. If you guys cannot, in the back, you cannot see the subtitles. You can either move forward or maybe you can signal to me. I will try to paraphrase that during the process. So let's go ahead and play the, uh, the movie first. Bingan 救护车到达医院阿伦德雷克作为临床响应组专家第一时间与医生见面询问病人病情病指挥临床响应成员各就各位等待 进入山东大学齐鲁医院东院舒适化病房治疗，这一次住院，他向丈夫桂军民表达了一个心愿：捐献自己的遗体，供科学研究。我的爱人呢，是一个非常有大爱的人，在他这个意识、身体都比较健康
，我也知道他内心的怨恨，我就能代表他做这个决定。至少对他的爱还能继续往下延续啊！包括我的孩子也是说，总比那一把火烧了强。现在最起码他妈妈是活着。啊，就当他妈妈跟他睡觉了。人要给自己一个梦。这是啊，铁铃铃，明明是南方城啊，你忘记吗？二零一七年五月八日四点零一分。展女士停止了呼吸和心跳，主管医生宣布病人临床死亡。守候了十几个小时的临床响应专家立即介入。When the heart stops beating and the lungs stop breathing, this stops the supply of oxygen to the body. When that happens, the cells can begin to die. So what we want to do is prevent damage from occurring, especially to the brain. So we first put a, a device over their chest that does compressions, it does CPR. We'll put a tube down into the lungs, and so and we'll hook them up to a ventilator. Now the patient is breathing again. By doing these things, we can prevent damage from occurring. The next thing we're going to do is cool the body. That will reduce the metabolic demand of oxygen throughout the body, and we're going to administer a number of medications, which are going to keep the body very very healthy. 理论上，当人停止呼吸和心跳后，大脑缺氧耐受时间为四到六分钟。一旦超过这一时间，大脑皮质细胞就会因缺氧开始出现不可逆转的损伤。而心肺支持迅速介入，维持大脑及机体的供血与供氧，可以最大程度地避免上述情况的发生。这也是人体低温保存过程中最重要的环节之一。凌晨四点二十四分，救护车到达山东银丰生命科学研究院低温医学研究中心。经过术前预处理，病人被转移至专用低温手术台。凌晨四点三十分，人体低温保存灌流手术正式开始。从病人心跳停止到灌流手术开始，仅用时二十九分钟。本次人体低温保存灌流手术采用了微创双通路体外循环灌注技术，该技术只有在心肺移植、心脏外科等重大手术中才会被采用，而被运用于人体低温保存手术中，在世界范围内尚属首次。用最快的速度、最小的损伤建立符合我们人体这种保存的这种调节这种体外循环，那到现在目前最好的可能是就微创体外循环了。通过大腿根部这个动脉啊，东西我们建立一个体外循环，呃，包括 ECMO 这技术。但是我们现在人体当中对缺氧最敏感的就是脑子，所以我们必须要优先的保护脑子的问题。人体温度是影响生命机体，尤其是脑氧代谢的最重要因素。降温可以使脑部和机体的氧耗量明显减少。据相关文献显示。体温每降低一摄氏度，身体及脑氧代谢率平均可降低百分之五点五，机体及脑对缺氧的耐受性增加。当人体体温从三十七摄氏度降至零摄氏度，可以将其氧代谢率降低十到十二倍左右。人体组织器官在低温环境下可以存活八到四十小时。据美国哈佛大学研究显示。目前，肾脏在缺血供氧环境下最长可保存三十五小时，心脏和肺最长可保存六小时。低温技术早在一九五九年就用于临床手术，目前已在组织器官转运保存和心肺移植、肾脏血管移植等重大手术中广泛应用。整个灌流手术在低温手术台上进行，同时运用生命支持系统，结合体外循环降温技术，实现身体的降温、血液置换和冷冻保护剂的灌注渗透
冷冻的细胞是有损伤的，怎么能够保证这个细胞的活性非常重要啊。那么说，你低温度不能降太快，同时还把整个血液置换出来以后，用低温冷冻的保护液保护这个细胞，这非常重要。把整个血液系统换成我们的低温冷冻保护液，这样能达到比较完善的不损伤细胞的功能的一种保护措施。因此。此次手术通过体外循环技术，将体温降至十八到二十摄氏度，放缓人体生物代谢速度，然后进行血液与冷冻保护剂的置换，并继续进行身体降温。理论上，使其对缺氧的耐受时间可以延长五到六小时。如果体温继续降低，人体生物活性时间将进一步延长。直到降低至零下以后，将停止灌流过程，转移到长续降温设备中。如果说灌流手术是一个紧张而专注的过程，那长续降温则是缓慢而精准的过程。接下来要将病人转移至一台大跨度、高精度的自动长续降温仪内，通过准确控制降温速率，确保身体内外温度均降至零下一百九十摄氏度左右，从而避免冰晶、物理应力损伤的发生。这台长续降温仪是目前世界上唯一一台可以连续长续降温到零下一百九十摄氏度左右的人体降温专用设备，由银峰生命科学研究院自主研发。要将整个人体安全地降至零下一百九十摄氏度，大约需要五十多个小时。在降温过程中，人体的代谢基本停止。人体低温保存被誉为低温生物医学的终极梦想。半个世纪以来，低温以及超低温的世界一直吸引着物理学家和生物学家在这个领域探索不辍。一九九三年，山东大学齐鲁医院沈伯钧教授建立了低温医学实验室，开始致力于低温医学的科学研究。二零一四年起，先后赴俄罗斯、美国，对世界三大人体冷冻机构进行考察与交流，已成功实现多种人体细胞、组织以及器官的低温保存及复苏，掌握多种配方的冷冻保护剂，成功研制大型程序降温及保存设备等，为论证人体低温保存的可行性，陆续进行了数十例动物实验。参照国外三家人体冷冻组织的经验，制定了更符合科学依据的人体低温保存的手术方案、技术路线，积累了宝贵的数据参数。银峰生命科学研究院拥有经验丰富、实力雄厚的专业技术队伍，包括来自美国的著名人体低温保存专家阿伦·德雷克，已在阿尔科从事人体冷冻多年，并参与过七十多例人体冷冻手术。该团队还包括山东大学齐鲁医院的低温医学专家、心外科专家、麻醉专家、体外循环专家、国内外低温生物学专家及干细胞技术专家等。随着低温生物医学的快速发展，越来越多的人对人体低温保存逐渐认知并接受。目前，全球已有三百六十多人被低温保存起来。还有两千多人签署参与人体冷冻文件。二零一五年五月，中国女作家杜红成为第一个参与人体冷冻的中国人，只是她选择了仅保存头部。而詹女士成为了参与中国本土人体低温保存的第一人。目前已有十余位志愿者加入了银峰生命延续研究计划，其中有低温医学领域专家。临床医生和企业家等，他们对人体低温保存的发展充满了信心。然而，在中国传统文化和社会观念中。
捐献遗体，低温保存，仍然需要一个循序渐进的接受过程。因为选择人体低温保存，的确是需要付出很大的勇气。无法成功的原因，第一个是因为这种入土为安的传统观念，家庭成员意见的不统一，有一些愿意参与这项研究计划的人，是在最后时刻才做出决定，留给我们临床响应的时间太短。也导致我们无法对其啊采取临床应急的措施。啊，对于展文莲女士来说呢，啊，之所以成功，是因为病人本身的状态啊比较适合我们开展临床响应的预案，也符合我们生命延续研究计划的这种理念。所以在与其家属反复沟通确认之后，我们完成了对展文莲女士的身体的这种低温的保存。我想呢，这不仅帮助展女士实现了奉献大爱的美好夙愿，同时呢，也留给家庭一份欣慰，一个美好的希望吧。经过五十四个小时的程序降温，温度监控系统显示，病人身体内外的温度达到平衡，稳定在零下一百九十二摄氏度左右。在特制液氮保存罐中，温度将被维持在零下一百九十六摄氏度。在这样的温度中，人体细胞的新陈代谢需要两千四百万年，生命在此暂停，默默等待未来科技的唤醒。The Shandong Yinfeng Life Science Institute is the first organization to have ever performed a full body cryopreservation in Asia. Um, I truly believe uh, that they have the potential to be the best in the world in stabilization and cryopreservation. Because of what I saw, it went perfectly. And, and I have nine years' worth of experience to say this. I've worked with every uh, clinics organization around the world, and I'm, I'm very impressed. As 现在做到的是用当今最符合科学依据的技术，把身体完整的保存起来。而对于复苏，则期待未来生命科学和医学技术的巨大进步。我们还有很长的路要走。啊，现有的技术条件下，我们解决不了，那么留给未来去解决。就说虽然人不能永生。但是我们最起码能留着这个永生的希望，我能帮你实现这个愿望，我已经就很高兴了，啊！如果要是说，嗯，有这个可能，将来我能陪着他一块苏醒，那是更好。So this one was talking about the first uh, local uh, cloud preservation in China. Uh, actually, two years before that, there's a, a famous writer did the, the neuro preservation through Elker, was transported to the United States. Uh, what's interesting, I, I want to explain about the, this international development. Uh, we all know we, before we only have the local uh, preservation facility in the United States uh, to uh, everybody know Elker and CI. And then actually there are maybe three or four more, including one in Miami, one in Bay Area, and one in Oregon. Uh, there's one or two more pending, I think. Uh, then after that, the first one was uh, uh, outside the United States, was established in Russia. Uh, 2014, I forgot, but it was uh, but, uh, uh, then in this uh, called Infong. Uh, it's a public company and a big player. They have 7,000 7, employees. I have uh, assigned uh, 11 full-time staff to pre-conservation. Um, they are doing this in China as a scientific research project. Uh, so uh, 
In China, I believe there's a much greater potential for this uh, uh, chronic uh, development, uh, mainly because uh, actually in Chinese culture, we, I believe it's more conducive to these uh, preservation ideas. So, uh, uh, what do you guys think of the dif biggest difference between Western and Oriental philosophy or culture? How to, if we want to summarize it in a few words. So, uh, of course, there's uh, many different ways to, to say that, but the one biggest difference, Oriental culture tend to be monism, which means that I tend to believe the body and mind are, are, are totality. Uh, actually, that's the belief of the faith of the majority of people. Uh, also, this is the, uh, uh, consistent with the Korean culture, which means our consciousness and personality is a functionality of the brain. As the majority of the people believe, we will see in Western culture, dualism is the mainstream philosophy, which means the body and soul are two necessary uh, separate entity, not necessarily depending on each other. Uh, we, of course, if you're a Christian, don't, don't necessarily mean you are against the Quranics. However, if you're not a Christian, that means you have much better chance to accept Quranics. So that's the case in Oriental culture. So for this infant company uh, alone, uh, for this first half of 2019, they officially accepted three patients already. This is after they rejected numerous other patients. To be a patient of them, uh, it's supposed to be a scientific project. You have to pay $200,000 ahead of time before you pass away. And maybe another uh, unspecified amount, annual fee for the sustainable uh, preservation. Uh, uh, this number, according to the number I told Ben Bass, is about $100,000 in addition to the 290000 So for this six, uh, I have six patients already after 2017, uh, the first patient, then I have uh, started to recruit some patients in 2018. So I already recruited $2.2 million US dollars just for the the membership fee. Uh, for uh, So we do see a, a greater potential for the future developments uh, overseas. Uh, especially uh, for this big player, uh, right now they are only doing that as a scientific research project. So, but uh, we, we do see this great potential, especially after the, the, the change the, the, of the legal environment. Right now the legal environment is not so, so, so beneficial for chronics. But uh, hopefully, eventually we will, we will change that so we can do, that, do the full commercialization for chronics. Okay. Outstanding. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Jeremy. That was, I tell you what, we, I know that film was a little long, but when we, I watched that film, if you didn't have a tear coming to your eye, when the, we saw all those techni cry technicians doing that big bow, that was just so moving, I thought, and I, I'm glad we could have that, and thank you very, very much. Uh, next, we have... Mr. Mike Perry, and Mike Perry is, our Michael Perry, PhD, if you prefer the formal acronym, is a patient caretaker at Alcor. Hired by Alcor in 89, Mike is a director, ordained minister of the Society for Venturism performs wedding ceremonies and memorial services for IRS-recognized scientific and religious organizations. He has offered, authored boatloads of books, that's my shortening of your bio, sorry, boatloads of books and is official historian of cryonics and has been voted the best loved cryonicist by his colleagues. May I introduce Michael Perry. All right. <clears throat> I didn't write that. You said you wanted us to write a, a bio, but I didn't write that one. I made it up. You, all right, <laughs> well, whatever. All right, people. Uh, uh, I, as you can see from the slide, I'm going to talk about uh, building a cryonics community, which is as I see it, it's pretty much the main theme of this whole symposium, or strengthening the cryonics community or whatever. And I want to go through some cryonics history. I better make sure I know where, how to do this. But, uh, so I'll go through cryonics history, and then I will talk a little about this organization called the Society for Venturism, which is really focused on the building the community, too. All right, let's see if it's going to work. Okay, and I've got a lot of slides to go through in a short time, so we're going to have to move fast. 
Well, cryonics started in the 1960s by two uh, individuals that had a similar idea, but in some ways they were really different. On the left is Robert Ettinger, and he's still pretty well remembered. On the right, Evan Cooper, probably not as well remembered. Uh, Ettinger is known as sort of the founder of cryonics and uh, wrote a book called The Prospect of Immortality that a lot of people have heard of and just sort of started, got the movement going in the 1960s. But Ev Cooper made an important contribution too. They both wrote books actually advocating the cryonics idea. Um, the first versions of these books came out in 1962. What you're seeing there is not the first versions, but later later editions, you could say. But as, as I said, The Prospect of Immortality by Robert Edinger. Immortality Physically Scientifically Now was the title of Cooper's book. He used a pen name of Nathan During which is enduring, enduring. And uh, unfortunately, as, you, as I'll get to later, he didn't quite live up to, to that last thing. But anyway, well, Ettinger lived in Detroit, in the Detroit, Michigan area. He was a physics professor. He was a technical advocate. He wasn't really an organization man. He sort of was forced to become that later with uh, running the Cryonics Institute, but anyway, uh, he got the idea out and gave a lot of presentations about it and so on. Uh, but something more was really needed, and that is where Cooper came in. He lived in Washington, D.C. He's been described as a remittance man. He seems to have lived off of a small inheritance, so he was free to pretty much do what he wanted. But he was organization and community oriented. And he started the first organization to promote uh, what would be called, what would later be called cryonics, plus of course life extension, uh, con you know, controlling the aging process, the whole, everything. It was called the Life Extension Society or LES. Uh, it had a newsletter and had conferences. He had conferences each year. He was the first one to do that. And he also wanted to spread his organization around everywhere, so he had chapters in the U.S. and even overseas in France and England, maybe some other countries. And here you see on the left is the very first newsletter of his organization that came out in January of 1964. That's the first page of the first newsletter devoted to the freezing idea. It wasn't, like I said, it wasn't called cryonics yet. And on the right is a later, a later edition. They had gotten a, a catchier title by that time called Freeze, Wait, Reanimate. And uh, that happens to be about the freezing of, of James Bedford, which is one of the early well-publicized cases that I'll mention later, shortly. Uh, anyway, all right, let's see here. Well, he wasn't perfect. And he ran his organization, but he was kind of autocratic. He believed that nobody should ever get any money for any work they did because it would taint their motives. And uh, he liked to be a one-man show, and he was very sensitive and shy and retiring with a thin skin. Very courageous in some ways, but uh, in other ways he, uh, I understand at one point he, there was uh, a lot of, uh, 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 a lot of stuff was going on at one conference and he was embarrassed and he hid in the men's room for a while to do things like that. Well, uh, I said that, that LES was starting chapters all over the place in different parts of the country. And one place was in the New York City area. There were people there that were really enthusiastic about this whole idea. And they, 
they wanted to work with Cooper, but Cooper didn't work with them too well. And uh, so they started up their own group. And uh, one of those people was named Carl Werner. I think he worked in arch art and architectural design. He was that kind of a person. Anyway, they wanted to have a name for their organization that wouldn't look like Life Extension Society. So he took the Greek word cryos, that means extreme cold, and there was some TV show about the bionic man or something, put them together and came up with cryonics. And uh, that was used for the new organization, the Cryonics Society of New York, or CSNY. Uh, the name cryonics, though, was so catchy that it ended up being used for the practice in general, not just as one organization. But anyway, CSNY was really the second major organization to get going. And uh, the two main people doing this were Curtis Henderson and Saul Kent. And uh, well, Saul Kent is still with us today, and he's been active a very long time. And Curtis Henderson at least was cryopreserved a few years ago, is at the Cryonics Institute. But going back to 1966, which is where we are now, well, they were determined to carry out cryopreservation and patient storage. Cooper wanted to do that too, but this other group was going to really try to succeed. And they, did, they published their newsletter. They organized chapters across the United States. and. Uh, one thing they did in 1966, Curtis and Saul got in their car and just started going west from the New York area and, and made a cross-country trip visiting other groups. They helped to start two organizations. One was the Cryonic Society of Michigan, in Michigan that's where Ettinger was, and the other was uh, Cryonic Society of California in that state. And like I said, initially there were just chapters of, of CSNY. They would actually break away and, and be their own organizations after a while. And they did other things. I say that Saul Kent, they, they still maintain ties with, with Cooper. So Saul Kent attended the LES conference in October 1966 in Washington. And here are some newsletters of CSNY, the very first one that they put out was in June of 66, that you see on the left. December 67, I, I've always liked that cover about the lion being friendly with the lamb. Uh, I think cryonicists hope for that too. It's not, not just religious people that hope for things like that. And uh, in September of 68, they were, that's the first newsletter that reported on one of their cases, which was Stephen Mandel, who was one of their members in July of, of that year. He was frozen by them. Uh, but he wasn't the first one to be frozen. If you want to consider those people, on the left is a woman. I think her name was, I think the name she went by was Sarah Gilbert, but I'm not sure. I'm still looking at records. Those records are not very easy to, to come by. So I put that name in scare quotes. It could be something else. But anyway, she was frozen in April of 66 by a company called Cryocare Equipment Corporation. It wasn't a chapter of LES or CSNY, either one. Their idea was that they would make capsules to store people in, but they wouldn't have a real organization to have members and all that. They would just sell the capital capsules to the, the companies that did that. But they had their capsules and people started getting in touch with them about getting somebody frozen. And they had to turn down, ah, thank you, sir. I'm gonna really have to go through this rest of this faster. But this is such a good story, I just have to tell it. Anyway, um, anyway, people came to them, and sometimes they didn't have enough money, but someone finally came to them who did have enough money to do it. So we have this lady, the face is actually a reconstruction from several other photographs that wouldn't have been very good to show uh, like they were. But 
In April of 66, she was embalmed first, stored in the mortuary for about two months, and then uh, frozen. The next one is James Bedford, who was frozen starting immediately after pronouncement, and uh, his, his preservation was a lot better. It wasn't, he was not embalmed. He was cryoprotected, though his cryoprotection was crude. And the third case was Marie Phelps Sweet that started in August of 67, and her case was even better. She was perfused better. So improving, improvements were going on. Uh, the first two freezings were not much of a problem for the movement because relatives were paying for it. But the third one, they weren't. And Marie Phelps Sweet and her husband had almost no money. So that meant that the cryonics, the cryonics community was called upon. I bet it isn't 10 minutes anymore. What is it? Eight, Eight minutes, all right. Uh, the third freezing, that of Marie Phelps Sweet, caused a real problem because uh, she was well known and respected in the community but had no money. Cooper was caught off guard because he had promised a free freeze two years before that uh, because it was hard to get anybody to really do it. And now he just couldn't deliver. And there were other problems. Cooper hung up the phone when someone called him about it, thinking it was a crank call. Ettinger wrote a nasty letter. Cooper was embarrassed, called off his conference, scheduled for October 67, but he still pursued his, his determination to get land and facilities. In the end, he managed to build a laboratory on some farmland that he got when someone loaned him money. And, uh, but there were a lot of problems with this. You can see that nice looking pond in front of that building, but it was very wet in that area and the basement flooded and he finally just had to give it up. And he had another hobby of his called sailing. On the right, there's his boat, the Pelican. So he neglected his newsletters and correspondence and around 1970, he just walked away from the whole thing. He went out and sailed his boat which probably was fun for a while, but finally, unfortunately, he was lost at sea in 1982. So the cryonics community had to go on without Cooper. We had cryonics societies of New York and California. They, were, they became separate organizations. Sad to say, even though they were going for a few years, they failed too. Now, here is a, a showing of uh, most of the early cryonics patients up to 1973. Uh, there's two others I couldn't show because I don't have pictures of them. I want you to look at the one that is the second one. That the, the one in the, in the top row, second from left, is James Bedford. James Bedford is still frozen today. He happens to be a patient at Alcor. Now look at all those others. There's 14 other people and there's two others I couldn't show. Not a one of those Preservations lasted very long, and some of those were cryonics pioneers, and uh, others were, were just uh, people that were put in by relatives and so forth. Very sad, but you know we're talking about 15 people that were lost. There's 16 people, and one was not lost. Basically, the early organizations failed, and. Uh, you're, a lot of uh, claims were made in some cases that people were acting uh, maliciously and all this, but I think it's safe to say that the main reason for failure was not malice or malfeasance. It was uh, uh, just uh, lack of funding and lack of commitment. This shows Robert Nelson, who was head of the Cryonic Society of California, standing beside a huge capsule that was supposed to give them a fantastic capability that they called the cryotorium. But it was impossible to get that capsule working properly. They didn't have a place to house it or anything, so they never used it, and he was one of those that failed. Cryonics organizations in the 70s managed to become much stronger and uh, had better financial uh, policies and so on. So since then, they have done much better and new organizations like American Cryonic Society, Trans Time, Alcor, 
Franks Institute came into existence with a new phys physical policy of having upfront payments and so on. I have run almost out of time here. So I'm going to talk a little about the Society for Venturism. It was an organization formed to promote cryonics, a, phil cry a philosophical, you could even call it religious organization, although some people were uncomfortable with that. The brainchild of David Pizer, whom you see in a duplicate form there, because he liked to talk about the philosophical issues like whether you could survive in a duplicate. Uh, and of course, pro cryonics, uh, we, had, we have IRS status as a scientific, religious, and educational organization. Religion broadly interpreted like the courts interpret it, not like some people interpret it. We try to do what is right, and we advocate and promote the worldwide conquest of death through technological means. We are committed to helping the cryopreserve be revived, if that's possible. And I don't want to talk too long about religion here. Not enough time. All right. We also issue uh, a religious object. object I am a religious objector to autopsy cards saying that. And again, religion broadly interpreted. We have had festivals and conventions and things like that. This is one that we had in 1994. VentureVille was a project to try to provide living quarters for people so they, you could have a cryonics community. We tried, but that one didn't work too well. We also carry out weddings. We have a ministerial program. Rudy mentioned that I was ordained as a minister, so as Dave Pizer here. You see him carrying on a wedding in 2007. And finally, we do fundraising for needy cryonics cases. That was James Swayze, who didn't have any money in one of the arrangements. Marcelon Johnson was somebody that we tried to raise funds for, but her relatives had her cremated without our knowledge of what was going to happen. It was a very sad thing because she was a cryonics pioneer. If I had more time, I could tell a lot of things about Morris Johnson. That gentleman is one of our cases. He got in trouble for dealing with drugs and lost his money and everything. And then he got cancer when he was in prison for selling marijuana and other crimes like that. And uh, anyway, we raised funds for him and he, he got to the Cryonics Institute. There is one of our famous cases, Kim Swozy, who got cancer when she was in her early 20s. She was a bright college student, and she had little money, and we managed to raise enough with the help of another organization that was called, I think back then, the Immortality Institute. And uh, they're called Longicity now. So we got her to Alcor. She was cryopreserved in January of 2013. There's another gentleman named Aaron Winborn at ALS, and we raised funds for him so he could be represented. He was at CI. And there's another one named Elizabeth Pugliese with a little dog named Benji. See that dog there? So we, we were able to raise funds for her. She was really a tough case, but she first of all was a brain chemically preserved and then got into liquid nitrogen. And the dog Benji happens to be a patient at Alcor too. And it looks like I've got about one minute left. We have, like I said, conventions and stuff. That is our convention for in Laughlin, Nevada, in 2013. You can see Dave Pizer in the center, first row center, and next to him is Don Laughlin, who provided the facility for us to have this convention. There's, yeah, that's right, Rudy. There are other societies like us that promote cryonics terrorism, Church of Perpetual Life, Society for Universal Immortalism. Problems are not easy, but we must persevere. And I'm really out of time, but I'm glad it didn't. I'm glad it didn't. Thank you. Outstanding. I, anybody else could listen? I, I would listen to that all day long. I. I'm truly sorry we have to cut that off, because that is, you know, history is important, and this guy understands history. Yes? Neil, we'll make the exception to take a, a, a from you.
Yes, well, at the end, of we a uh, group photo of everyone. Oh, my goodness. Why didn't I think of that? It's obvious. Uh, if you are interested in doing that, how uh, could you... Let's, let's work, work out, you work out the logistics on that. We are going to be doing a group photo of all presenters at the end. And then, so be, be advised of that. Yeah, uh, we will at the Q&A session, that is correct. Okay, we are moving forward, and that was fabulous, Mike. Thank you. Uh, and guess what we have up here? You are, we, are, uh, we have a real treat for you. Who, can, who knows Charlie Cam, but does everybody not know Charlie Cam? I will not even bother to introduce this guy because everyone knows Charlie Cam. I love you, Charlie. <laughs> I love me too. <laughs> he does love him too. <laughs> Thank you, Rudy. <laughs> Hello. Um, anyway, um, thank you. Um, yeah, I've been involved in the life extension community for a long, long time. I've been a cryonicist for probably uh, over 15 years. Um, I hosted a conference in 2007 in Chicago. It was a three-day conference where we talked about all sorts of futuristic technologies. Uh, I'm going to be hosting another conference next year uh, in Los Angeles called Transvision 2020. We already have Ray Kurzweil uh, as a committed speaker, as well as Aubrey de Grey and Martine Rothblatt and a lot of other cool people. Those, um, the dates and all that will be forthcoming. Um, over the years, as I've been doing this, I've created a lot of... Um, films and music videos and songs about cryonics as a way to spread the word. That's kind of why I host these things or attend these conferences and do all that stuff. And um, so today I'm going to be showing you um, this music video that I created which is about cryonics, surprisingly. And um, it's, it's really based on a, a, an, a film from 1958 which was, um, it was called, uh, the film was called um, uh, it's the Seventh Seal, and, and it's, about, it's a famous film by Ingmar Bergman, and the film is about this 12th century knight who uh, was fighting um, in, in overseas uh, in the Crusades, and he came back to his homeland of Sweden, and when he came back, he saw that most of the population had been wiped out by the bubonic plague. So he was walking along the beach contemplating his own mortality, and as he's walking along the beach, he sees in front of him he sees death in the form of the Grim Reaper, you know, with the hood and all. And he realizes he's coming for, for him. And he also, according to his understanding of legend, was that death had uh, enjoyed, like, uh, enjoyed playing chess. And so he thought, well, I'll, I'll challenge him to a game of chess, and then with the idea that if he can beat him, he gets more time on this planet. Well, spoiler alert, <laughs> that was the 12th century, and there wasn't much he can do. He didn't really, didn't turn out too well for him. So what I did was I took the, that, that concept, and I created this music video that you're about to see, where I updated uh, with, 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 uh, with 21st century kind of technology, which includes cryonics. Also, the fact is that uh, we have good chess programs now, so you can use that to, to beat death. So uh, I, I guess that's a pretty good intro for it. If you want to go ahead and show it... Uh, Let's, let's, let's watch it. I am my grandmother. Where did grandfather go? And she replied. He went to help and child. That's where we all will go when we get old. We all must die. <laughs> but things are different now. Science has changed it all. And getting old is a fallacy. There's a new lease on life So if tragedy strikes And things are at the worst they'll ever be We can try one thing more When death is right at the door We can preserve ourselves By honesty Don't know if it works for sure yet but it's a much smarter bed Giving yourself a plan B 
Thank you. I gotta say that was great, huh? Thank you. Oh, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. The, he actually has a, quite a few different videos that are just superb. So thank you very much for sharing that with us, Charlie. Christine Gaspar is coming up, and let me tell you briefly that Christine Gaspar, as she comes up for the mic, has a background in emergency medicine, trauma, nursing, and served with the Canadian Armed Forces. I can read, see? She lives near Toronto, and she is currently the president of the Quranic Society of Canada, advocating local Quranicists help build infrastructure in Canada. Uh, she has been currently offered a position at, should I say that or not? Yeah. All right. Currently been offered a position at Suspended Animation, a BRLS contractor as a technical writer. Christine Gaspar. You just covered my second slide, that's cool. Um, I'm the choir critic. I'm the person who tells everybody that they're doing everything wrong and I try to make things better and try to help. So I, um, anyways, uh, part of this talk today was about process improvement in terms of quality, but it, more importantly, it's to sort of say hello, say I'm hopefully, I'm working on my visa right now to come down to Florida, and it should be about a week or two, they're telling me. So if everything gets approved, I should be down here within the month, within the month, and um, man, manning the uh, Florida Satellite Office of SA. So I'd be working for BRLS as a contractor, um, but working in service of SA. So let me flip the... Oh. I mean, I just defined suspended animation here. I didn't know that um, Ryan was going to already do that. So you've already been introduced to what suspended animation is. Again, they have um, the Rancho Santa Margarita uh, office and then the satellite office here in Boynton Beach, which at present is not being um, staffed. But uh, Bill intends to have a full-time presence in Florida and then to be able to expand up the East Coast to have 
a more um, or a closer and larger presence so we have better readiness, essentially. Um, who am I? Rudy, thank you. <laughs> the other thing that uh, was missed in that, which I don't usually include, is that I've also been a private investigator. I was a licensed private investigator. So that kind of helps with some of the investigational work that I have done. I did a bit of work for Alcor, helping with write case reports and offering some feedback based on my nursing experience. Um, I really enjoy that Alcor talks about um, uh, being an extension of emergency medicine, and um, I'm, I'd like to be able to contribute to helping make that happen. These are my areas of interest, and one of the things I'm really pleased about in terms of this offer is by working as a contractor for BRLS, I'm going to have a bit of latitude in terms of being able to bring ideas in. I wouldn't necessarily be representing SA. I would be bringing my own thoughts into the process and hopefully improving responsiveness, improving um, uh, our ability to provide good standby stabilization and transport for patients. Um, and some, these are some of the points that I've talked about in, in different capacities, some with Elcor, some with their CSC in Canada. Uh, a lot of people have come to me with their concerns about their own personal readiness. Um, you know, it's very easy to sign up for cryonics, but what actually happens if in the 3 o'clock in the morning on a Friday um, you end up, you know, calling 911 because your father's having a heart attack? What actually is going to happen to facilitate a cryopreservation at that point? So these are questions I'm constantly asking myself because it's part of my background. Um, so my first sort of area of interest is being able to conduct um, member readiness evaluations. Now, I'm going to be clear, I'm not coming down as a nurse. I'm coming down in a non-nursing capacity, but I still will be able to do visits and do readiness visits with members if they want, um, have a look at their medical background, have a look at you know, what condition they seem to be in, does it match how well they think they're doing? You know, that's often something that I get in nursing where people would think, yeah, I'm perfectly healthy, I don't have any medical problems, and then they'd handed me a bag of pills and said, this is what I take. Well, you know, I don't have a problem, I take these pills so there's no longer a problem. So people don't really have a good idea of how sick they are sometimes. Also, they don't communicate well. They don't communicate well with their physicians, they don't communicate well with their families, which is a big problem. So when you ask them, well, what would happen if, you know, your spouse was made power of attorney for healthcare for you and you haven't fully prepared them for that possibility, what happens when you can no longer speak for yourself? Um, so by, by conducting these readiness evaluations, I'd like to be able to give feedback to these people and make the transition from them being well to them ending up at their cryonic service provider a little bit more seamless. Okay. Second uh, area of interest that I have is in these layperson first responder kits. This is something that I learned from Max and from Ashwin when we did a training in New York City. Um, by providing individuals with a body bag, which can act as an ice bath, okay, and it looks perfectly normal to emergency personnel, by providing them with some sodium citrate and an IO gun to administer it, you've, you've patched one of the gaps between the time that you call your cryonic service provider and they actually arrive. So you've actually managed to cool a person and, um, and thin their blood while you're waiting for the first responders of cryonics to show up. Um, and then that leads to the next area of interest, which is regional team building. And, um, that just really involves empowering people, training people, getting people to work together, um, uh, concentrating equipment in areas with larger groups of people, and ensuring that the equipment is in good condition and that um, people know who to call. They know how to coordinate each other and they know how to help each other. Done that in Toronto for a while. We have an Alcor kit there that I'm holding for Alcor, as well as a CI kit. So that's really great. Um, I don't know why some of these words, I, I'm sorry, I, my work processor does this sometimes. Um, another sort of area of major concern, and I'm going to focus on Broward County for this, is uh, consistent relationships with medical examiners and coroners. Um, one thing I learned about Americans is 
Um, you guys have both, and coroners are often elected officials who have no medical background at all. Um, and then medical examiners are physicians generally, but they have a lot of power. And if you actually go to the Center for Disease Control website, they have a PDF that is literally a chart that shows the medical um, conditions by which a person becomes um, a coroner's case and thus an autopsy. And um, I have a feeling that there are a lot of MEs out there or coroners that are abusing their powers because um, not every case needs to be autopsied. So I'd like to do a bit of a deep dive into researching that. Um, we also like to talk about perhaps using lobbyists like they do in Arizona to um, see if we can get more of the MEs in this area to more consistently and openly cooperate without worrying about whether or not they're going to enforce their rules and, and, and um, I, like they're, they're, I went to one in Broward County where I met them spoke with them and one of the things that they said which I found very concerning is that they don't distinguish between medical and legal autopsies so if a person dies and it isn't a suspicious death but they don't quite know what condition caused them to die they might still feel compelled to do an autopsy whether the person wants cryonics or not so yeah I'm always worried about all these things um, another area of interest I have obviously is to expand into Canada SA should come to Canada we have nothing um, in terms of uh, standby and stabilization, unless you're an Alcor member who would then send their own team up there. So if you're a CI member, you're really doing it yourself. Um, ICE exists at this point, but they're pretty new, so they're still quite untested in terms of whether they can consistently and long-term provide service. So it would be nice to have a service like SA that is subsidized and well-supported also extend into Canada. And I'm going to explain that a little bit in the next slide. Um, another thing we talked about last year when I came to Florida and met with Lori and Tara Sem was uh, self-governance. Um, it's probably infinitely more valuable to have within our own industry governance and monitoring and accreditation than have it imposed upon us by government because at that point I think we'll have very little control of the outcome. A um, couple more points. It, creating a registry of uh, cryonics advocates who can act as power of attorney for health care. I'll explain that a little bit better in a slide. But um, family members aren't always suitable. And when you have your spouse who is cryo-neutral or cryo-iffy um, being your power of attorney for health care, what exactly happens when they A, are panicking and they're losing you and they don't know what to do, or B, really were opposed all along and then actually interfere actively in your cryo preservation. <clears throat> and then the last point is something that I've talked about or more recently actually and it's rethinking DNR status. DNR means do not resuscitate and a lot of people will become palliative, they'll, they'll have cancer for example and they'll be dying at home and it's ideal if you want to be cryopreserved to have all that control by dying predictably at home or in a hospice but if you make yourself a DNR and that nurse that's taking care of you is in a hospice and has five other patients, okay? maybe not a hospice, but a hospital, um, as long as you're quiet and medicated, they're going to ignore you. And if they ignore you, because they're too busy dealing with people that might die on them, um, I've seen a lot of cases where people will die and not be found till morning. And so they end up already in rigor mortis when they're cryopreserved, and that's not good. Um, so my belief, very strongly, is that no cryonicist should be a DNR until the cryonic service provider is on site and ready to go. And then they can be legally switched by their power of attorney to a DNR status so that medical interventionists will not intervene and allow the person to die in a more predictable fashion. Um, yeah. So these are areas of interest. They're obviously a little bit fluid. They're obviously going to be done by me, um, not specifically represented by SA, but just things I'd like to bring to the organization or to the, to the community. Um, <clears throat> These were just, now I've taken each of those points and just added a few details. I've talked about quite a few of them already with the readiness evaluations. The home setup, the family collaboration, the welfare check even. A lot of people will sign up for cryonics and they'll say, don't call us, we'll call you when we need you. 
and they think that it's a turnkey operation, and it really isn't. So hopefully I can promote that. Hopefully people will be interested in having these. I, I certainly won't be cold calling them, but you know, I'd like to put the word out there that I'd like to do these for people so that they can be better prepared. Um, and then even just having that conversation with the primary provider and asking them, if we pay you $1,000, will you come at 3 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday and pronounce your patient so that they're not taken to the morgue, so that they can be then released to the funeral home? So these are just some ideas. Um, and then that layperson first responder gets to talk about it. And it's very simple. It's the sodium citrate, which does not require prescription in most cases. Um, and again, this would not be officially handled by a Crinox organization. This is more something that is arranged privately. But um, it not needing a prescription is a little bit easier to acquire and to, um, and to teach how to administer. It's also more stable at colder temperatures than heparin is. The IO bone gun injector can be taught to anyone who's not too squeamish. Um, it's very simple. The heavy duty body bag has handles cut into it. So I was going to demonstrate actually a very quick way to put someone in one of those that then can turn into an ice bath. You can have two people lift it with the handles and place the person on the floor. So it's very quick. Um, of course, teaching people how not to contaminate themselves by using personal protective equipment, that would be really important. And um, I think by, by having this as something you could offer people, it'll increase compliance. It'll take away some of that sort of fear that family members may have about going to these training sessions that are overly complicated. And uh, it may make it a little bit more accessible to more people. I'm not going to really belabor this. It's the same idea, team building. Um. <clears throat> I'm trying to reduce or eliminate the likelihood of an autopsy, essentially. Um, when I worked in the ER, you know, any patient that came in that was dead, one of my jobs on the checklist was to call the coroner. And it would, whether I worked in California or in Canada, it was the same thing. And you'd tell the, the coroner's office, okay, this is the description of the person and what we think happened. And that was the act of it being a coroner's case was making that call and therefore giving the discretion to the coroner's office as to whether or not they would require an autopsy. It doesn't necessarily mean each case will be autopsied and in fact most of them weren't. But it's still a little bit scary to put it in their hands. Um, also please, and I've talked about this in articles before, please don't commit suicide uh, unless you're in a place where it's legally allowed. Uh, quite simply, you will be a coroner's case and you will be autopsied. Um, the expansion into Canada. Canada has a few quirks that America doesn't have. Um, we are the second largest landmass in the world with 10% of the number of people that you have here. Also, 90% of our country is uninhabitable. It's, so it's hard to get to people. And it, it, it would be nice to be able to develop um, more effective or more frequently used uh, field neurovitrification because of transport times. We're a tolerant liberal society. We have medical assistance and dying laws throughout the whole country. So that is procryonics, actually. Um, we had this anti-cryonics anti law in British Columbia that was challenged in the Supreme Court. The matter was dismissed, actually, by the courts as a non-issue. They were issued a comfort letter by the Crown to basically state, you know, it's not illegal, relax, people, it's fine. It, it doesn't increase compliance with coroners, or not coroners, sorry, with uh, funeral directors out there, but at least uh, it's an official position that the government has taken. We don't have HIPAA laws there. We have PHIPA, PIPA laws, and they're actually harder to deal with than HIPAA laws. So there, if you call a hospital and ask if your father, Joe, is there, they won't even acknowledge that the person is there at all. Um, that's actually a bit of a problem. This is also why um, doc proper documentation, proper consent are so important. You know, to be able to get your charts and your medical information to your cryonics team um, is crucial. Self-governance is actually a huge issue, and I don't have enough time to talk about it, but it's something that I think is going to help protect against predatory companies that come into this, into this industry. Um, 
protect against negligence, protect against unquestioned repeated practice errors. And I think that it should be represented by every cryonics organization. It shouldn't be one picking on another. There should be a governing body that basically offers accreditation and then it becomes a plus to the consumer to help them decide where they want to go and how they want uh, to have their remains uh, handled. Uh, this is actually a list, essentially, then, of um, people that can be trusted to help with um, end-of-life decision-making for people if the family can't really be relied upon to do it for them. Um, and this is something that I think would be a neat idea to have to develop, even if the chronic service providers did it, not necessarily me. And then again, this was a simple statement, don't be a DNR. Um, that's it. And of course, I look forward to any feedback from anyone about any concerns or problems that they have. Okay, a quick question. It's been suggested that we do picture, a group picture. Let me just ask, as I said, this is show of hands. Anybody, if we're interested in this, we're going to do it on the break, kids. Uh, because there's no breaks in the trainings, there's no breaks in life. Uh, there is a break coming up, which we're in now. So, but if you wish to be in a picture, please raise your hand. Well, it looks like most of you. Good, good. Where you're a hero, you're heroes, and you're going to be part of history. I think the best logistics. I've been looking for Neil to see if he can figure out what to do here. Um, Neil, if you're in the house, come out and figure this out. Uh, I think the best thing to do is to have us on this riser set up here. Does that then work with you guys? So. That if, if I could ask you to come, if you wish to be in the picture, please come forward and arrange yourself on these risers. We'll maybe have additional chairs for people to stand on the back. Let's see if we can't pull this off in five minutes. You guys are such a good looking group. I go, I gotta get in here someplace. All right, stand by. I get the mic, haha. <laughs> Oh, we got, we got a few more. Hey, if you wish to be in the event photo, if you're downstairs, hustle your butt up here quickly. It's going to take place in the next uh, 60 seconds or so. Wow. Hey, my sister's impressed. That's a good start. Oh, Don Hoffman is scooting up. Roseanne, you want to come? All right, we got it. Hey, here we are. Hey, freeze. <laughs> Josh, you want to come? So, may I ask how we're going to be able to access these? Bravo, okay. Don't worry, don't worry about it. Okay, we're officially on break for seven minutes. Please hurry. Ben Best has attend, attended every single event in the, since the history of time.
And uh, the, uh, for that reason, aldehyde stabilized crowd preservation won the prizes from the uh, Rain Preservation uh, Foundation, the best rain preservation, which is under electron microscope looks identical to normal rain tissue. And uh, so what they do is they uh, fix the tissues with aldehyde before vitrification and cryopreservation preservation with the nitrogen. And uh, uh, it, uh, it forms cross links in the tissue, the aldehyde, and, and Dr. Sparks does not believe, uh, who else has this, does not believe nanotechnology could repair. And uh, he, he, he envisions scanning the tissues uh, uh, with computer uh, reading and recognition uh, used for molecular reconstruction or mine uploading to a computer. And they only use, uh, they, they don't use any other craft preservation method other than ASC. And uh, so I mentioned Jordan, Jordan Sparks, he's the uh, owner and operator, of, and uh, he's a, uh, he has a history in dentistry and developed this dentist, uh, dental software. Uh, and, and he started this company, Open Dental Software, which has 2,200 employees, and it's made Jordan Sparks very wealthy to uh, pursue the passion, mainly organ cryonics. And uh, so he's working on Open Dental, he's opening a new 8,000 foot uh, square foot, two floors, uh, which is 16,000 foot uh, all together, and uh, uh, <clears throat> being built along with the new buildings for Open Dental all the way through. So I visited there in uh, 2017. Now, Matthew Sullivan, who I had stand up and was in the audience, he's, he is an Oregon Fires employee. He spent many years as an employee at Alcohol and many years as an employee at Suspend Animation Incorporated before joining Oregon Biotics. And he's currently working three days per week uh, uh, at advanced neural model senses until the new uh, Oregon Fires building is completed. Dr. Uh, uh, Sparks returns his attention to uh, Oregon cryonics. I mean, National uh, Biosciences is a cryonics research company anyway. So that's what the Oregon cryonics looks like today, uh, or right about now. Uh, the building is still under construction, and they're sort of putting the, the most of their activities on hold while uh, this uh, is getting built. And Scott and Jordan Sparks, he's the guy who's running this whole thing uh, with his, his own, uh, out of his own pocket. Right. because he's uh, passionate about cryonics and uh, he loves buying a lot of uh, the best technical equipment he can get his hands on so it's uh Oregon cryonics is an extremely well funded organization and uh, and, uh, and also extremely a, a technically savvy organization because uh, that's the kind of guy uh, Jordan Sparks is and there's Matthew Sullivan in, in his office 2017 when I visited there Another picture of the facility, another picture of the facility in 2017, when I watched the picture, and that's a brain <laughs> preserved in aldehyde. And uh, the, the aldehyde preserved brains are kept in a refrigerator, and um, uh, uh, they um, have, a, have, a, have, a, have had a CT scanner long before Apple got their CT scanner. So the way ahead of the curve of technology as far as that's concerned, at least in that instance. And they obtained nearly 60 uh, human cadavers. So they had to removed and tested for African cannulation evaluated for good perfusion using the CT scanner. So they've been doing a lot of hands-on research. And each research brain is uh, saved in a plastic container. There's their CT scanner. And, uh, the pointer is what's the matter of the pointer. There's the containers that have the brains that they've uh, done all these experiments on. Uh, and these are not cryonics patients, these are uh, people who donate their bodies to medical research or science. Uh, now, uh, there's also a organ as a, a death with dignity act, and it allows patients to self medicate to clinical death. There's actually it's, uh, <coughs> Self uh, euthanasia is actually legal in nine U.S. states, but the conditions and definitions vary quite a bit. In Oregon, uh, uh, the physician does not would not give uh, a lethal injection, even if the patient gave permission. The physician would just give a prescription for some uh, barbiturates, saying that they can commit use to commit suicide. And you have to also proof of residence in Oregon before you can get a physician to do this. You can't just drop in and say, you need, oh, I want to do this right now. And uh, you also need to be declared terminal. 
maintenance here. You only have six months expected life. And the previous building and market in Phoenix, they had a patient room where Phoenix patients could self-euthanize in the last few hours before craft preservation. And the new building will also have a patient room. And uh, but uh, the patient should be at a nearby hospital before going to the patient room. So there's the patient room that they had in 2017. The, the next facility will have something similar. Uh, so what is the future? Uh, and this is an organization primarily funded by one guy, Dr. Jordan Sparks, and uh, managed by one guy, and uh, it just it's all dependent on him. So uh, Jordan Sparks wants all this technology for himself, so I'm not sure what's going to happen after, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, before Jordan Sparks animates and needs this, uh, there'll be directors and, and other people managing the institute. Um, uh, I, I would, even, even with all the great, great technology, and even the and, uh, Matthew Sullivan, for example, uh, uh, believes that uh, he would prefer that even Alcorn uh, did uh, uh, outline stabilized fire preservation, but uh, uh, he wants to be stored at Alcorn because, uh, I don't know, I, I wouldn't want to be stored at, uh, at Oregon Pioneers with this uncertain future. Um, anyway, so that, that's uh, that all I'm going to say about Oregon Pioneers. I wanted to uh, say something, go to a different topic here while I've got a bit of time. And uh, it used to be that, uh, as far as major funding concerned, the Life Extension Foundation was the only source of major funding for crime research. But uh, last year, uh, a wealthy cryptocurrency uh, entrepreneur gave five million dollars to Alcor uh, for specifically for research. Uh, Aris Gorons Gordon uh, uh, is a wealthy video game entrepreneur, High Res Studios. He wanted to start a crime organization in Georgia. Matt Matthias Hirsch. A, a wealthy German travel agency business. Man, he's uh, building a new crimes facility in Switzerland. And uh, uh, J.W. Maddox, uh, Biostasis uh, uh, <clears throat> Sciences Foundation, is a wealthy Dutch real estate businessman establishing uh, establishing chronic standby ambulance in Holland. So, uh, in the, the last teens and 20s, young crimes this meeting, uh, Bill Bloom was suggesting video games would be a great way to market cryonics because so many of the people attending uh, were keen on video games. So I contacted uh, uh, Wittig uh, Wadomski, who was a, a teens and twenties graduate and a successful video game entrepreneur. And he was inspired by the video game Surgeon Simulator, uh, which went viral. He wanted to create a cryonics version of Surgeon Simulator. Uh, and he proposed a video game that vividly portrays every state of the crimes protocol, standby, stabilization, transport, perfusion, placement of information, a move for education and marketing. For marketing, uh, if this went viral, and it's, there's all sorts of interesting challenges and things and so forth, that uh, 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 video game people tend to be very uh, tech, uh, tech friendly. And so they might, uh, uh, the uh, parents might appeal to them if they get involved in this. Uh, I, I, Lydic tells me that uh, 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 for good, a good video game needs to have challenges and rewards. And, and, uh, and the each state of the Chronics Protocol has a lot of things that can go right, a lot of things that can go wrong. And, and so you do, you, get, you do the things right, you get the reward, you do the things wrong, and, and there's all sorts of problems that can arise. You know, when you go through all the case reports and come up with all the different problems and situations that can arise, you can write very interesting stories uh, about uh, Chronics cases and put them in these video games. And uh, so, um, and also, uh, aside from that, you make the, you make the video game very vivid, uh, portraying the standby, because a lot of people go through these uh, standby trainings and so forth, and they, they forget everything. But if they've got this video game, they can look at the process, interact with it, and teach themselves and remind themselves what they learned on their, tri their standby training. So we're hopeful that uh, uh, Blue Phoenix, as I say, is a, this uh, wealthy uh, video game entrepreneur. Uh, uh, we're hoping that he will uh, see, appreciate the value. So Wittick is going to submit his proposal for this Cryonics video game. And uh, a little bit more about Blue, Blue Phoenix. The guy this, uh, was originally wanting to start a cryonics organization in Georgia. But I guess the Georgia Cryonics version of Oregon Cryonics. And uh, right now he's supporting a project to build a tractor trailer outfitted for whole body vitrification perfusion. And uh, so if anybody in the audience here has a lot of uh, uh, craftsmanship uh, expertise, you want to outfit a van for whole body uh, 
vitrification uh, and you're willing to move to New York City, uh, uh, I'm putting it out there, here's the job offer for you. And, uh, uh, and uh, we just, uh, a lot of these research projects uh, uh, that Blue Phoenix is, uh, wants to fund, uh, we just can't find uh, people to do the work. Uh, so and this is one uh, very concrete example. The Hirsch Foundation uh, is another well, wealthy source. They've actually funded research projects including for Adam Higgins, who's the president-elect of the Society of uh, Cryobiology. He also worked for the Cryonics Institute doing research. And he's, so he's aware of the cryonics connection. And they, uh, <coughs> they fund other research projects. They were the sponsor of the 2019 Society for Cryobiology meeting, which was held last week. And uh, they're funding a construction of a new cryonic storage and perfusion facility in Switzerland, uh, the, mainly the money from the Hirsch Foundation, the European Biostasis. Foundations. Um, yeah, okay, so that's their vision. Uh, strong research focus. They want to do, re, you know, do research at the facility. And uh, of course, they uh, want to do, emphasize uh, Europe, uh, having a chronics facility in Europe. And in Switzerland, as you may know, is, a, is another a physician assisted suicide uh, country. But uh, unlike uh, Netherlands, where you have to be uh, proved, you have to prove yourself to be a Dutch citizen, uh, you can actually be a a uh, euthanasia uh, tourist in uh, Switzerland, if you want to go to Switzerland and get your euthanasia. Um, and uh, so there's the core activities as of building uh, uh, the uh, new cryonics facility in Switzerland and uh, a lot of focus on research. Uh, they're talking about, you know, um, it, 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 this, uh, they've got a lot of money anyway and they want to do a lot of research and uh, that's good. And uh, there's the team and the guy on the on the right there is, uh, is Matthias Hirsch, who's, um, who's got the money behind it. And the guy right next to him, Dr. Uh, uh, Condit Con Zioria, he's a, 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 a me medical doctor and uh, emergency, emergency cancer research uh, and so forth. And, uh, and uh, <clears throat> if you look down the line, a lot of other cryonics activists. Uh, this uh, guy on the far left uh, held the Switzerland cryonics conference that was held a year, a year ago. And, and Torsten is uh, head of the uh, uh, Kranich's German response team. So um, I think that's it. Bravo, thank you, Ben. Thank you. That is superb. Good things happening all over the planet. Dennis Kowalski as a firefighter, nationally registered EMT, paramedic for the city of Milwaukee, also certified in advanced cardiac life support advanced pediatric life support, CPR instructor for the American Heart Association, firefighter and paramedic, and Dennis has lots of experience. I will guess that it seems to be a theme, lots of experience dealing with life and death. This is important stuff, folks, life and death. His training and skills have given him numerous opportunities to be part of saving lives. And more to the point, Dennis is the president of the Cryonics Institute. We are thrilled to have Mr. Dennis Kowalski. Thank you, Rudy. Thanks for putting this together. This is fantastic. If you could cue up the video. So it's a short video. It's about the, the basic process of cryonics. And I'm kind of going to be repeating a lot of what other people said. But this is from a Cryonics Institute perspective. Uh, excuse that it's a little bit uh, promotional, but at the same time, it kind of drives home some of the basic points of cryonics. The fascinating science of cryonics could give people a second chance at life. The whole idea of cryonics started with physics professor Robert Edinger. He pioneered the movement with his seminal book, The Prospect for Immortality. He then went on to launch the Cryonics Institute. But just what is cryonics? And what does the Cryonics Institute do? Cryonics is a procedure that preserves the human body at low temperatures after death in the hope it can be revived in the future. The process should begin immediately after a person is declared legally dead. Even though the heart has stopped beating, there's still brain function during this period. So a heart-lung resuscitator is used to stabilize the body and keep the brain supplied with blood and oxygen. The body is cooled in an ice bath to slow down metabolic demand and to protect both DNA and organ structure. Then anticoagulants and protective medications are injected into the body 
to stop the blood clotting during transit. The body is then packed in ice and transported to a cryonics facility. Once there, a process called vitrification begins, where the blood is replaced with a cryoprotectant antifreeze solution. This is done to prevent the cells from freezing and to stop ice crystals from forming around organs at extremely low temperatures. The body is then placed in a computerized vapor cooling chamber and cooled to negative 196 degrees Celsius. Once the body is properly cooled, the patient is transferred to a long-term cryostat storage container. Thousands of people are signed up for cryonics throughout the world and the numbers are steadily growing. The Cryonics Institute is the world's largest provider of whole body cryonics. They have performed more whole body human and pet cryo suspensions than any other organization. The Cryonics Institute is also the most affordable cryonics company with a whole body suspension fee of only $28,000. Most people can afford this cost with simple life insurance. Our organization is a member owned nonprofit with open financial records. Suspension money collected is carefully invested in secure endowment like securities. The investment dividends earned from these investments fund perpetual storage and cryonics upkeep. This is how CI has operated since 1976. Some people prematurely dismiss cryonics because the technology to revive someone who has been cryogenically frozen does not exist yet. But they miss the point. Cryonics is really an ambulance ride now to a future hospital where that technology may someday exist. What does science say? There are now peer-reviewed scientific papers supporting cryonics, as well as many PhDs who have gone on record to support cryonics. Recent advances in stem cells, nanotechnology, and genetic engineering are proving that what was once considered impossible is becoming routine. Some have suggested that someday even aging itself may be halted or reversed. People once considered dead only 50 years ago today are revived with CPR and cardiac defibrillation. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation and organ transplant technology were once shunned by primitive thinkers, but today they are hailed as life-saving advances. If history has taught us anything, no one knows the future, and it is foolish to say what future technology will be impossible. Considering the alternative, which is certain death, Cryonics is a rational scientific wager with little to lose and virtually everything to gain. Check out cryonics.org to learn more. So that, so that brings it down, boils it down real simply for everyone. I like to keep things um, simple and to the point. Uh, one thing I'd like to talk about for people, I, I don't want to come off as too pessimistic, uh, I first listed this as the 10 worst mistakes in cryonics, but these mistakes are also, they have solutions that we could, uh, we could look into, and I'm going to talk about those solutions. But it's not based on anything that I know personally. This is based on what we've seen in the case reports from all the cryonics organizations. A lot of times the solutions aren't necessarily very technical. The solutions to the problems are... Um, just basic planning, basic logic 101. And I'm gonna go over these things one by one. And I know that a lot of people have talked about these already, the speakers that came before me, but I think it's important that we add a little a level of redundancy because it's so important. These mistakes just keep happening over and over. And we don't wanna have, keep creating the same mistakes over and over without trying to improve. So number one, this is a big one for a lot of people, not signing up ahead of time. How many people are signed up in this room for cryonics? Okay, you go put your hands down. How many people are interested in cryonics? Okay, and not signed up. Okay, those are, okay, so that's the one I'm, I'm, I'm looking to really affect you guys with that right there. Becoming a member, having contracts in place, uh, and having the paperwork in order should not be a last minute decision. Of, a very large percentage of people who sign up for cryonics are last minute, or we call them post-mortem, waiting until the last minute after death results almost always in unnecessary delay of, of care, or worse, you don't get suspended at all. A lot of people, they, had, they plan their whole life to get suspended, but they just don't think they're gonna die tomorrow. Nobody thinks they're gonna get hit by a bus tomorrow, and especially if you're young. So 
Um, a lot of people, you know, uh, over half the people in the United States don't have their wills made out. Uh, I've heard this staggering statistic where um, people who are divorced, uh, large, 30, 40 percent of them have not even changed their life insurance from the first spouse to the second spouse. So, so think about that. You might not even, you know. Yeah, exactly. So, it, you know, because people, they just don't want to think it's going to happen. But the, the truth is, the reality is, if you're thinking about chronics, don't procrastinate. Don't be a cryocrastinator, I think, as Karen once said. Um, so sign up, be prepared. Uh, you can go to your chronics organizations, and we have a section on our website that says membership. You know, open it up and start reading. Um, we have huge resource lists on the website, too. I've been putting these together over the years. We talk about a lot of this stuff. We talk about standby, what you can do. Um, this 10 worst mistakes is on the website. It's in every issue of our magazine. It's that important. We want to just keep pounding that home. That, you know, the 10 most, um, the things you can do, the to-do list. So number two is uh, providing proof of funding. So a lot of people, yeah, we'll sign up. They'll become members. But they'll let that life insurance lapse. They won't get around to it until they're older in life. And, you know, you can't get a policy sometimes when you're too old. So some people believe they can worry about funding later. Or maybe they'll set up uh, term life and they'll say, okay, I'm going to invest a difference. But they don't invest a difference. Or that, that money you know, burns a hole in their pocket and they spend it. So if, if you're that type of person, I would recommend whole life. Um, but if you're the type of person that's good at investing and is very disciplined, then maybe term invested differences for you. Uh, people to talk to about that would be Rudy or Joe or other insurance agents. Um, so you should uh, check your proof of funding and you should check it every year. You should also notify us every year. One of the things we suggest people to do is to make your uh, give ownership of your policy to the Cranix organization, the Cranix Institute, and yourself, both of us. So that way, we're privy to that personal document, and we're always notified. Whether it, let's say you miss a payment or something, we'll find out, and we can get on the phone and call you. Hey, what's going on? So uh, it can take weeks to get funding in place. So you want to do that all ahead of time. You want to be prepared. Um, Individual funding, trusts, you can, a lot of uh, wealthier member, members set up their own individual trusts. Uh, I know they talked about uh, different organizations having uh, different trusts set up. You don't have to do that. You can do, there's more than one way to skin a cat. So you can set up through a separate organization um, like, um, like um, ACS, or you could set up your own uh, funding through your uh, lawyer. You could set up a trust fund. It depends on the area that you're in. It depends on the state. There's different laws and different regulations, so I just suggest talking to your attorney. Um, not telling anyone what your plans are. This is huge. So um, there was a case report of a member who overfunded by hundreds of thousands of dollars. They set up air transport. They, they contracted with suspended animation, but they were a little embarrassed about cryonics. So they didn't wear the bracelet. They didn't wear the necklace and any of that stuff. They were reclusive about it. And they ended up uh, in the morgue for three or four days before we got a hold of them. So again, uh, being reclusive is not a great idea. Um, you should always notify your family and friends I know it's difficult sometimes, you, you know, you don't want to be the oddball out, but it's, important. it's such an important thing to do. You have to let people know because sometimes you can't speak for yourself. You should not be afraid to tell those around you your wishes, especially your next of kin. Uh, wearing that bracelet, necklace, identification, and other uh, items that can speak for you when you can't speak for yourself. So for instance, I have, I've got a bracelet here, I've got another bracelet. I believe in redundancy, you know, so maybe if I lose one arm in a car accident, maybe the other arm. I've got a, a necklace here. I, I took it, put it in my pocket because I don't want to take it off with my tie right now. But uh, I've got a wallet ID card. I've got a um, sticker that I put on the back of my driver's license, very much like organ donation card. I've even got an app in my phone, if I can bring it up, I don't know. Um, and that app works, 
when you're in a crowd of people, when you're around a lot of people, the app's not really useful. But this particular app, the way it works is it'll, it's like an alarm system, and it'll alarm you when you're alone, when you're you know, maybe going on a hike in the woods, and it'll alarm you every two, three, four hours. And if you, you're actively awake, you hear it, you're conscious, you can hit the shut off button. But if it's a false alarm, you can cancel that too. But if you're not conscious or something's bad, something goes wrong, um, what'll happen is eventually what it'll do is it'll send a text message to whoever you decide to put in that text message, your family, your friends, suspended animation, uh, Cranix Institute, Elcor, whoever. And then it, uh, you can have that, maybe the neighbor will come check on you or your, you know, your, your significant loved one will come check on you. And that'll give your GPS location as well so they can find you. So not perfect, you know, because there's maybe a couple hours gap, but you know what, an hour or two hours is better than two or three days, you know, so. Uh, not planning, just not planning in general. I think um, it was mentioned before that Cranix is not a turnkey operation. We can just sign up and let fate take over. There's always going to be some degree of do it yourself. Um, do it yourself, it's, it's, it's not as bad as it seems, okay? Because I'll give you an example. If, if you got the best doctors in the world, the best equipment in the world, but they're seven, eight hours away from you, and you fall over and you, and you go into cardiac arrest, you're gonna, need, you're gonna need CPR right away. So if your neighbor, for instance, comes over and does CPR. Maybe he didn't even, he's not even certified, but he saw it on television. There's a saying in, in the medicine that uh, no CPR is, or is, is worse than bad CPR. So you want some level of CPR. And I think the same type of basic logic can be applied to Cranix. You want some form of standby. Even if, you know, and hopefully under, if you've got the resources, you sign up with advanced organizations like suspended animation or uh, ICE, once they get fully operational, you always want to have some level of local standby. So one of our thoughts is, is, you know, there's funeral directors everywhere, all over the world. There's a network logistically set up. So if you could work with the funeral directors, that you're going to have to work with legally anyhow, you're going to have to have the documentation across state lines and, and so forth, why not utilize those resources and get them on board to do some basic stuff like basic CPR that a layperson might do. In this case, transport, getting to you quickly, getting you on ice quickly, and maybe doing a little CPR with some basic medications. Because they don't need a medical license to inject medications into a, a legally dead person. So at, at least uh, sodium citrate would be an example of a non-controlled medication. It's not even a medication. So planning, no matter how much you pay for Cranex, you are the only one that can make sure that you're gonna have the best chances. Um, we can provide a ton of information on our website to just get you there, but you still gotta do a little bit yourself. You still gotta turn the key yourself. Uh, those who, I like to say, those who uh, fail to plan, uh, plan to fail. So, so let's see. Um, I talked about that. Uh, an example of my own situation, um, I live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, so I've met up with my funeral director many times. Uh, I've, it's it's kind of like I've established a relationship. I'll go in and I'll meet up with them and bring them some donuts and bring them a card with a little bit of money because I feel that his time is valuable. You know, it, I, I think it's important to pay him for his time. And over the years, it's, it's not like I'm that kooky Kranix guy. I'm that guy who brings donuts and, and brings him a few bucks. So he listens to me. And, and you know, I've parlayed that into, into a little bit more, too, because he, you know, he's, he was interested enough in what I had to say and what, what I was doing. He was asking me, what else can I do? What else can I do? And in fact, he invited me to speak before a funeral director's convention. And there I spoke... Uh, to another 20 funeral directors, and I, and, I was, and I wasn't trying to convince them about Cryonics itself. I wasn't trying to convince them Cryonics is the way to go, and here's why, and, and so forth. I, I was trying to reach them at their own level, 
and trying to focus on what's important to them. So is what we're doing legal? Is it ethical? And am I going to be fairly compensated for it? Uh, you know, so and I use buzzwords like professionalism, advocacy, you know, uh, honoring my family's wishes. And suddenly I, I turn this network of funeral directors, at least in my area, into, you know, layperson medical providers. But again, that level of getting you on ice, getting you moving quick, CPR quick, will make a lot of difference. You know, it, it might, that couple hours start, you know, could help you out so that when suspended animation arrives on scene, it can take over from that level and get you over to CI. So it, it's huge, it's huge. Uh, planning ahead of time is incredibly important. Again, check our website, tons of resources. I actually wrote manuals and tried to go through all of these things. What, what can go wrong? And it's just not my knowledge, it's the knowledge of all the people here that I've listened to over the years and compiled all that information. And then also looking at all the case reports and looking at everything that's gone wrong and what are the solutions or what are the potential solutions to those things. Not notifying CI of emergencies. Early notification. If you're not notified, it doesn't matter you know, how, how, there's no way for a chronic provider to help you if they don't know that there's even an emergency going on. So we're encouraging members to call us if they're going in for a serious operation, if they're starting to decline, letting their family know, uh, family and friends, standby group, next of kin. We, we tell you to immediately contact CI. I mean, first call 911, right? But then call CI and just put us on notice. Um, if, if at all, it's important to know if you have up and coming surgeries, procedures, terminal illness, of course, uh, patients uh, di with diagnosed terminal illness could enter into hospice care. It's a whole different um, type of designation for people who are sick. A lot of hospices, if you get to them ahead of time and you start talking to them about what type of uh, resources you're going to need, a lot of them are very compassionate. You talk about patient advocacy, most of them will help out. It's just on. It's all about how you approach them. Uh, any delay in notifying us can directly result, can, can result in a poor suspension. It's just the bottom line. Uh, and all the technology in the world is not going to save you if we don't know. Um, those helping you must have simple and clear instructions. So again, go to our website. Uh, we have a resources category. It's, it's, some of it's going to be... Once you, get, once you get to the 10 worst mistakes on, on the resources section, you can go to these other hyperlinks and they'll take you to every one of these things. Uh, committing suicide, someone mentioned that. Anyone who commits suicide who is not terminally ill or breaks a local law in doing so is potentially putting themselves at great risk. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna speaking for CI, we will not risk ourselves um, for people who engage in that behavior it goes against our mission of extending life. Uh, su such activities most often will lead to autopsy. Uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, it matters that you have the religious objection to autopsy, but if there is a crime committed, the medical examiner is going to do what they deem necessary to do. So they're gonna give, you're going to get an autopsy, and that involves a lot of times destruction of the brain, where the brain gets cut up. And so we can... We can do things like minimize the invasiveness of the autopsy in some situations, but again, it all, it's all up to the wishes of that particular medical examiner in that particular location and that particular situation because they're all situations differ. Um, so we, we say to people, don't consider Cranix as a way out to the future. Uh, you're, you're likely not to, going to get suspended under those circumstances. So the caveat is if you do not have a terminal illness, considering suicide, um, maybe seek some uh, mental health advice, and we put links to that. Uh, it's, just, it's just a bad thing to do. Um, engaging in risky or illegal activities, I mean, that's kind of common sense 101. Uh, drugs, crime, um, hanging around with uh, bad apples, you know, I mean, those are things that are going to get you potentially killed and then therefore autopsy because a crime was committed. So um, any suspicious circumstance or will lead to uh, mandated autopsies, and that's going to stand in the way of your chronic's wishes. 
It's best to use common sense and not put yourself in harm's way. Um, not only will that common sense wisdom probably extend your life, but it'll make sure that your suspension wishes are more likely to be carried out. Um, so use common sense, stay safe. Three more things, providing financial or legal incentives so that you will not be suspended, okay? So leaving all of your insurance or credit money to your family if you are not suspended is certainly an option, but ironically, it does provide an incentive for hostile family members to block your suspension. So anytime there was any legal action or threats of legal action, it's almost always because family is trying to get a hold of that money. So as often the case, people will make sure that you are not suspended to get a hold of that money. Uh, one suggestion is to leave family and next of kin some separate money from the Cranix funding while suggesting that the Cranix funding go to uh, the Cranix organization as a donation, even if you're not suspended. Um, in addition, family or next of kin can be further uh, compelled to cooperate if they will lose money um, if they're made fully aware of their wishes and stipulations so that, so for instance, my family, I'm leaving a substantial amount of money to them and then a, an, a smaller portion to the Cranix Institute, but if they stand in the way of my suspension, I love my family dearly, but I've provided a negative financial incentive. They get $1, so they can't say that I forgot them in a court of law, and they know this, but if they do, uh, honor my Cranix wishes, they're going to get more money than the Cranix Institute anyhow. So, you know, that's, that's an important thing to put the carrots and sticks in the right place. Uh, n again, nine, uh, not removing uh, hostile next of kin from rights to your remains and finances. I'll, I'll speed up here. Um, not removing hostile next of kin from your rights uh, remains and finances. So if you actually, ha we have people... Um, members uh, sign a next of kin agreement, but if you've got next of kin that won't sign that or they're actually hostile, they're in some states you can actually sign that right away from them. You can actually pick someone else and you can get that all done ahead of time. Other people have suggested videotaping your wishes. There's a lot of things you can do um, ahead of time to block that and it's all on our website. And last, dying under less than favorable conditions uh, seems harder to control than any other situation, but you know, there's some things you can do. Diet, exercise, um, following the latest uh, medical advice allows you to stay alive longer, you'll stay alive longer. There's gonna, you know, chances that you'll be a better technology in the future. Um, so, uh, avoiding travel to remote or hostile places, always risky, uh, where there's no possibility of standby or very limited standby. Uh, it's, it's just basic common sense 101. So uh, if you're interested in the 10 worst mistakes, not to be pessimistic, but the, I should say the 10 solutions to the biggest mistakes, please check out our website. And I, I hope you will enjoy the rest of the resources there. All those resources are there for you. I, and uh, thank you. Dennis. Okay. <laughs> Rudy Hoffman is a certified financial planner, chartered life underwriter and chartered financial consultant with 40 years of experience. As an independent consultant, he serves the needs of the clients first, using a deep understanding of what actually works in the real world to help humans accomplish their financial goals, not just theory. Rudy brings advanced financial planning into the world of extreme longevity. Thanks, Rudy. Yes. Yes. Outstanding. Let me tell you how much I love you guys. I will tell you how much I love you guys. I gave everybody else 20 minutes, except for Bill, who gets 30 because he's just special. But I cut myself down to only 15, and now I'm down to like 10. So this is just ridiculous. I would, if I would allow to take 30 or six hours, because I have so much important stuff to share with you guys about the most important practical thing possible, which is how the heck do I make this stuff happen? First of all, how many of you guys are out here Rudy Hoffman clients? Oh, hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Look at those wonderful hands. The rest of you, what is the hell is wrong with the rest of you? The, uh, no, the, okay, here's the, here's the deal. 
We're going to go through this in about 30 seconds. So we start with the, uh, do I have the slide to advance The, uh, start with this rather cute picture. They, they, they kind of get all this. These are going to be our, our, our dogs and the puppies, and these are our dogs right now. What in the world does this have to do with cryonics? All of us here are probably here believe because we believe and understand that life extension is going to be happening. Bill and his colleagues are working their tails off, something like 26 hours a day, to make sure that we have anti-aging and age reversal technologies emerging. The reality is they're not there yet. The reality is we don't even have them for pets yet. I don't know, I happen to be dog child free by choice. We have, these, are our, these are our kids. They're 13 years old right now. That's old in dog years. They, there is nothing we can give them right now for sure that actually will do what we'd love to have them do, reverse aging. So the point being, a lot of us who are in the anti-aging community are not the vast majority of people who think, hey, this is never going to work. They think that cryonics is not necessary because, hey, the anti-aging will get there before I, before I need it. I'm, I'll be fine. I'm not going to do anything. They cryocrastinate. They do nothing. And guess what? They wind up dying. I don't want that to be you. I want to make sure we have a solid way to do something that I'll, I'll love this. I got, I'm going to take 40, 30, 45 seconds of my video, of my 10 minutes, because this is such a great clip. See, uh, Star Trek, any Star Trek -y people in here? All right, we've all heard this, and let's see if we can make this video run. Doug, somebody, hit that video. We're going to give it two seconds, and if it doesn't run, we'll just stipulate it. That's the loud. Jim. He's dead, Doctor. He's dead, Jim. He's dead. He's dead, Captain. He'll die, Jim. He's dead. He's dead, Jim. Dead. Does this sound He's stupid dead. to you? He's dead. He's dead. He's dead, sir. He's dead, Jim. He's dead, Jim. He's dead, Jim. That man's dead back then. She's dead. He's dead. He must be dead. He was worse than dead. <laughs> His brain is gone. Captain is dead. He's dead, Captain. He's dead, Jim. Is this a dead man, Doctor? Very dead, Mr. Spock. How did you go, Jim? He's dead. He's dead. She's okay, do we get the point? Uh, how? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I got to play that for the Rad Fest when I get to speak out there. And the, what's great about that is Jim Stroll is the, the, run, the, guy, the guy that runs the Rad Fest is named Jim. So his dead Jim will be especially humorous to that group. So anyway, here's the point. How absolutely insane that is that. You know, that this technology that can move people around via, by moving their molecules from place to place can't figure out that you don't immediately die in a single instant. Anyway, the point being, our, my mission is to get you to do one thing. I'm going to take 10 minutes of my presentation and summarize it in one quick plea. The idea behind those of us who are, those of you who raise your hand that you're interested in cryonics but are not yet signed up, or if you're signed up but want to see how you can maybe improve or enhance your funding, this is a simple information request sheet. This will not result in a salesman's call, or in this case it will. It will result in a salesman's call. Let me make it really clear, we'll be happy to provide a sales assistance to get your cryonics funding in place in a solid um, manner that will mean that you actually are signed up. This is not some kind of academic exercise you can be an enthusiastic ideological cryonicist, but unless you sign one of these sheets, talk to some, me or somebody else and get your funding in place, get your paperwork in some place. If Dennis, the points you pointed out were brilliant, and it's excellent transition to what I want to talk to from my heart to yours, which is get your funding in place. And it's probably going to be with life insurance unless you're 75 or 85 years old where well, we can't get you life insurance. We need to do annuity funding. If you're past 80, talk to an 89-year-old. I don't know if he's here. Yes, there he is. Uh, and, and 89, basically what you need to do is cash funding. Uh, this gentleman right here, who's a young man of 89, that's Dennis Kowalski, the guy you need to talk with, by the way. So anyway, the, that was 30 seconds of my time. So here's the point. We would like you to sign one of these sheets and that will enable us to, to, to not go through my website. <laughs> How would you like to not go through my website on my presentation? But it is good. This is uh, RudyHoffman.com. I've spent the uh, last couple of decades of my life trying to make this thing seamless. And what it does is give you not just a little credentialing and all that kind of mess, but explain 
uh, we've got a Quranics FAQ section on there. That's a bunch of affiliations, a bunch of little videos. By the way, I'm licensed in a few states. Uh, 48 plus DC, is that correct? That's a lot of licenses, that's a lot of extortion fees. It's called doing, doing what you need to do. Uh, anyway, there's also FAQ on uh, life insurance, which is, believe it or not, not that complicated. There's term life insurance, and there's a permanent variety of insurance. There's a couple of iterations on the permanent variety. Term insurance is perfect for a lot of things. It's pretty crappy for life insurance, for funding for Quranics, because we want a policy that's actually in place in the later years when we tend to die. If you can't afford anything else, term insurance may be a reasonable bridge, but eventually you want ideally a paid up policy, which some of you already have in this room. That's where your policy is actually paid up. You don't have to keep on paying it, and you, it's actually there when you die and when you need it in the later years. Guess what? We tend to die in the later years, not the earlier years. That's when term insurance becomes astronomically high and gets dropped. People say, well, I'll just invest the difference. I'll have lots of money. One, they don't always have that lots of money. Two, when you got lots of money, it turns out there's family that thinks they need it. Life insurance is actually a much more secure way of funding and much less subject to problems. So that's the concept there. Uh, there's a bunch of affiliations and links. There's a uh, credentialing and credibility stuff, a bunch of videos I did, uh, which are some FAQs that I will not go through because we've already gone through them. And uh, this is a quote request form on the website in case you cannot write. But don't wait and fill out the website. Take, go downstairs and fill it out now with this beautiful young lady. So that is my mission, and I have been very crisp. I gave everybody else more time because I love you guys. And I want you to know I really, really hated giving up my time slot, <laughs> but I did it for you here in the presentation. There we go. <laughs> okay, next, our next mission is Alexei Podoff. Podoff. We have a... Alexei Podoff is the Podoff, excuse me, is the uh, founder and co-founder of CTO for Crow Roos, the biggest Russian Koranics company in the world outside the U.S. He is Crow Roos's North American director and board member, serial entrepreneur for a few startups in drone and retail automation. Alexei Podoff. Thank you, Rudy, for the sacrifice. Time sacrifice, life sacrifice. For oh, oh yeah. Your you buy my book. You buy back. his book. Okay, so let me start uh, from the 90s, probably. Uh, there were a few people that tried to start Kranix company in Russia in the 90s. Um, actually, cu current uh, um, co-founder Igor Artyukhov. Um, uh, in the 70s, it, it was Yuri Pichugin, but he, left, he then left uh, for United States and continue to work in Cryonics Institute. Um, so I will present Cryorus. Okay, this is our company today. Uh, we have 68 cryopreserved people, half of them full body, half of them brain only or head. Uh, 34 cryopreserved animals, 300 signed contracts, uh, regular contracts, and 500 preserved DNA samples. Uh, we do DNA samples because it's really good way to like gateway drug, you know, for cryonics. <laughs> I want to add more numbers. It's not here, but uh, last year we did an ICO, a special uh, type of sales, and we uh, introduced cryonics to 1,500 uh, new people. Some of them will eventually sign the contract, some will not, but two of them already died and cry preserved in Kairos. So you can understand the, the funeral, uh, the general funeral, how many people enter in the funeral and what the speed of dying for, for this crowd. Um, we are creating a cryonics industry in Russia. Uh, we're here from 2005. Um, we do human and animal crop preservation, DNA preservation and services, and we do the important thing is uh, digitalization and storage of personal ar archive, archive uh, personal data. Uh, we understand that cryonics is not just freezing body 
uh, or head. It's also preserving information. And uh, later, while reviving people, we need this information to be compared with the actual information that person uh, tell about himself. Uh, euthanasia is prohibited in Russia, and that's why we have um, to begin procedures after legal death. However, uh, there's no limitation for animals, and because we have a lot of animals, uh, we have a lot of practice to actually uh, improve our uh, perfusion process. Um, uh, our numbers uh, is 18 cats, 10 dogs, 4 birds, uh, and, and a hamster and a chinchilla. <laughs> but the smaller the animal, the harder it is to perform the perfusion. And uh, for, the, for the mouses and rats and, and hamster, we need to have the special equipment for that. Um, DNA preservation. We do it because um, of cloning purposes. Uh, pets can, can be cloned. Uh, and also, this is uh, like, there's no barrier for person to give his DNA to store. Unlike cryonics, it's not the, that hard decision. You know, that not that it's not that charged, not emotionally charged. You know, the, the person is, is easy to accept this. That's why we do it. Uh, digitalization and storage of personal archive. We set up a data digitalization laboratory, all kind of uh, old uh, media, cassettes, tapes, uh, photos, um, a lot of them. So we do it in a industrial base you know, for a lot of media. Um, we believe in terms of Technology, we believe in infinite progress. Uh, we're convinced that people will be able to revive a lot more than, than right now, like, because right now it's, uh, previous speakers said it's like up to 10 hours of uh, uh, cold ischemia, but right now, uh, but in the future, there will be more possibilities to that. Um, there is a lot of a lot of problem with Russian population uh, because um, people still hardly understand cryonics and clients very often call for a person uh, that dying is dead. You know, they they still think that death is a moment, not the not the process, not the long process. Um, if the perfusion is the is performed far away from Moscow. We use solution based on glycerol since the vitrification is unstable and insufficiently low temperature. Um, uh, in a central district, it's what is nearby Moscow. Uh, we use a vitrification solution uh, created for us by Yuri Pichugin. Um, uh, he is actually a cry preserved in Cryrus uh, and died this year. Uh, we don't have a reliable programmed freezer. Uh, that's why we do most of the cooling manually. Um, however, in Russia, the main factors, poor perfusion, are not the solution type. It means um, um, the transportation in Russia is very difficult from transportation in the United States. We cannot fly any airport. We cannot, uh, like, we are really limited by infrastructure and and the quality of operation is really dependent where you are in Russia um, the main the, the the big problem is bureaucracy late access to the body unreasonable autopsy and delays in contacting the cryonics company um, those factors are responsible for 80 to 90 uh, percent of damage in the period after death and before the immersion in liquid nitrogen uh, so, we are really focused on this logistic part, uh, how to get the person to cryonics facility. And we are successful in this, pretty successful. Last year, uh, we had a person uh, cryopreserved while he was killed in, in, a, in a jail, in jail, uh, and another person in like nearby countries. So we, 
the logistic is our primary focus. Uh, we have representatives in um, South Korea, Belarus, Italy, uh, and uh, United States. It's me. Um, this is most active, uh, most active our supporters. 25% uh, of our clients are from Europe, uh, and other from uh, from either from Russia or uh, ex-USSR country, and uh, also two person from United States. For some strange reason, uh, they decided to go with us and uh, uh, China a lot. Uh, we have a, a large list uh, of media that we worked with. Uh, we had exhibition in Milan, in Italy, uh, 400,000 people, so they saw our uh, duars, you can see it on the right. Um, we present our equipment and we present it to us. Uh, last year we did a special uh, form of um, placing or selling our, our contracts called ICO and it shows us some mixed results. Many Cryonics supporters, um, it's about 1500 of them, uh, we really wanted to pay in, in cryptocurrency and get a discount, um, but um, most investment we had as a, as a, as a private investment. Um, and uh, one of the construction of uh, Chronic Center Russia and uh, another one in Swiss. Um, but uh, some of these people are not really cryonicists. They just invested in the future they want to live. Uh, but not deciding, not deciding them for themselves to be chronically preserved. Um, and um, this makes the, make, makes the question how many contracts we will, we will actually get from these 1,500 people appearing. Um, from the other side, the, the, the upside of this is um, uh, this is like example for us for the um, another community, completely other community, like cryptocurrency community that are ready to uh, accept cryonics in some form, either for the future or uh, for the future they want to live but not apply cryonics for themselves or the cryonic services. So this is a like example how can we expand more. Um, yeah. uh, so we have like, we are loved in Russia, we are not marginal, people are proud of us. Um, the growing number of clients and signed contracts, uh, the growing number of cryonic supporters and active volunteers, including teenagers. And we found some interesting uh, marketing opportunity with ICO and with crypto community, and we continue to expand uh, in other countries and in Russia. But uh, things we don't like is um, um, we cannot predict the, the cash flow actually f from this uh, from this uh, growing number of uh, clients. Uh, we have no sponsors and we don't trust investors, and we have no actually no uh, stabilization fund, not revival funds uh, like in Alcor. And also, uh, there's good scientists currently, but there's no, f there's no funds to conduct experiments. Um, these buildings will uh, serve us uh, to collect different scientist group we work actually in one place, but then we need more investment to actually run experiments and uh, uh, improve our uh, process. Um, uh, so there's uh, some development in Swiss and um, uh, the place in Tver near Moscow. Um, we have probably um, pictures later uh, of these places. Uh, we received uh, an innovation award um, back in December 2017. So it shows us th uh, the Chronix uh, is, uh, is accepted somehow. Uh, this is our team, our prospects. 
uh, the number of our clients constantly growing, storage facility is becoming small, we are moving to another location, moved to another location already, uh, uh, and acquired the big piece of land. Uh, we hope that will improve the, uh, the overall image and uh, the number of patients we can store. Uh, we were in the uh, United States a lot, um, so met Robert Edinger, uh, met Ben Best, uh, Max Moore, and um, this is the uh, end of the presentation for Kairos. But I want to like continue with part two. Can we launch the part two? Yeah. Uh, so I want to give you some uh, perspective what cryonics is at large and how can we develop it like bigger and what's a human being. Uh, what is cryonics? Cryonics is multidimensional. It's technology, marketing, values we uh, exercise, we working upon, acting upon investments, community volunteers, startups, and companies that actually bring us uh, technology and services. Um, Cryonics version one was uh, preserving people somehow in, in pyramids, in uh, uh, the experiments of Bakhmetiev. The, this is uh, actually 2012 uh, optimist club that believe it has secret to long life, 2012. Uh, version two is a Robert Edinger style presentation. Um, it is about, uh, it, it is linked to the knowledge of what is cells, what is uh, uh, DNA, what is uh, physiology. Uh, version 3 is 1980s Drexler uh, book, Engine of Creation, and then uh, the starting of, of uh, non-technology initiative, United States. Version 4 is about cyberpunk, digital, digital mortality, mind uploading, um, super abilities. Uh, we had we just had uh, Elon Musk presentation on, on how to read signals from the brain. This is like in development. And version five is pretty much all of this, plus, uh, uh, plus connecting the value of life to, to the culture, to bringing understanding the value of life to general public. Uh, this is a, a diagram of um, a uh, Russian researcher, that how, how, what options we have, right? Um, this is a Cryrus facility. Uh, some numbers, uh, 14 employees, uh, for 40,000 people connected and other things. This is a community we have in New York, uh, 5,000 people. It's the uh, world's second biggest community uh, of futurists. Uh, called Brooklyn Futurist. Uh, more, more marketing channels. Uh, about cryonics, digital immortality, mine uploading. Uh, more channels, including investment in investors. Um, uh, one of my friends that helped me is Serge uh, Shilinov. He's here from Investment Bank, and uh, he's helping us to establish the infrastructure, a startup infrastructure that can help. Um, bring more people. This is one of the, our startup uh, in New York that help us, helping us to bring uh, more people. Because uh, like Bill did uh, in the 80s, he took the money from in, on the markets where the money is, when the money are, uh, and brought it to cryonics. So we, we want to do the same thing with uh, our startups. Uh, this is a, like, the retail automation is a, is a big um, market like 100 billions market. Uh, this is another startup that do the uh, connect people on the conferences. Uh, so basically, we don't know each other. Even if we, if we start to connect on a conference here, we do one by one connection, right? We, don't, we cannot choose who to connect. We need to like try and uh, test every person, right? We don't know our interests. So this is a startup that connect people um, based on their interests. They can choose. Uh, another startup is uh, my drone automation company that actually can deliver uh, medi medicine, deliver um, 
uh, equipment instead of uh, helicopters. It can it, it is uh, drone automated drone flying, so you don't actually need to be in place to fly the drone. You need to send the command, and it will deliver the everything you need. It it can fly in swarms. So uh, this is a other way to talk about cryonics also. So uh, uh, we can market and advertise as life-saving platform, not just you know transportation, not just like model creation or something like this. Um, so who can help us to use those possibilities? Like, um, uh, I found out that there is little known about cryonics communities. So I started to started to do the map, cryonics map uh, of cryonics organization. I found like 50 cryonics organization groups, uh, and I figured out that I know very little who's in there. Um, so if you want to be in this map, please go uh, cryonet.info and uh, send me uh, uh, an email, and you'll be on a map. So uh, these communities, as 50 groups, they have something to offer, right? They have time, they have, have contacts, they can provide contacts, they can, they can do, they have consumer products to rent, projects to plan, votes, uh, skills to provide, etc. So these communities already have a lot of resources that's underused, that's not used. And we can use these uh, resources to, in order to uh, fund uh, startups and uh, cryonics uh, services too. Uh, this is a, just one example. Uh, this is a um, biohacking community that developing a new way to represent knowledge. And this knowledge is uh, one time entered, one time, uh, uh, one time entered, it is uh, stay into the system. You don't need to reread the same article the other person did uh, read. You only need the uh, the uh, to take a look at this diagram and understand all the all the links that are presented in in a lot of other articles about any topics. So. Any life extension therapy, life extension uh, information about any drug, any any uh, therapy, it can be put here and exist independently of paywalls, paywalled uh, scientific articles. Okay, that's it. Uh, this is Serge. Please um, connect to him about the um, investment opportunities, about what we do, startups uh, for cryonics. Thank you. How do you say thank you in Russian? Спасибо. 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 Okay. Outstanding, folks. You have hung tough, and now you have deserved. We have saved the best for last. Sorry, Bill. But that's true. Uh, I could take 30 seconds, not 30 seconds, and I'd neglect to introduce this guy, but let's go ahead and do be formal and introduce Bill Falloon. Because none of us know who Bill Falloon is in here, I gather. Bill Falloon compiled the 1,500-page medical reference book, Disease Prevention, and treatment, and his latest books are Pharmacracy and Pharmacracy Two: How Corrupt Deals and Misguided Medical Regulations Are Bankrupting America and What to Do About It. He's also the director and co-founder of Life Extension Foundation, promote Life Extension's innovative medical concepts. Bill has been featured in hundreds of media appearances, including Phil Donahue's show, The Joan Rivers Show, Tony Brown's Journal, ABC News Day One, and Newsweek Magazine, and we think we obviously know that we're here because of Bill. This whole infrastructure is Bill. So that's no secret. Would you please help me welcome Mr. Bill Falloon. <laughs> you know, the, uh, the analogy that was just presented uh, as it relates to what's going on in Russia is almost identical to where cryonics was in the 1970s. We didn't have any money. We didn't really know what we were doing. We were just trying every manageable way to enable people to be cryopreserved the best way possible and then safely stored so that they had a better chance of reanimation. 
And in 1977, I set up a charity in the state of Florida. It was recognized as a tax-exempt organization, and that group then was able to start funding research, research that aimed to perfect the cryopreservation process. So we started sending money to various laboratories, many of which we established ourselves or other people would establish, and we would provide the funding. 21st Century Medicine, many of you are aware, is possibly the leading cryopreservation laboratory in the world. Uh, I believe they're presenting at some major conferences even this weekend in relaying their results in doing organ vitrification and getting those organs transplanted into other animals and those organs functioning. Uh, the suspended animation a group, the SA group, that if we need an emergency response or we need a standby, well, that's funded by our charities. We don't make money doing this, and a lot of people don't realize that. Some people think we're doing this to, to make Make money it's really the opposite we work real hard doing other businesses so we can subsidize cryonics now and we have five projects that our life extension group is currently funding uh, we fund them to the tune of about five million dollars a year and we've been doing that way back since the 1980s not always five million dollars a year but we fund these projects to both advance the science and make cryonics available to as many people as possible and this is technology that we're going to continue for about 10 years. Uh, we're going to continue that for about 10 years, and then we're going to be focusing on reanimation research. That's what we're going to go to after that. But I was so impressed by what's going on around the world, much of which I didn't know. When I heard about the Chinese uh, cryonics group, which I did three days ago, by the way, three days ago, Aaron Drake sent me information about what you saw presented here just a few speakers ago. There seems to be a hospital in China doing exactly what we want to do in this country. And I think that's going to happen where people will realize we need full-time surgeons and hospital-trained people to cryopreserve individuals and not do it in, a rather, in the rather primitive way that it's being done right now. And they have it in China, two full-time staffs of people in a medical center, and they have done six cryopreservations, three of them in year 2019, and they have about 51 people fully signed up to be cryopreserved and they're very new. So that video you saw just uh, maybe two or three hours ago, it's amazing that they have, the Chinese have come over to the United States. They visited, by the way, our research laboratories. We've donated to them a lot of our IP, a lot of our knowledge, and they've taken it and moved it into a different direction. So we're very gratified to see the work that we initiated in the 1970s, 1980s. It's being transplanted around the world. So I'm very grateful to be able to report that. And I want to travel back, though, to the 1970s, because it's very much analogous to what's going on in Russia right now. We're where we didn't have much money, very few resources, we were dependent on volunteer labor, very sparse donations, and it was a challenge. So what I did in 1977 is I set up a nonprofit group and I set up a laboratory in Pompano Beach, Florida. It was the first cryopreservation facility in the United States, and I worked about 80 hours a week as an intern in Balmer, and when you work 80 hours a week, you get overtime, and I was able to fund this laboratory using my intern payments, my interim uh, revenue, to fund the laboratory, and then uh, also I had to live in the laboratory in order not to have to pay rent and utilities somewhere else. And I was able to purchase used medical equipment for about five cents on the dollar, and I had a, a laboratory that could cryopreserve anyone who died uh, within reason, reasonable distances. I set up a temperature control cabinet to temporarily store the patient until I could transport them, probably back then to trans time, out in San Francisco. And I get a little bit of publicity in some of the longevity magazines about the first uh, cryopreservation facility really in the southeastern United States. And I never had a customer. Not one customer came in the door, but that was okay. We were fully prepared to cryopreserve the local people so we had something in place. And you compare 1975, where we virtually had nothing, to what we have today. And this list I prepared is insufficient because obviously there's groups that you've just heard about in Europe and other countries that are already pushing this science forward faster than what I even knew before I heard some of the speakers talk today. This is spectacular. We have exponentially grown. Yeah, you saw this chart that Max Moore prepared today where back in 1975, there was virtually nobody fully signed up 
to be cryopreserved. There were people who wanted to be, but they didn't have contracts, they didn't have insurance policies in place, so we were at ground zero. Virtually no one wanted something that I thought was rather important. And you look how fast it has grown in recent years, and you look at the number of cryopreserved patients, how that has grown exponentially in recent decades. And of course, Michigan growing exponentially in recent decades. We're seeing cryonics finally reach a point where it's being accepted by at least a few people. But what's going to happen when this gets to be common? Where are we going to store the future patients? We have two million people a year in the United States who die. What if just one percent of them decided they want to be cryopreserved? Well, unfortunately, while there's great buildings that the cryonics groups own, Alcor has a very nice building in Scottsdale, Arizona. The building is designed in such a way that they can expand within the building by simply evicting tenants that are renting other spaces. So they're able to grow within this building, very smart of Alcor to do that, and they have these capsules stored in a very secure area. Uh, when you walk into the place, you feel like it's a little bit of a future situation, the way they've built in the security. The same with Cryonics Institute. They own their building free and clear. None of the cryonics groups has any debt that I'm aware of, which is fantastic. So you don't have to worry about the building being foreclosed on. And they've got very safe and secure facilities. Alcor or CI has never had a meltdown. That's a big, big commitment that you have to make to people. We're going to cryopreserve you and we're going to keep you preserved until we can reanimate you. That's a huge promise and both those groups have a track record of never having a meltdown. So what's going to happen when all these people who are interested in cryonics and the number who are interested outweigh the number signed up by a factor of thousands? Where are we going to store them? We're going to run out of room at the existing facilities, and there's going to be a real problem. And you don't want to just rent new facilities in other areas, because what we do with the cryonics groups is people live there with the patients. We have people living on the premises. So if a capsule starts to leak, we can immediately take an action to make sure that that patient does not thaw out. But at this point, if, if cryonics becomes as popular as it seems like it's going to be, well, we're going to have to put them somewhere. And that place is the time ship in Texas. This is a project we initiated in 1996. We needed to find the safest geographic location in the United States, and that took us about seven or eight years because places that appear to be safe had some earthquake faults, even though the risk may be one in every 300 years, that's too much. And some places had, well, hurricanes, snowstorms, all kind of reasons that we would not want to build a permanent cryopreservation storage facility. So we spent about eight years looking, and we found a place in Texas. Uh, the time ship is the name of it. Now, this is an architectural rendering of what the time ship might look like if we get enough money down the road. The good news is we own the property free and clear, and I'm going to show you that. But this has got, gotten so much favorable publicity because an architect with incredible credentials has put it together and has promoted it in a way that has given cryonics some very nice mainstream publicity. This is the location of the timeship property. We own almost a thousand acres of land, free and clear, no debt. There's an endowment fund to maintain the property in perpetuity. So this property will always be there exclusively for the use of storing cryopreserved individuals, also cryopreserved organs, uh, DNA, uh, all kinds of different methods of storing living tissue right outside of San Antonio, Texas. This is the safest geographic area in the U.S. No earthquakes, no hurricanes, no snowstorms. Snow it's not close to any major military base, so it's unlikely to get nuked. We looked at every single contingency before buying this property, and the property is spectacular. This is an example of people who sometimes start making a lot of money, and then they overspend. And they made it so nice that they went bankrupt. And that was fantastic, because then they had to sell it to somebody else who ran into some financial problems, and they also had to sell at a distressed price. So we were able to get this 
almost 1,000 acre piece of property uh, that includes adjacent properties that we brought afterwards, we bought them afterwards, we got it really cheap. And it's something that was featured before we bought it, by the way, on that program, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. This mansion was uh, featured on there two times. It's that spectacular. And the property itself is breathtakingly beautiful. We had a conference out there in 2014. A lot of cryonicists who have been signed up for a long period of time, when they were looking at the views and, and, and just being around this property, they felt a sense of tangibility. They felt a sense that for the first time, cryonics might really work because this is where we plan to store people in the safest geographic area in the United States, a place that's absolutely gorgeous. And of course, you know, with cemeteries, they build these beautiful mausoleums. That gives people a sense of comfort for some reason. But bear in mind, that doesn't really help getting them back to life. Now, most of the property looks like this. It's rolling hill country. And in case you don't know, Texas is not all flat. There, there are some hill country properties which we have bought and it's above sea level. So we don't have to worry about the sea level rising. We'll be way above it. And we will put the time ship on the property, something like this. So as I mentioned, because we have the time ship property, architectural designs, we've gotten tremendous publicity. The media is now treating cryonics in a more favorable way because they realize how serious we are. We've bought that property. We put a lot of money into it. And we've got an endowment fund to maintain it. So we're getting this favorable publicity in international publications, even in Europe, other countries, they're looking at cryonics more serious because they understand how serious we are about making cryonics not just work by improving the cryopreservation process, but by securely storing cryopreservation patients. The media likes to report on our cryonics castle. They, they, they view this sometimes as a castle, uh, but the media, again, giving us very favorable coverage because they see what we're doing to make cryonics viable. And it's something that in the 1970s, we had nothing, nothing close to what we have right now. But the Financial Times, it's the equivalent of the Wall Street Journal throughout Europe and Asia, giving us very nice publicity. So we've done a lot of work that this project, by the way, began in 1996, and we continue to work on it. And the good points about the time ship is we own it free and clear, we being a charity, a, a charity that has a cryonicist on the board of directors, and the charity's only purpose is to ensure that this time ship remains safe and secure for long-term storage. So when the public finally recognizes the rationality of cryonics and they jump on board and want to be cryopreserved, the good news is we've got about 1,000 acres to store them, and we can keep that property indefinitely. So our intent is to, of course, maintain the timeshare property and then fund reanimation research. What we're doing right now is funding research to better enable cryopreservation to occur. But long term, we need to start bringing these people back. And we have set aside funding so that there will be perpetual research so that people can be brought back to life. And these really are two different subjects. Cryopreservation, of course, is everything you've learned about today. Taking a person who is deanimated, that's our word for death, deanimated, and we then do everything we can to protect them against the ischemia, against the cooling damage, to per preserve them in a, as a perfected way as possible. But then we've got to figure out a way to reanimate them. And that's where our prior priorities are going to be. But we've had challenges. The government has come after us in a lot of different ways. And guess what? We've won every single battle. They've accused us falsely of certain... <laughs> yeah. You, you can type my name on a Google, Bill Falloon, and FDA, and you can read all about it. We battled the FDA, the IRS, and we had to battle the government of New Zealand. Uh, we thought New Zealand was going to be a good place to set up a charity. They seemed to want to invite us in, and then after a couple years, they wanted to throw us out. They wanted to just say cryonics is something that's illegitimate. And they had a lot of reasons that were thrust at us that we could not afford to set bad precedent. So the government of New Zealand tried to revoke the charitable status of two groups that we set up over there. And what we thought about is Winston Churchill and how bad his situation was uh, in 1941. The Nazis had taken over Europe. 
It was Winston Churchill alone against Nazi Germany and Japan. The United States hadn't entered the war yet, and we thought about him when we were fighting the Battle of New Zealand. This is the New Zealand government coming after us and, and, and alleging, alleging that there was no science behind cryonics. How, how absurd can that be after what you've just seen today? The kind of information you've seen, the scientific information, the work, the research that's going on. They said it's immoral. They said it was against uh, religious views. They were determined to destroy us in New Zealand. And we were more determined, though, not to let that happen. So these were the reasons that the New Zealand charity authorities said we don't deserve to exist, that we are illegitimate for those six reasons, including it's not current science, whatever that might mean, and, um, and no educational value, no useful knowledge. And they were not only, by the way, attacking cryonics, they were also attacking anti-aging research. They were urging us, instead of spending money on cryonics and aging research like we were doing, why don't we build more old age homes? That's the solution. Just more places to, stack, to put old, old people in, and we had to fight this back. We fought it back, well, for a long time, a long period of time. We overwhelmed them with the scientific data. And we even had to descend into biblical arguments when they were saying this was against a religious view because in the Bible, uh, bringing dead people back to life is considered a good thing. And so <laughs> it, it got to be th th that bad, th that bad to have to go to in, into a biblical uh, discussion uh, when we're trying to argue the science. But nonetheless, this went on for a significant period of time. And uh, we also had to demonstrate societal benefit. This is some of the arguments that the charity board was using against us, that anti-aging medicine and cryonics provided no societal benefit. And we were saying, well, some of the research we're doing may involve perfecting organ preservation. And therefore, we'll have a whole bank of hearts, kidneys, lungs for transplant purposes, and there'll be many lives saved, but they couldn't understand that either. They really just felt, let old people die, and if someone needs an organ and can't get it, let them die too. So we fought, we fought. And after about a well, five-year period of time, we won, we won. In the High Court of New Zealand, uh, the charity board was criticized for their attack on us, and they went through an unprecedented procedure of saying to the charity board, this is what the court said, you are so prejudiced against these people, we're taking it out of your hands, and we're going to let these people do what they want. So this was a huge win. And what it means is that we can cite this case anywhere through the British Commonwealth, or even in the United States, if cryonics is challenged as being illegitimate, or something that's not going to benefit society, Society, we have a high court ruling that, yeah, it's very legitimate, nothing wrong with it, and you're not going to stop us. So we feel that this five-year victory costs us a lot of time, a lot of money. It sets precedent, and precedent in this world when it comes to legal cases, very, very important. And this is just some of the uh, statements made by the judge that indicated that this was accepted science, accepted academic discipline, there was societal benefit, we were advancing the science. And another victory that a lot of people forgot about because it's so long in the past, back in 1988 in Riverside, California, the coroner's office came after us. They wanted to autopsy our cryonics patients. And we went into court, and it was an impossible situation because the coroner had always won. The coroner's right to autopsy was considered unchallengeable. Well, they were so confident, they didn't prepare very well, and we did. We came in there with expert witnesses to validate the potential to reanimate these cryopreserved patients, and therefore the medical examiners are really going to uh, commit murder if they were to autopsy those patients. And we won this case. And the media, they gave us some really nice publicity indicating just how small we were. There were only about 100 of us back then, 1988. But all 100 of us put in efforts. We filed individual lawsuits. We did a lot of work to ensure that we had a chance to win in court. And guess what? We won. We beat the Riverside County Coroner's Office. 
And they, they were then thrown out of office that next year. They're an elected group. They were all fired and thrown out of office because we caused them to burn up so much of the county money. They had to assess every taxpayer in Riverside County extra money to take on the small little group of cryonicists. So it, it really shows you you don't need a, a big group of people to win a battle. It's, it, it's how fer ferocious and how dedicated you are when you fight that battle. So again, Winston Churchill, someone that you can really admire. He, he, he fought an impossible war, and I felt in some cases we did too. So what we've done to try to ensure that monies put aside will always be used for intended purposes is we set up different organizations that consist of cryonics volunteers. No one gets paid for any of this. I don't get paid for anything, by the way, related to cryonics. It's all volunteer work. I work in other businesses in order to support this. But the good news is we've got people who are willing to volunteer their time and their, and their efforts to make sure that we are able to continue to preserve people, keep their assets secure so that when it's time to reanimate them, they can get their money back. And this is just a group of people, some of them are here in this room today, who are on these different committees that we have set up so that if you have money in a trust account and you have a professional trustee, that's good, but you may also want to have some cryonicists who are going to be able to oversee the trustees and let him know it's time to reanimate that person because you can't expect J.P. Morgan or, or a big bank to know when it's time to be brought back to life. I would like to think the cryonicist will. As it relates to this church, it is founded based on a prophet, uh, Nikolai Fedorov, and he believed that technology would evolve to the point where people would live for an indefinite period of time. And when you look at prophets, you say, well, what's his track record? Well, back in his time, famine was a major problem. Hard to imagine in today's world, but back then, people starved to death or they went hungry. And he believed that technology would evolve to the point where famine would be eradicated. And guess what? It's happened. There's more food right now than what people can eat. A lot of farmland, frankly, isn't even being farmed because there's just so much of it. But one of his predictions is something that I don't know yet how it's going to happen without cryonics, but he predicted that technology would eventually evolve to the point where the, the ability to resurrect everyone who's ever lived would occur. And I don't know how that can happen unless a person is preserved. Cryopreservation is the best way at this point, but this is just one of his predictions, and we like to at least cite it in our church here so that people understand we do have a rationale for Nikolai Fedorov to be a, a prophet, someone that we think a, a heck of a lot of. So we've got the ability today, 2019, that is so far greater than where we were in the 1970s, where we had literally nothing. I mean, it was people just donating a few dollars here and there, a sparse volunteer labor, and we've been able to move the project forward. Now, I'm going to use this next couple of slides, I'm going to go through them really fast, but you're probably aware of some media coverage that was really extensive. Uh, and I'm going to use this, by the way, next time I'm in court, because if someone tries to autopsy a cryopreservation patient, I'm going to accuse them of murder. You're basically saying to that patient, we're going to deny you the ability to come back to life. And the question is, are we burying people alive today? Well, you know, in April, a Yale University announced findings from a study in which they were able to restore the activity of uh, brain activity in hogs and pigs that were dead for hours. And this attracted worldwide media coverage that for the first time, and we, by the way, knew this was possible because we've been doing our own laboratories for about 30 years, but this, because Yale did it, they've changed the assumption of what death really is all about. And it turns out that four hours after a person is dead, there is still the ability to resuscitate some degree of neurological activity. And again, the media picked up on it. Virtually every media coverage story was favorable, talking about the fact that what, what they define as brain death today, that six minute window, guess what? It's wrong. It may be as long as four hours. You might be able to recover in as long as four hours a lot of neurological function. These are all different media sources that were describing the fact that the definition of brain death is going to change. And it relates to cryonics because we're saying if we can cryopreserve someone really quick, 
they're not even dead. We're just simply, again, using emergency medicine and extending that and getting them into the future when we can find a cure for whatever caused them to die. Now, this is an interesting animation that was published in the Los Angeles Times of how these hogs, uh, how they were able to get these hog brains back to life. And I like this animation. This uh, is how I envision cryopreserved people are going to come back. Our brain activity, of course, will be zero at liquid nitrogen temperature, but then we're going to be restored via future technology. We think it could be nanotechnology. It could be a wide range of, of technologies, actually. But the idea, this is what we're able to do today with four-hour dead brains. We can do that with today's technology. Just imagine in 50 years, 100 years, what's going to happen. And these illustrations are very similar to what's done in the cryonics laboratory. We have this, the same perfusion pumps. We have the same types of filters. We're doing this in cryonics laboratories today as it relates to research, and it's being reported uh, via the media because Yale and other universities are now doing the same thing. So we've got a lot of good information being published supporting what we're doing, and Elon Musk is getting into this big time, which is fantastic. In fact, a lot of the billionaires, they're putting money into aging research. They're putting money into anti-death research. People that founded Google, people that founded Facebook, Facebook, uh, many other PayPal founders, they don't want to die. So they're putting money into research, which is fantastic. And this is a, an analogy that I, I, I like to use because this is a brilliant individual. Steve Ballmer, he and Bill Gates made Microsoft what it is, the most valuable company in the world. He's worth $47 billion. So you'd think if Steve Ballmer uh, thought about uh, something, he might be correct. But he was incorrect, in incorrect on this one. Uh, he felt, you know, everything that you guys have in your pocket, he thought you didn't want it. Hey, Steve, check that out. Yeah, yeah, he, he just didn't believe that that was going to be something that people wanted. And, and you know what? No one is right about everything. We acknowledge that. But the fact is, he, he missed the boat on that one. And as that relates, how I'm relating that to is the fact that a young cryonicist named Nuno Martins PhD in nanoelectrophysiology, it's an incredible degree he has, he had a paper published that also garnered a tremendous amount of publicity in April of this year. Same with the, the pig brains coming back to life partially after four hours. Nuno's paper got published. And to give you an idea of what Nuno's paper is all about, you look at this library. And if you're someone like me, you want to have everything in that library in your brain. But you can't read all those books, and you can't remember everything you read. Well, Nuno has come up with a solution to that. But to put this again in context, I'm showing you pictures of my apartment. It is loaded with boxes of books, copies of scientific papers, medical journals. I want to read everything that's in these boxes. So I put it on piles of paper. And I think I'm going to get to it someday, and I don't. I know I'm never going to get to all of this information. So I want all of this to go into my brain. And the only way to do that, the only way to do that is the technology that has been published in a prestigious scientific journal in May, uh, March, May, April this year. And there's going to be, in the very near future, the ability to interface our brain with the cloud so that we will have all of the information in the planet, on the planet, instantly accessible to us. And this again got international media attention. The idea of merging our brain with the cloud so that we know everything, every fact that's ever been published, we will know it. Every bit of news that ever comes out, we'll know it instantly. We will be ultra smart people. And again, this is something that has been published. Uh, it's got an incredible interest in the scientific and the business community because the people in Silicon Valley are looking at this and realizing this is the next iPhone. They can see that as clearly as, as I can see it. And again, it garnered international media attention, the idea of being able to interface your brain with the cloud and theoretically upload your brain into the cloud so that you have digital immortality. That could be in our future. A lot of people can't understand that yet. That's okay. Steve Ballmer didn't understand the iPhone. So, but this is something that is 
moving ahead at record speed, and the interest in this is amazing. I mean, the number of people who are reading this. Imagine technology that is so advanced, it could provide you with instant access to the world's knowledge and artificial intelligence as soon as you think of a specific topic. According to a group of scientists from around the world, humanity could be just decades away from the unprecedented merge of human biology with advanced technology. This prediction is part of research published in the journal Frontiers in Neuroscience. The study looked at the possibility of human brain cloud interface and how it could be made possible by nanotechnology and artificial intelligence in the future. The scientists said it is conceivable that within the next 20 to 30 years, neural nano robotics may be developed to enable a safe, secure, instantaneous, real-time interface between the human brain and both biological and non-biological computing systems. Systems. This level of technology could include brain-to-brain -brain interfaces, brain-to-computer interfaces, and specifically brain-to-cloud interfaces. Technology linking the brain to the cloud could drastically alter the state of communications between humans and machines. So in order for this to become possible, the study noted that data transfer between living human brains and the cloud would likely require the use of supercomputers with artificial intelligence algorithms. While they say that there are supercomputers with processing speeds fast enough to handle the necessary volumes of data right now, they still have to create tiny devices that would be embedded deep in the brain. The senior author of the study noted that once inside the brain, the devices would then wirelessly transmit encoded information to and from a cloud-based supercomputer network for real-time brain state monitoring and data extraction. Such a breakthrough in technology has the power to transform communications, education, work, and the world as we know it. But with the requirement of tiny devices being inserted into your brain in order to access the cloud, it remains to be seen just how many people will be willing to participate. In Washington, Rachel Blevins, RT. Well, I'll tell you, I'm going to participate. I mean, you can be my brain, and I get to know everything that's ever been published in the entire universe. I mean, that's kind of fantastic, and get you know updates by the second. Um, to give you the significance, though, of this, the Frontiers in Neurosciences, a, a prestigious scientific journal. But when this came out, it got, it garnered more attention by the scientific community, the investment community, than 90% of all the Frontiers journals. Uh, in other words, you've got 67 different journals out there publishing all kind of good medical stuff. Of, of all the medical information that came out in that period of time, 90% of the, the clicks were on this brain-to-cloud interface technology. Because that's obviously the most exciting field we could ever imagine. It could very well provide us with, with digital immortality. And I always like to conclude my talks with the people who missed the longevity boat despite having enormous resources. And people, when they get into that category of $10 billion and, and more of net worth, and they don't prioritize biomedical research, and they wind up dying. I mean, I'm going to be 65 in a couple months. If I had lymphoma, frankly, I'd be doing a lot to make sure it did not kill me. And I suspect that some of these people who are very wealthy, they go to mainstream medicine, they, they, they trust mainstream medicine, and they wind up dying. But here's an individual who had the foresight to also work on the Microsoft company. That's where he made his money. He's worth over $20 billion and he is dead. And I've got a collection of these slides, probably 100 billionaires who have died over the last 10 years or so, and they didn't do what they should have done with their money, and that is put money into anti-aging research, cancer research, or cryonics research. They should have put their money somewhere to avoid dying. And this is, unfortunately, the choice that we have right now. Uh, we can be buried uh, forever, uh, put into the ground, it's not very pleasant. I am a licensed funeral director, by the way. I have buried thousands of people, embalmed thousands of people, and it's a kind of a scary situation. This is a promotion for a burial vault company to show how well their products preserve people underground. And this is about the best case you're ever going to see. Normally, after about 10 years, there's nothing. It's just a, a, a set of dentures, basically. I've disinterred quite a few people, too. So I don't find any of these options acceptable. I have fought against the notion of 
permanent death when I was told that I was going to die, and I will continue fighting. Because cremation, burial, those are the options. And I don't think that's going to work as far as reanimation. We're not going to come back. At least with cryonics. At least with cryonics, you're going to be permanently preserved. You've got an unlimited amount of time for future technology to figure a way to revive you. There is money in trust funds right now that's aimed to fund research to find a way to get you back to life. So there's a lot going on right now that we have at, at, at our option. We have the option of not being permanently destroyed through the death and decomposition process. We've got the timeship property. We own it free and clear. There's laboratories around the world working right now to improve this process. And if Ben Franklin were alive, he would, well, probably be a cryonicist. He actually wrote a letter indicating that if there's just some way to preserve himself, he would prefer that rather than being buried. He wanted to see what the future was like. And unfortunately, there was nothing for Ben Franklin to do. But thank goodness, starting in the 1960s, the option of cryonics has been there. And right now, it's, it's better than ever. And that concludes my conversation. So we're going to have a question and answer. If my speakers can come to the stage, and also Katie, if you'll go ahead and get any questions that you have. If you have a question for Bill, if you have a question you want to submit for Bill, go ahead and get Katie. Katie, wave. Make sure that everybody knows where you are. Wave to everybody. Be sure that she gets your, your question. All right, that about works. <laughs> it's an excellent day when we don't have enough room for all of our speakers, but we just made it, I believe, and I think this has been a... Great crowd, what do you say? What an end. We are so lucky to have all of you here. And uh, there are pictures, both professional and non, being taken. And I think that we have like five or six questions. We simply don't have time for all of the questions that you had today, so we have consolidated them. The wonderful Don Hoffman has consolidated them into uh, five or six questions, which we will do. Don. Uh, before we start question and answer, I want to thank Sybil and Houston, our timekeepers, for keeping us on time. <laughs> okay. um, the first question uh, is for uh, Max and Linda. There were a lot of questions on uh, Alcor funding, so um, this is a triple question. Uh, first of all, why doesn't Alcor establish a one-time payment for a lifetime membership? Um, does the money that we pay uh, for contracts include revival? And if we sign a $200,000 contract now, will the price be subject to change? Well, the first question is about a one-time payment, a lifetime membership, in other words, which used to be offered but was discontinued. And I've tried to reintroduce that, but so far I haven't managed to get the board to accept it. Um, it's very important that if we do that, we, we pick some reasonable number and that we manage the money rather than spending it all at once. So I've got to convince the board that we have a way of doing that. Uh, so we're pushing for that. What was the second one? Um, uh, does the uh, amount that you pay... Oh, yes. Yes, the amount you pay for the cryopreservation includes perpetual storage, uh, repair and revival and rehabilitation. Okay. Definitely. And if you sign a $200,000 contract, is that subject to uh, increase? Absolutely. As long as inflation exists in the world, that's the case. I would really encourage people to, if you're using life insurance funding, I would encourage people to get more than the current minimum. Absolutely! Which will make really happy. <laughs> but, and not just rely on life insurance either, sorry Rudy, but to also build up your investments over time. We are creating new prepaid accounts now where you can, in, in the past people could prepay, but it just went into a bank account earning almost nothing. Now we're going to have a fund that will pay actually at least as much as inflation. So that will be a way of adding on to funding later. But yeah, inflation exists, so we have to take that into account. Okay. And I might add that we encourage people to overfund for a couple of reasons. One is inflation, but also um, you've all gotten a pretty good feeling today how important time is in getting to people quickly. If there is no extra funding to cover an air ambulance and we have to use the scheduled airlines, that can really slow us down. So that's one thing to think about. 
And people often ask me, well, if I provide extra funding, what happens if you don't have to use it? You can tell us what to do with your uh, extra funding, if you want it to come back to your family, or you can always think about give that, uh, put that money into my revival trust. So it's a way to provide for that as well. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is for Max and Dennis. Um, people wanted to know, is there cooperation between the two uh, organizations? Uh, for example, do you have doctors on call that can uh, you know, immediately declare people dead? And do you uh, cooperate in shipping back and forth? Well, um, if, if you don't mind, Max, um, the one thing that I'd really like to see more of is uh, better communications between the organizations. Uh, in particular, when it comes to standby, there's only so many of us out there. So, you know, there's five or 6,000 people signed up worldwide. You cut that number in half, that cuts that small, already small resource in half. So I'd like to set up with not just Max's organization, but all the organizations and all the people out there, uh, more extensive local standby, uh, more meetings of, it's where it's not just an Elcor group or a CI group, but it's just a holistic cryonics group so that we can work together at the most basic level. And you know, let, let's face it, if, if, a, if a Elcor member goes down and CI members work on that member, at least at the local standby, they're gaining experience and vice versa because they might not have that experience. So every, every chance we get to work together like that makes us all better as an organization. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, there's a, some limit to how much we can work together because we do things a little differently, but I think the kind of thing Dennis is saying is, is definitely good. And I know Ashwin DeWolf, Chronics editor, is very keen on developing at least first responder capabilities. And just as in, you know, like in the Toronto group, uh, the English, English group, there's both CI members and Alcor members, uh, and they have regular trainings. The English group is actually a, a, a paradigmatic example. They are very good. They have regular quarterly trainings. It's CI and Alcor together. And you know, until we have far more members, I think that's a good thing to build up our members. It's probably worth pointing out, though, that uh, uh, both Alcor and CI make use of suspended animation. So in that sense, we're kind of making SA more workable by giving them more total business, I guess. Okay, that's good because the next question is for suspended animation. And the question is, because you have a, f a facility in California and one in Florida, how are you uh, recruiting and training people to help with throughout the rest of the country? Yeah, so we actually do annual training. Uh, we actually hold it here in Boynton Beach. We actually just facilitate one with Houston and Sybil and some other uh, contractors of ours. So every year, uh, t typically around February, March time frame, we will hold a uh, annual training for not only new contractors, but old contractors for if they haven't been on a case in quite some time, we'll uh, facilitate another training for them just for recertification. Uh, and then we can open it up to anyone who, who may be interested in coming into the uh, training as well. Although, keep in mind that we are a 100% subsidized company, so s sometimes money can be of, of an issue. Uh, and the second day of our training, we actually do a live big practicum training where we actually have a surgeon perfusionist come out and get hands-on training and show everyone how to simulate a, a, an actual case. So we do do that on an annual basis, um, but on the first day of training, we, we can actually open that up to uh, multiple people who want to come in as well. Additionally, in the past, we have opened up training to laymen for uh, first responder standby. The issue there being they're not trained medical professionals. Things can go wrong. The other situation is the uh, layman may intervene in a patient's uh, standby a little early, which meaning they actually perform some of the procedures prior to the patient being legally pronounced. This opens up to huge liability legally, and those individuals could uh, potentially be um, tried for uh, technically if they start injecting medications and the authorities show up and see that these have been introduced into the patient system, they're not now sure exactly how this patient expired. So that's why, that's our reluctance in uh, training the lay person rather than medical professionals. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is for Joe Kowalski regarding the prize. Um, I thought that a rabbit kidney has already been frozen, warmed, and implanted back into the donor successfully. Is that true? 
You know, I've heard about that as well, and I've read about that a little bit, and um, I think probably others on this sta sta stage maybe know more about it. But it does not fulfill the requirements that we have in the prize rules. The prize rules require, number one, that it has to be a certain organ, and that uh, I believe kidney is not one of the organs that we talk about. The second thing is that it has to be implanted, and the animal has to live for a certain period of time. And my understanding is that that did not happen in that case. And it has to be repeatable and it has to be demonstrably repeatable. And so uh, the combination of those three things has not been achieved, as far as we know, by anyone, anywhere. Thank you. Next question is for Mike Perry. Uh, how much of a danger is background radiation to those in stasis? Huh. Well, I'm not the greatest expert on it, but I understand it's not very great. And if it was, there are ways you could shield the patients off using lead and everything, so uh, it hasn't seemed to be a serious problem so far. Okay, thank you. And our last question is for Bill. Are there current, is there current active research in reanimating animals and what university or organization is doing it and how is the progress? From what I understand, the uh, Oregon group, the Advanced Neural Sciences, which our charity gives about a half a million dollars a year to, they, they, they are doing some reanimation type of research, but it's nowhere near the type of research we probably need for people who are currently cryopreserved. Our techniques today are far better than the 1960s, but they're going to be very inferior to what will be developed in the next five to 20 years. So there is some reanimation research going on, but I think it's at the primitive stage. And once nanotechnology becomes part of the mainstream business model, where it's everywhere, then we can apply nanotechnology to reanimation research and not have to spend billions of dollars, which we don't have, to accomplish the objective. So a little bit of reanimation research going on, but a lot of cryopreservation research, meaning enhancing the quality of the structural preservation, so that theoretically, if a patient is cryopreserved, like you saw in that Chinese documentary, which is spectacular, I mean, theoretically, cure lung cancer, bring that woman back to life. That's we're, we're, that's what we're aiming for, improve cryopreservation that well, where all you need to do is maybe cure the disease, and if they're real old, reverse aging, and, and, and they come back to life. So a little bit going on, uh, but I think most of the resources are going where they should go, which is improve cryopreservation delivery, including what suspended animation is doing with their portable operating room and, and the, all the other technologies you saw today. Okay, the, the panel, ladies and gentlemen. We only have 62 more questions, but we're not going to do them. Uh, it would take all night. So I would encourage you to sit with and meet with our wonderful panel this evening. If you'd like to ask them the question directly, those of you who are streaming online, all of your questions, if, you've missed, if we've missed your question, by all means, email me, and I'll see if I cannot connect that question with our speakers and, uh, after the fact. In the meantime, I'd like to bring Rudy up. Okay, we are basically, this is the last thing we're doing here, and it's important because we want to honor these amazing world-class talents and intellects that have come to share their fabulous ideas with us. It is not, it's a, a, as a token of this, we are delivering these beautiful gold embossed plaques to uh, uh, the, with very little gold embossed, with uh, Alexi, to uh, each of these individuals. And Ale oh, Alexi, am I reading these off? Alexi Potoff. <laughs> ben Best. <laughs> Charles Cam. <laughs> Christine Gaspar. <laughs> Dennis Kowalski. <laughs> Jim Yant. Joseph Kowalski, spelled correctly. <laughs> Linda Chamberlain. <laughs> Luan Yan. <laughs> Mark Laux. <laughs> Max Moore. 
Mike Perry. <laughs> Regina Monaco. <laughs> Ryan Levesque. <laughs> Sayer Johansson. <laughs> oh, and last but not least, we have to say a little bit more about this guy. <laughs> what can we say about Bill Falloon? Uh, this guy, I, <laughs> I wanted to make him, he, need, he needs a statue called the, Her the Hero of Humanity. But we'll just give him a applause, Bill Falloon. Ah, uh, Rudy, thank you. And you know, before you leave, you speakers, please let us get one or two photographs with you if we could. Meanwhile, we will have dinner downstairs. You're invited to stay with us. And of course, we can then do the questions and answers and uh, mingle and ask questions and uh, just talk. Talk all about lung life and cryonics. All right, ladies and gentlemen, our panel. Cryonics Symposium International. Happening in the moment, love and light to you. Know that all is as it should be, love and light to you. 